Yes, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm answering questions as I speak. I can multitask. Anybody there? Uh, let's see. Kind of yeah. early on the I'm West looking. Coast. Uh, yeah, it's early. I'm, I'm looking. There's about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 70, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. about 100. Now, I'm competing against Mark Friedberg, which is always tough. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, do, I'm answering got questions. Some heavy hitters against I can you. Multitask. Okay, so I, I see and, it. I see uh, it anybody running there? Um, oh, let's see. Early on the West Coast. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going back really, in. Yep, I'm looking. You, you, you're about, good now. 10, yep. So yeah, so everyone can turn their sound off. So okay, yeah. I don't know. That was now. That was about almost. That now, was competing against Mark Friedberg, which is always tough. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm answering. Turn your audio off, guys. Audio, audio off. I see it. I see it running now. Anybody there? Mine's off. Okay, you guys got it off? Good. Okay. <laughs> Paul, you have it off? No, I'm off. Okay, good. I've been off. Excellent. Off. All right, so now we know it works. Congre Hooray. So that was the one of the oddest Let's change errors. that slide. 6,000. Yep, that was one of the Nearly oddest. Nearly 6,000 means over 6,000. Yeah, so as I was saying, yeah, so we've gone over 6,000. By the way, that was the oddest error I've ever seen uh, the streamer give before where the so usually, by the way, when things don't work here, just to let everyone know, Inside Baseball, when you're doing these streams from the software that we use, when the stream starts to go wonky or bad, there's a light that starts flashing green, which is bad, orange, which is worse, and red, which is the worst. With this one, the, it was solid green, which usually means it's streaming out somewhere and the signal's being received, but for whatever reason, the receiving streamer wasn't actually broadcasting it back out, so I had to turn, it, turn their receiver off and on again, and now it works, so... <laughs> anyway, um, always fun, right? So, um, so CEY 2020 has, yeah, as you mentioned, Steve, we have over 6,000 ODs at this point have attended, which is crazy. Um, it's just a shocking number. I, I, you know, obviously the pandemic had a lot to do with it. Uh, people can't get their seats okay, anywhere it's, else. It's, it's, the, it's the class hours that, that are even more impressive. Yeah. The total number of hours that people have taken. So I went back and computed yep. yesterday because I was really curious. I wanted to look and see, you know, where we're offering all the stuff, how many hours have people actually taken? And I can share some of these numbers, right? You guys wouldn't be offended. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I, I was, you know, you're sharing Am I still number one? confidential information. Well, so <laughs> I didn't look per class by class because that's just too onerous even for me. I was tired yesterday. But on average, people who attended the conference have taken 23 hours on average of the courses offered so far. Wow. Um, so you can imagine that when you multiply by the number of people that we have, the sheer number of CE hours that people have completed, I would guess that at least for 2020, we're probably the leader or up there with the number of hours of CE generated. Um, Not only that, Adam, but when you look at the amount of people who attended, meaning registered, and that could be students, could be large groups of doctors, the this was by far the highest percentage that actually attended the courses. So it's upwards of about 97, 98% of people attended who registered, and that could be students who don't care right. uh, for the credits. While in previous conferences, uh, it was a good percentage, 10, 15, 20% who never took a class. So it was needed this year, and, and necessity is mother invention. It worked. I, and I'm surprised, too, because I've spoken with, you know, I have insight into other people's conferences as well. And we've done other ones for industry this year, too, right? We, in between CE wires, we don't just sort of sit around. We've done some other ones, too. When you have people register, typically the conversion rate from people who register to people who attend at a lot of events, it's 50%. Um, sometimes a little more, sometimes or a little less. For the numbers that we're seeing, as you're saying, in the high 90s is, is unheard of. We've never even done that before. Um, so it's, yeah, right. it's really shocking. Well, what's amazing to me is when you reported what, what the webinar attendance are, you see we get these, uh, ad, these ads every day to come to our webinar and it's free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how many actually show up? So those, those, that's can remarkable. Be, those can be a real drag. Yeah. So typically a typical webinar, like you'll see when a publication does one, the typical show rate for people who sign up is about 40%. Um, sometimes less, right? The, the commitment's low, right? You sign up for something, you don't, you're not paying for it, so a lot of people just don't even bother showing. So it's forty percent or less. So yeah. Um, so well, we've, you know, we've we definitely, uh, I think we we really hit it out of the park this year. And again, the, the pandemic had a lot to do with it. But I'm hoping that going forward, the C rules, which have been relaxed and apparently are going to turn back in June to the way it was before, I'm hoping that our book comes to some sort of a realization 
that this is something that people want. Um, and so maybe yeah, they could they have to add it, you know. So can add it to an exam. Yeah, that would make it perfect. And yeah, if they add back the exam, I don't think it would be too onerous for people. It would ensure the learning outcomes a little better, and people could still do their CE online. Well, yep. So if we have to find out what. Yeah, you're going to Adam, say didn't you have some insight that they might be changing things in Arbo with respect to CME and other uh, professions that they might uh, be leaning one direction, or was that just a feeling? So yesterday we got an email from uh, the folks at Arbo that they are, you know, every year they modify how CE is actually done. And I wish we could get Mike Olson on the phone. I know he won't come on, <laughs> but I'd love to have him come on because uh, Arbo just um, made a change where the their standards that they're trying to hit are becoming much more closely aligned with medicine. And uh, I don't know what that's going to mean for us. Unfortunately, what it means for me personally is I have to sit in now and listen to this and figure out how the rules are changing. So when we, when we put together the 2021 show, which we're starting to do now, that we meet all the requirements. Uh, but I know that that's a big change is that they're trying to align more closely with medicine and dentistry um, and other healthcare professions to sort of up their game. But what it means for, for a practical sense for providers like us, I have no idea yet. Um, and that's why, I, I, you know, we have to, they have webinars and stuff that we have to sit in on and figure out how that works um, going forward. So, yeah, it's going to be an well, interesting we, year. We know the playing field. We know the playing field and landscape so well that anybody else coming on, even the big conferences, et cetera, that don't do online stuff, really have to go from the ground up so they can't make it too complicated the first year. It'd be really interesting if we can combine um, optometric CE with uh, medical CME and have actually ophthalmologists take our courses. Because as you know, we have uh, quite a few ophthalmologists and PhDs uh, in our lectures this year. Yep. Yeah, that would be fun. And we have to just see how it's going to go. It's, I, my gut tells me they can't do too much, like you're saying, because you know the pandemic is still going on, right? And people are putting together their conferences now. Arbo says they're reverting the rules back to the old ways in June. I just don't, I don't know. I just don't know what's going to happen, but yeah. we'll see. Well, based on what we heard from the um, president or the CEO of uh, Zeiss yesterday, it was quite interesting. He was anticipating not being able to go to a conference at least through the spring, even the late spring. Um, and the logistics have to be arranged way before that for these big companies to get the equipment, the hotels, et cetera, for their staff. And if a company like Zeiss, and again, there's international travel rules that we don't know when that's going to be relaxed with Europe and the Far East. So it might be that Orbital might have to push that June 30th date even further uh, forward as the as the world gets vaccinated. Right. Because it's not just the U.S. or the U.K. It's countries like um, well China, Germany, France, Italy who, who come to these conferences, especially yep. the Vision Expos and the academies. And I think a lot is going to depend on what happens over the next, say, 90 days, right? Because we now have at least one vaccine and probably another one's going to be cleared for usage very soon, or maybe even this week. But the question is, how quickly can they roll this out to make a difference in the pandemic? And, you know, I, I'm not, I'll knock on some wood because I want this vaccine as soon as I can get it, right, as most people do. But I don't know. I mean, I was hearing estimates. Some people are saying if they screw up the distribution, at least out here, we're not going to see it for, for people like me who are, you know, younger and not in a high risk category till the fall, which is crazy. Because that means if I'm not vaccinated, I'm not traveling, period. Um, right. and, and I know a lot of people who are in decision-making capacities at these companies now are around my age or younger, um, and we don't want to take a risk. I'm not going to. I just simply won't unless I'm vaccinated. So you're going to have a whole group of people whose mobility will continue to be restricted until that vaccine is available. So we'll see. It's not only yeah. the CEOs and high-profile high, high people, it's the sales forces, et cetera. They're usually younger people, let's say, yeah. in their, um, say, 25 to 45 age bracket. And they're going to get it last. I mean, exactly. Healthy, unless somebody you know, um, starts eating to get 100 pounds overweight, <laughs> they can take the vaccine. That's the only solution I could see. Right. I mean, so maybe I'm, McDonald's yeah. and uh, Burger King will do better. Right. Because the situation really is going to be such that, like, especially I, I know in Oregon, this is the, you know, the only state that I can speak to. But I know that someone like Paul, you are going to get it way faster than me. Right. And so yep. for people in my age bracket who are you know, presumably working and, and in executive positions at these companies, we're stuck. What are we going to do? Um, you know, we, we can't really travel. I guess we could. I'm not going to go to New York until I'm vaccinated. I know that much. Um, so well, I don't think, yeah. I don't think Andrew Cuomo will let you. 
Yeah, there you go. So it's, uh, you know, so we have events like Expo, which may, may or may not happen. SECO, I'm going to guess they're going to try to pull off one way or the other. Um, the southern states in general have been a little more cavalier about what goes on. So, you know, perhaps, you know, they're going to open up the Georgia Convention Center um, by April or whenever they plan to do it. So we'll see. I, I don't know. We'll see. It'll be interesting, but it, we're we're facing the same challenges the whole world is facing, so yep. it's not uh, innate to us. No, no. I mean, it's it's definitely. I think that you know one fascinating part though is the distribution of this vaccine, with the extreme temperatures that it requires. It's going to be really interesting to see how localities grapple with this problem of actually getting it to people. Um, just knowing our. Well, we'll by some. Yeah. We know tomorrow they're shipping the stuff today. I know, but I mean, so, just, I mean, even yeah. thinking about like our own regional healthcare system here in Oregon, I don't know of too many facilities here that can actually handle this vaccine. Like, I know that there are a couple of large centralized hospitals that do have the capability to do it, um, but how will they actually distribute this thing once it's there? Are we going to have like mass drive throughs, right? Are you going to pull up and like a drive through window well, and show them well, are all the are all the ones that are under study now require low temperatures? So the uh, or just just the newest the the first couple that just are going to make it two, out yeah. the first couple are going to require some pretty low temperatures. This first one is absurd. I mean, it's like something like negative ninety something, right? And there are very few yep. facilities that can handle it. And, and frankly, I'd be very worried about many centers thinking they can handle it and then screwing it up and giving you something that's as about as good as water. Right? No. So yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, you know, I guess, Paul, you're going to be the guinea pig for us here, right? So, so you can That's tell true. us what you experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, at least I'm not allergic. So. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're hedging on that. I was listening to one guy today from the, uh, I guess it's the CDC, one of them, and they can include a very specific question. What, what sort of allergies do you must will be eliminated from taking the vaccine. He would not give the you know people that are allergic to eggs or cheese or whatever the hell it is. So if you're allergic, you're not sure whether or not the uh, the vaccine will work. Or we will give you the side effects that they're worried about. And from what I understand, Paul, you know, I know genetics. They, they, I don't think people could be allergic to the messenger RNA. Right. It's just uh, it's just a piece of DNA that of RNA, excuse me, that can be transcribed into the virus spike. It, it's the carriers, the things that they actually make it, the reagents that they make it with. And that's really hard to test people on to see whether they're allergic to that. But if you have allergies to eggs and bees or whatever, or any anaphylaxis, uh, I definitely would wait for the um, J&J. And, um, oh, you know, we're, we're uh, all victims of, uh, of thimerosal, right? When the contact lens solutions first came out, that was the yep. thing that uh, was the disinfectant. And boy, that was a real practice builder. <laughs> People came, <laughs> came in with those red too eyes. Bad we, too bad you couldn't treat disease in those days because people, <laughs> you, you created, I think it was like a 40% reaction rate to thimerosal. Wow. It was very high. Yeah. Hmm. So the people that knew the secret, to, just to give them a saline solution, we yeah. were heroes historically. The, the tr Meanwhile, the trouble uh, with the uh, AstraZeneca, you, yeah, you talk. Right, I'm sorry. I was going to say, does that AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson virus is a little delayed because of uh, the data is a little bit shaky with um, uh, people getting half dose, full dose, and they're going back and have to reduce some things. Plus, they didn't get um, a couple of populations in there. So that might be delayed till mid-spring or so to finally get that approved. And, and that's the one we bought 300 million um, doses of in the United States. That's enough for 150 million people. And if that's delayed, then we're, we're faced with Pfizer and Moderna, which is the, the cold storage that Adam's referring to. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder right. about this delay. I understand that they want to you know, do more subgroups or whatever. But if you can show efficacy in at least one group, one large group, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if it was me yeah. with the scale and scope of the pandemic, so you're losing about one 9-11's worth of people every day, right? And we will continuously do that for the next 60 days at least, right? So every single day that you delay you're just going to be increasing mortality. And I think what's even more important is the, um, the hospital system is just getting overwhelmed, right? We have to do whatever we can to try to just get people out of the ICU. So I'd, I'd be surprised if they delayed it too much longer. Um, but we'll see. And who knows, right. you know, maybe Pfizer will also discover that they're better at distribution than they thought. And their production facilities can go faster than they thought. 
Um, so perhaps, you know, we'll get more Pfizer vaccine, but who knows? I guess it's all, it's all a mystery, right? We have no idea. And depending on uh, delivery systems like CVS and Walgreens, and like you said, uh, is their infrastructure good enough to hold these cold storage vaccines? I'm curious to what happens if people try to take several vaccines and whether mm. there's a cross reactivity or a problem with that. If they take the, or um, well, they can't get the Pfizer's, they take the AstraZeneca, and then maybe they take Joe Schmoe's, and there's about 30 of them um, going down the road. Um, if they take another one to give them better protection, are they going to kill themselves or is it other reactions, cross reactivities going to occur? I don't think they've done, they haven't done those studies for sure. Uh, they would have to be animal studies, I would think. Yeah. Would not, uh, try to... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's a really um, good question, though. You know, I guess with the messenger RNA um, vaccines, I can't imagine, you know, because like you said, it's just a fragment of messenger RNA and then they're just using different vehicles to get it in. Right. So. It's a, a yep. same, same, same uh, you know, sort of method with a different t delivery vehicle. So who knows though, right? Uh, and let's, yeah, but let's say they uh, determine it's the vehicle to go back and put another vehicle and to make all those viruses again and to do all the, um, what do you call it, uh, 15,000 people on both ends, placebo and, and getting the virus. That's, that's a humongous task to yeah. redo something that you've made. Yep. Don't so, fall way behind. Yeah. Anyway, so virus talk over for a second. Let's uh, let's get back and uh, let's get back to this. So again, are you are you guys on speakerphone or are you uh, on regular? There you go. Oh, I'm I'm on regular. I'm on regular. I went off I, I was I was I just checked. I was off speaker also. Okay, good. Yeah. I have everything off. No feedback. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Any uh, well, any Leo Hadley supposed to be here? Yep. So Any Leo, word from him? No, I, I emailed him this morning. I don't know if he's going to make it in this this particular morning. So Leo wanted. So let me actually tell you what Leo wanted everyone to know uh, about what he's doing. So Leo, of course, runs. Uh, hang on here. Let me pull up his email. <laughs> he runs Vision Equipment Inc. And let's see. Okay. So uh, let's see. He updated his booth. He said and uh, you'll receive an extra 5% off on orders placed this month by mentioning CE Wire 2020. No limit on order size. And oh, by the way, if you order $100,000 worth of stuff, you get an additional $5,000 off. So there you go. Um, That's what he has to and say. To go to, and on the other than this business, we had a nice discussion with Zeiss and sure other companies are doing it. People always want to upgrade. I mean, things are getting better and better too quickly. Um, Leo will take that old equipment and give you some money for it rather than putting it in your basement or your garage. So uh, I'm sure that if you negotiate with him, he might take the equipment and resell it to some, some nice person down the road. So both in and out, Leo's got a great company. Yep. Yeah, don't. Yep. don't... Okay, I, I just kept word from Ben Casella. He's going to be part of the program at 1215. Oh, cool. Which means, Steve, you're on. To replace Steve is our pinch hitter for Leo Hadley. <laughs> so okay, anyway, so, Steve, uh, so we've been here. we've been talking, yeah. So we've been talking a little bit. Let's just talk about your course for a second, Steve, on epigenetics. So we've been talking about messenger RNA this morning and fun stuff about the virus, but you actually did some research into some other stuff around topics and genetics that yep. most people are unfamiliar with, right? So epigenetics is a relatively new term relative to what people know and understand. <laughs> um, you know. Just explain it simply. When somebody has um, gene therapy, like we had uh, something for a company called Luxterna approved for a Libus congenital amaurosis, that was the first one approved last year, that's actually changing the genes, the DNA, the ACT um, uh, sequence, so that you make a better gene copy and whatever disease you have hopefully will be better or cured. And it's being used for that and also RP. Epigenetics of things that change throughout your life. Your DNA is structured in a protein with other things, and as they bind to your DNA, they either get expressed, the proteins get made, or they get repressed and the proteins don't get made. So epigenetic changes really affect us through our whole life. And just recently, after my lecture, um, in fact, it was in the last month or so, um, that a company has worked with animals and they made epigenetic changes in the eyes, and that's because they're more accessible, but it had nothing to do with the eyes, except that it's just a better place to work with. 
and by putting what's called a methyl group, a methyl group is just um, carbon with some hydrogen atoms around it, they're able to change the expression of the gene. They then change the gene, and these mice got their uh, vision back, and they seem to age less, um, much less uh, quickly. So um, it's a great field because it looks like potentially we could – um, a, make people's lifestyle better, P, cure, B, cure diseases, and, and C, maybe have a greater life extension through epigenetic changes, which again, just very simply is making the genes that we have. We have a whole bunch of genes, billions of genes, uh, actually about 200,000 in our body, and they either get expressed a lot, a little bit, or not at all. And the things that happen throughout our life change that, whether it be um, your own genetics will help you change that, or things that you choose, like if you smoke, if you're obese, your environment, these will change how your genes are expressed. It's really a, an amazing field. And when I was lecturing, when I made this lecture, which was about uh, nine months ago, and I improved it a little bit, I never expected a therapy to be almost on the horizon with at least animal studies to be as our conference is going on. So I was talking five, ten years down the road, and it looks like it could be more than, more like a year or two. So, um, we all going to be minor geneticists, and, and one thing I, I have to tell people, if you have anybody with an inheritable retinal disease, such like retinitis pigmentosa, uh, choroideremia, uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis, all the diseases that have a hereditary component, you have to refer these people to a major institution for testing, because when you refer them to these institutions, they could do a genetic profile and see whether they have something that is a treatment now or a study that's going on, or something potentially for the future. So you're not only giving these people hope, but some of them actually could be treated at this point in time. And I believe it's about 5% of people with retinitis pigmentosa that they're doing treatments at Will's Eye, um, uh, Baskin Palmer in Florida, John Hopkins, and they're actually treating these people and they're getting some vision back. And as they improve the, um, the technology, uh, more and more things can happen. But the eye, the eye is just the low-hanging fruit. And, and the reason being is it, it, it's so easy to get to the eye. And it's um, what's called uh, immunologically privileged. The eye kind of is protected from the rest of the body, because at least the retina is, because it's part of the brain. You, you all know about the, no, well, you don't know, but the, there's something called brain-blood barrier, where a lot of things that happen in the body don't happen in the brain because it's protected. And the retina is simply an extension of the brain, which happens to uh, process the image that we see. Because of that, when you um, change the genes or the epigenetic changes in it, it really is not going to have an effect on the body. So it's a safe place to work. Now, by the way, interestingly enough, just to not digress, but to combine genetics and uh, epigenetics, the AstraZeneca and um, Johnson & Johnson treatment is exactly the same as what I talked about in the genetics and epigenetics lecture. They take the common cold virus, the, the adenovirus, and they put the gene for the coding of COVID spikes in that, unlike we'll talk about the, um, what uh, Pfizer is doing. And that, um, that virus, which is the common cold, infects the muscle cells where you're getting it injected, they produce antibodies to the COVID spikes, not the virus, the spikes, and that'll attack the virus and kill it as it comes into the body. Um, the messenger RNA is doing it slightly different. That's the Pfizer and the um, Moderna um, process. And what that's doing, again, they're going into the, the cells, but the messenger RNA is then coding for DNA to produce the spike, which again does the same thing. So two different approaches, but the interesting thing is it was called the AVV vector, which is the adenovirus that they're using, which is the common cold, and they're using that because it's safe, and they're just um, putting the genome for the spike. Not putting, so people are afraid of getting the disease um, from all these things. Uh, from, and that, that's not, not just COVID, but in general. Most of them, you can't get the disease because they're coding for just a gene that is defective or an epigenetic change, which is, um, there's two or three most common ones. One is called the methylization, which I spoke about, and one is called histone modification. Your DNA is a ball of kind of um, string all wrapped up around um, certain structures. And by changing how the structure opens and closes, you could change how the DNA is expressed. And again, this is science. I can't believe that in, um, since Watson and Crick 50 years ago, we were able to figure this out and, and get to this point. Was that clear? Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, it's and, amazing. But what, well, let's just to go a step back. 
Are you saying that people with retinitis pigmentosa, it's reversible? That, that they're, they're trying to get people that have you know, just about been blind from this back to seeing again and have peripheral it's, vision? It's not correct. Um, first, they did it with LCA, that Libra's condition, and then they discovered the same gene was involved with certain percentages of RP patients. And yes, not only are they doing it, but they're getting a certain percentage of vision back. It's not 2020 in a, in a 180 degree field, but their field of vision is improving, their night vision is improving, their subjective yeah, well, vision is improving, and, and they're getting some lines of acuity back. Yeah, that, that peripheral vision you know, really is, really is a, an amazing. <laughs> you, you really need that. I, I remember I used to date a, a gal with retinitis pigmentosa, and it was real fun to watch her go into a movie, into a movie okay. house. She was absolutely blind. That, that was a very short and, but, date. I, I didn't like you know people with the, with these diseases. So I could make a jo I could make a joke, Dad. Yeah. Dad, I can make a joke about you know the kind of people that would date you. Uh, you know they have to be blind, <laughs> but I'm not going to go there. Yeah, well, that's, that's <laughs> I was going to say something yeah. about, about Jewish anatomy, but I didn't, get, mm. I didn't go there either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but one other, one other uh, point though. Then if you're saying that this this is working. Uh, for the retina because it's low hanging fruit, very close to the retina is the brain and, and Alzheimer's should be a natural then for this. Yes. Alzheimer's, Parkinson, um, MS, all those diseases are again the low hanging fruit, but they're uh, a little bit more complex in that they're not just um, uh, like RP is, is typically one gene that's defective and LCA is one gene that's defective. While a lot of these diseases like glaucoma in the eye, and in the brain, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, they haven't yet identified, a, it's not a one gene system. And so because of that, it's a lot more complicated to treat. Uh, you can't just do gene therapy on one gene and change it. You can't do epi Now, it, um, the Alzheimer's, they think, is not genetic as much as epigenetic, which changes that have occurred in your body that have changed how the DNA structures and form these amyloid plaques, which again, um, start causing your um, dementia to develop. Uh, but it's it's not, so simple in those diseases, just like um, for, as another example, cancer uh, has many, many genetic changes before a cell becomes cancerous, um, and to revert, revert it back would be very difficult. You just have to you have to kill it. Is, is the way we're doing it now, and probably down the road, but we, we're getting better at killing it by identifying uh, substances on its surface, much like they do with COVID uh, nineteen, to attack it. And sometimes it's our own immune system, which is what we're doing to ourselves. Just imagine that we're, we're not giving anybody any medicine for all these um, vaccines. We're using our own body, and and that's unfortunately why older people have uh, less uh, well less good outcomes because of the fact that the immune system isn't as good. And so uh, it's great that um, uh, the treatments that we're developing, the vaccines that we're developing, they're getting an immune response similar to uh, younger people uh, with the two viruses, it's diverse. But it's, re it's really amazing. So um, uh, this is a field that's gonna get, um, it, it used to be blue sky until a month ago where they actually found out that they could change uh, the vision in mice. Now, um, mice have trouble reading uh, French and Italian, but they're very good with uh, with, with, with names. Yeah. So they were able to change. So the outcome was better. Now, it's, it's sometimes, obviously, things don't translate well from animals to humans in many things, including cancer therapy, unfortunately. But the fact that they can do it, that's the first stepping stone in now um, uh, doing it in the, in the human population. And in some of these diseases, as long as you're not doing any harm, a lot of these people are going blind anyway. So um, it's, it's a great uh, area of research because again, it's very accessible. Just imagine you, you could touch the retina with a, with a needle and um, that's exactly what they do to inject the, um, the genetic or the epigenetic changes. There's, there's a couple of enzymes. Um, enzymes are proteins and they do things in our body. And one of them is an enzyme that demethylates things one is an enzyme that methylates things. So they can change how the DNA is expressed based upon what enzyme they're giving. We make these naturally, but sometimes we, our body either screws up or our lifestyle choices that we make um, make things different. It's real interesting. When you look at um, identical twins, sometimes throughout life as they go off on their own paths and they live different lives and you see them when they're 30, 40, they look totally different. Not totally, they look a little different or a lot different depending on the, the case. Now, how does that happen? You know that DNA was identical, so it's whatever life choices they've made or environmental things that they've been exposed to that cause, again, these epigenetic changes, which is the expression of identical DNA. 
and sometimes they look uh, radically different and they live different lives. Some, uh, one might die of a heart attack at 40 and one might live to 95 years old. So um, these things, we, we're, we know about these things. And when you advise your patients to change their diet, um, let's say uh, not get exposed to radiation in some matter, shape, or form, well, whatever you do in your office, um, you're actually hopefully changing the epigenetic profile in such a way that they have a better outcome in life. Um, you tell a diabetic to lose weight. Uh, when they lose weight, their A1C goes down, uh, their sugar uh, levels go down. And why does that happen? We're changing how the genes are expressed. So their pancreas is kicking in a little bit. Their cells are kicking in a little bit. So we're making changes. When we make, we don't know, we know the black box. We're advising something, the outcome changes. What happens in between to cause it? What's the chemistry? What's the biochemistry that causes it? Apparently it's epigenetic. Epigenetic just simply means you're, you're again to say it for the uh, fourth or fifth time, is just changes in how our DNA is expressed. And so uh, you might be dealt a bad hand, you can't help that, and that, that's helped with gene therapy, but you might be dealt a very good hand and your own um, um, lifestyle or um, exposures have caused problems to occur that can be reversed now, um, at least on a, a low level and hopefully in the future. Now that that's not to say that we're gonna everybody's gonna be on the McDonald's and and um, smoking diet, um, hopefully down the road. But we'll um, we'll uh, we have some um, things to do. So do yeah. you know, you know so Steve? So Steve, Steve, actually, if you look up on the screen, you, I know you guys are gonna be behind a couple seconds. But if you look up on the screen, the study that came out from Harvard uh, earlier this month that it's you know they showed that's that they it. Could, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So they showed that they could reverse glaucoma induced eye damage in animals. So. This is probably, you know, for you know, I, I know obviously the rare genetic diseases are important. However, this this could be really game changing for a huge number of people, right? If this can work properly. And this is epigenetic, so it's not as dangerous. It's a methylization. If you look down the article, it'll yep. explain a little bit more. And look at the date. Uh, it's probably something like uh, November, December of this year. Yeah, December second. Yeah, in nature. Yeah, so it's so no, timely, please. and I, I was going to get this into my lecture, but it was too late to get the slide up, so um, I'm sorry, guys, but uh, in future years, we'll, we'll continue with that. Yeah. How did you get interested yep. in this? I know you're interested in astronomy, but this is not part of optometry. How, what made you well, uh, I, I, get interested? I've always, been, I've always been an optometrist slash scientist. When I was in school, I won the Vision Science Award for various things. So I've always liked science and basic science. So probably another life, if we could live two or three lives, I'd get a PhD in some science field and, and do that with optometry. But uh, I chose not to go that route. So I, I always, if you look at some of my other pre previous lectures, they were on things that had to do with basic science that relate to optometry. And I, and it, I mean, most of these fields are not that hard because one thing that we do get in optometry is a really good uh, education, almost all of um, the scientific backgrounds whether it be optics, which was one of my other lectures, or uh, one of the other lectures years ago that I did, or biochemistry, or physiology, uh, or neuroscience. We get all of that, uh, maybe even more so than uh, a medical student, a student gets. So we, ha we have the background, I have the basic knowledge, and I always I just get an interest from whatever article I read um, in uh, the various journals that aren't uh, optometric and aren't ophthalmological. Um, there, there's, I get nature and um, what do you call it? There's a, there's a site called Flipboard that everybody should download on their uh, pad or, or, or computer or, or your phone. And there's almost every journal you can think of is in the world there. Some let you read the whole articles, some let you read just a, a portion of them. But you get the feeling. So again, it's whatever um, gets my interest. In fact, one of our lecturers this year, uh, Dr. Ledger, it was a PhD out of um, uh, University of Pittsburgh. And I started talking to him about his research, which is on the uh, bacterial flora in the gut and how it affects the eye. And, uh, and he was doing a whole bunch of research in that. So uh, after a couple of conversations, he agreed to come on and lecture for us. So it, it just, uh, I still have a, you know, a fertile interest in basic science. And uh, that's how I got interested in it. So when I did ge genetics, and I, I, I'm not a geneticist at all, but I could at least uh, converse with them knowledgeably. Then I went on to epigenetics and, and whatever uh, else has. And uh, maybe if Elon Musk is going to hire me, I'll, I'll learn a little bit about uh, space science. In fact, you, well, you know my logo. What is it? It's space doc. That's my email. So it's a uh, yeah. combination of everything. So, so like everything else, uh, my wife says I, I do take up space. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. 
Oh my gosh! So it's just a fertile That's imagination a... that uh, I'd rather. You know, I love I love optometry, but after a while we tend to be experts of it. So I like to be a master of other things, and that's what got me interested. But uh, it's a good question. Oh my gosh! Hey, you know, Steve, you I, was, find when, Steve, uh, I was wondering actually. Yeah, I was just looking. I was looking at the study itself. When you use a vector, you know, like a, a virus that they're using here, the adenovirus. And you're injecting these, yeah, same these thing. Yeah. yeah. And so you're injecting the, these genes, and you know they start to ex express genes that have been latent otherwise. Have they actually seen? Because I don't see it in these papers. You know, obviously these genes have been turned off for some reason, right, by evolution um, over time, in a, in a person as they age. Right. When you turn them back on again, what kind of sort of second order effects have people seen? Have tumors developed or anything of that nature? Or because you don't really see any any of these second order effects in these studies. You know, that's a great thing. I think you know what telomeres are, for example, correct? Yep, yep. it's a little bit uh, on the end. Okay. So, to, to, but but that's a good way of, of uh, approaching your question. A, a telomere is basically our chromosomes have at the end of it a whole bunch of garbage um, bits of DNA, and as our cells divide, this garbage bit gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it stops. The cell stops dividing, and we age, and we age more rapidly. Well, there's an enzyme called telomerase which controls that. And like you suppose, let's say they take that enzyme and make it express um, less so that the cells will not get shorter and shorter as time goes on. And they'll, um, and people live longer, you'll, get, you'll stay younger and healthier. Sounds good. But like you said, or suppose, cancers develop from that. So they have to be able to control in a way that um, uh, doesn't affect things negatively. And that's where the challenges are. To, uh, you can't go haphazard. You can't do human studies on these things. So correct. It's, um, the, the AV vector is great for these. Um, like, for example, for the, this particular thing, it was a one gene um, thing. Now, glaucoma is many. It's, I think they've isolated about 60 genes for glaucoma because there's various types. And uh, why does some person react to the medications or the uh, IOP lowering while other people don't? And they have to figure it out. But in, at least in mice, in this particular case, a lot of them, as you see, got back acuity, got back visual field, and um, and hopefully that will transfer onto humans. And that, that, I mean, that was just right hot off the presses. So I think we're going to have a lot more studies of basic science and otherwise. But you're right. It, it, the big thing is control. Many years ago, I think it was about 10, 15 years ago, they did the first gene therapy on a, a boy in France for, I forget the disease, but it was a systemic disease, and he died. And that stopped all the research uh, for a while. And they, so you have to be really careful because you don't want to make things worse. And that's why the eye is so fertile, because, again, it's protected. Again, a lot of the diseases, not, not glaucoma, unfortunately, are uh, single gene defects. And because of that, uh, we might, for example, colorblind is uh, just a uh, several gene defect. Well, we might be able to make color blindness better. Not that that would be a uh, something we want people want to go in gene therapy as long until it's very very safe. But you have to be able to regulate it, and that's why it's being done. You're not going to do this in your office. You're going to refer the people out to the major institutions that uh, I would think for this for the very foreseeable future. Sure. You know, I remember there was a study on the aging uh, way way back when I was still in practice, where they were getting Rockefeller University. I love most people don't know about Rockefeller University, but it's in New York, and it's a separate university for pure research. And I had a couple of patients from Rockefeller University, and they were looking for people in their 90s that were still sharp to, to become guinea pigs. And I had the fortune or misfortune of getting many of these people into the practice for, that were cataract patients, but they were sharp as tacks. A lot of them were German Jews. For some reason, the, the Kissinger type of people, and the Kissinger is still going strong, and he's in his 90s. And there are many people like that around, and they they wanted them to see what what's what's the commonality among these people that keeps them so sh mentally sharp. Some are not as physically sharp as they used to be, but but certainly mentally sharp. And I never know what ever came of the study. But I did supply them yep. with patients. More than likely, so. it was their their genome, because most of the people in, in Eastern Europe lived the same sort of lifestyle and ate the same food, etc. So it was just the the deck of cards they were shuffled with, and, and they they got lucky. Or but, maybe um, or a natural got, selection that these were the smarter ones that got out of Germany uh, just before Hitler, or or during the Hitler time, and they came to the United States. So this was the survival of the fittest, and they would, 
these were the most fit intellectually to start with. Uh, and maybe that, that's why there was that, that group there. But, Are you yeah. supposing that the Jewish population, because throughout history they've been persecuted, have been jealously selected to be superior, Paul? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't want to say that. <laughs> uh, that would be a whole can of worms we don't want to open up. Um, you might say that for, about every race, every race or every yeah. ethnicity, because we've all been persecuted sure. over the course of, uh, of history. But you're right. So, so the idea is now you, you know the the result. Now, could we analyze the DNA of these people to see what is different? And then if it is different, what to change in a person who's alive? Or uh, there's a lot of little controversy, what to change in the fetus so, fetus right. so that your, um, your baby becomes what you want it to be rather than what it would have been. Oh, and, and Steve, the, the I'm going to have discussion. to cut you off. This has been an interesting discussion for sure. And everybody, you're, you're, you know, Steve's lecture is available on demand. You see I have it up on the screen right here. So now that CE Wire is, you know, kaput, uh, at least the live part of it, the the, uh, the on-demand lecture will live on. So I urge everybody to go and check it out. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, or we, we can move on here to our first external interviewee of the day. So Millie, are you there? I am here. Woohoo! Hey, how's it I, going? Hi, Millie. Hi, Millie. Hey, Paul. Hi, Adam. <laughs> and you got Steve Silberberg here too. So gang's all here. Steve's so, here. So everybody, this is Millicent Knight who. Uh, and believe it or not, Millie, I believe you participated in the very first CE Wire about a million years ago. So it's so great to have you back on here again. Yeah, full circle. And we both had little sons who came busting into the room right in the midst of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Fortunately, now that they're not so little anymore, I guess we're a little obsolete now. I know that my son is much more interested in playing Fortnite or whatever than actually barging in here. So you know, it makes it a little easier. Uh, yeah, that's what now too. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, really interesting lecture on the epigenetics. By the way, I've always been interested in that topic. Yeah, Steve's talk is really oh, we cool. We should have a conversation, and, Millicent. Yeah, I mean, yep. Steve, you Steve, can take it on demand, and um, <laughs> if you want to talk to me, I can. Yep. <laughs> so, so Millie, you know, you. I wanted to actually play a video for folks. Um, just to, you know, one thing that we wanted to talk to you about today is sort of everything that's happened in the past year, because I think for everybody. 2020 has been a rather long year, um, but I have a little video here. I'm going to queue it up. You may not be able to hear it over the phone, but I'll play it for everyone. It's about a minute long, and then maybe we can just sort of talk about it and then just talk about where you've been and what you're doing. So let me let me tee this thing up. So here we go. Everybody ready? And go. As an independent eye care provider, you have a lot of needs to fulfill. You need to grow your practice. You need a steady stream of patients, and you need to provide exceptional care to keep those patients coming back. But before all those things, you need an advocate. At Essilor, we realize there's more to vision care than just vision care, which is why we invest in you by supplying you with tools and resources that not only give your patients their best vision, but also help drive your business forward. Need visibility? With Primetime TV and digital ads for Essilor experts, you'll have more than ever before. What about premium products? As our partner, you'll have access to industry-leading lens technology like Verilux Advanced Progressive Lenses, as well as partner programs like Essilor Experts, so your patients can enjoy the most loved and trusted eyewear brands in the world. How about support? Glad you asked. We have programs that provide access to specialized training and business management tools for dispensing our partner brands. We even offer extra benefits like a loyalty program, giving you financial freedom and the opportunity to earn bonus points, delivering even more value for your practice. Being a partner of Essilor goes beyond best-in-class products. It's a joint effort to position you and your practice for long-lasting competitive success. So whether you need industry-leading lens technology, first-class support, or groundbreaking resources, you always get more with Essilor. Learn more at EssilorPro.com. Okay, so I think everybody uh, got a sense of what that was about, and you know, just talking sort of about how how Essilor has kind of been here for everybody as this this year has unfolded for for better or worse. So Millie, you have kind of a unique perspective, right? Because in your position, you get to see things from industry side, and you've gotten to to have a front row seat on everything that's happened. So maybe you could just catch us up a little bit. Um, what's been going on in your world? Okay, great. Well, thank, first of all, thanks for playing that, that video. I think it really sets the stage for where we as a company want to be, and that, and that is to, to, get, to have the, our doctors get more from our relationship and our partnership in 2021. 
Um, but before I go into this interesting year that in journey that we've all been on, I, I wanted to take a second to thank you and Paul for all that you do for the industry and making sure that we get top notch education. You stay on top of everything that's going on and you really take an earnest effort to communicate that out to the masses. So I just wanted to thank you, especially during this season of gratitude that we're in. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's so nice of you. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I took some notes. I started taking some notes and then I was like, you know what, this is just gonna be a conversation. And I think it's, it's a rich and important conversation in that um, when we first sort of got challenged with some of the, with the, um, COVID shutdowns and and just this whole like fury of not knowing what's coming next and what we should do next. Are we considered essential providers? Are we not? Um, the first thing was to roll up our sleeves and work which we did as a company with the AOA and other organizations to make sure that optometry was recognized as an essential provider and profession. And um, by, by virtue of that, we of course had to fulfill, so we were an essential business. Um, we then, I know I worked with our global teams and our research teams to try and access information from CDC and other organizations to help doctors prepare to number one, boost the confidence of their patients, have information to communicate with their patients before they started to come back into the office, because that was really critical to store up that confidence from the patients, it's what the of your staff, because the staff crowd, um, staff were afraid, to be honest. And so it's really critical to make sure everyone was ready to go, the practices are ready to go. And we spent some time uh, doing ECP programs to help people uh, prepare their practices uh, so they'd have the right protocols in place. And again, this is very early on in the journey with people were first starting to come back into their practices. And then we also wanted to make sure that we trained our sales team so that they were ready to, for the new relationship they were going to have with their doctor partners. And they would also be the least disruptive coming into the office because they were for the businesses and including all the way down to the PPE. And they would all be bringing their own so they wouldn't take away from the precious source of PPE that the doctors needed for their patients and for their staff. Right. So that was probably really early on. That was one of the things that we really had to grow up first. Yeah. I'll pause for a second there. Yep. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was just wondering, you know, you mentioned disruption and people coming in. So in the beginning, at least, I know that all the offices were shut down. But now that they're back, are you actually having people, you know, go out into the field or is a lot of stuff that you're doing virtual? Yeah, we, we do a little bit of both. I think that is to meet people where they are. And that goes for both. Um, our company, as it relates to the doctors and the practices and the staff, one of the things that we did was we provided during some of the downtime that some of the um, doctors and staff had is we made sure that we had free um, CE available so that they could sort of fill in some gaps in some areas where time does not always permit when the practices are in full swing. So really, we had... Um, I don't know, an 800% increase in the amount of coursework that was taken. Um, we always have a pretty robust program throughout the year, but it was just, it just grew up yep. Um But, you know, we wanted to also, at the same token, make sure that um, if the doctors weren't comfortable meeting with the staff or um, our sales team coming into the office, that we found different and unique ways and really whatever way they wanted to meet. And I think that the important point there, too, is that that also cascaded to the patient and the consumer. Because the one thing that we know now is that we have to be prepared to meet the patient where they are. And some were ready to come back into the office, and some wanted to use online telehealth, telemedicine type technology to be able to at least do a portion of their exam or to meet their more urgent or emergent needs which I'm really proud of our profession, by the way, um, because we kept a lot of those patients who would have gone into the emergency room from going into the emergency room when we really needed that space in the hospital for those patients who had um, more issues with COVID and COVID-related conditions. Um, so we now know that patients are not gonna turn around and go back, even once we have this uh, coronavirus managed, if you will. 
And so we've had to modernize our practices and we'll have to modernize the approach. And we have some tools and technology available through SLORS to help doctors be able to do that. We have a technology, we know that patients want to schedule appointments or uh, want to sometimes seek information about the practice or about a particular condition before they reach out to your practice. So we have all of that information and those tools available so that at 11 o'clock at night or midnight when the patient suddenly realizes, oh my God, I need to make this appointment and I've been putting it off and I wanna get it done, they can do that at night. And when you come into the office in the morning, you've got a full schedule. So that's kind of what I think doctors want to um, look forward to in the new year. And that's what patients are increasingly expecting. Right. Because I don't think many people realize or, you know, if they hadn't been paying attention that you guys, you know, you're more than just the product, right? You actually have a whole bunch of software tools now that people can use. They can sign up for and actually implement in their practice if they want to. Absolutely. We have those. We, we have everything to help, uh, again, as I said, modernize practices and allow doctors to be able to meet their patients wherever they are. Um, you know, we also have some, I think, some of the best products in the market. And uh, for instance, I'm just going to pick on one in particular. If I think about Prozal, I was um, on a platform recently where we were talking about the front and back surface and the UV and AR protection associated with that product and just how important that is, particularly if you're in a co-management type relationships, and most of us are, um, where not just, uh, not just with your cataract surgeons or your LASIK surgeons, but even your oculoplastic surgeons who are doing um, surgeries on the probably 8 to 10% of cancers that occur around the eye, lid, and the neck areas. And those doctors are not as familiar with uh, the fact that, you know, if you don't have back surface AR protection, that you're actually getting some of those light rays bouncing back into that sensitive tissue around the eyes and also inside of the eyes. So they don't know about that, and it's an opportunity to educate them as part of that co-management relationship that you have with those ophthalmologists. Yep. So these are the North Center Center. Center. Mm -hmm. Can you talk? Now, I was just going to oh. interject. Um, oh. Have you found, Steve, have you found a difference in the product um, products that people are ordering because of the COVID virus, like more blue blocking technology, better computer glasses, more progressive lenses because of the stay at home? Is there a shift that you're seeing in Essilor's product line? Yes, we do. We are definitely finding more of a shift in that. We're finding more people looking, you know, seeking out the Crizal Provincia, um, and then just asking a whole lot more information. You know, there's, um, I've um, been working also, I'll, I'll pivot in a second, to some work with the Global Myopia Awareness Coalition, and we've set up a multitude that's 15 companies in the industry, you know, doing, taking big to do, to, to do well and to educate the community on progressive myopia because so many parents are concerned now that their children are e-schooling. Uh, we're on, we're personally on digital devices all day between our computers at work and then in between when you take a break, you take a break and you get your cell phone out. And, you know, it's just, it's just nonstop bombardment. Uh, to our visual system and to ergonomically to our system. So um, just having those conversations about how important it is in between your uh, digital devices, your gaming activities, um, getting out, getting that UV that you do need uh, that for the vitamin D conversion, and then shutting the devices down at a respectable time period in the evening so that you know you can get the natural hormone melatonin to kick in and do what it's supposed to do so that you get a nice relaxing sleep and wake up ready to go the next day. And that's really critical with children. Um, so I've had a lot of, uh, we've had a, a lot of inquiries in that area and we've uh, been able to partner a lot in that space. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to when we have a spectacle solution to the myopia um, epidemic, which will be coming sometime soon, I hope. Cool. And you know, Millie, one thing that's really funny, we had uh, Craig Thomas um, on the phone yesterday, and obviously he's always a, you know, overflowing with information that he loves to give out. Um, <laughs> but what he was telling us um, was that in his practice, from what he's seen, um, people, even though his patient volume is down, the patients who he, he has, they're actually spending more 
a lot of the time um, because they they have this disposable income, right? Because everyone's kind of trapped and all they're doing is sitting in front of screens at home and <laughs> can't go anywhere or do anything else. So they're treating themselves, right? To, this is the time when they're trying to upgrade their eyewear. So I thought that was a kind of a fascinating discussion. You know, and it's a, and it's, it's actually what we're hearing a lot of too. We had an Essilor, we have a Essilor think tank and we had a, a whole session around headwinds. But the funny thing is uh, we heard that over and over again, you know, less patients because we're being more methodical about how we uh, bring the patients in for their eye examinations. Um, but because of that, you're able to really be able to address their needs. I use a term called bioindividuality, and it's basically looking at that individual and making sure that you're putting together a treatment plan that's specific to that individual based on their needs. And so when you when you are able to spend that time talking about the challenges they have, how much time they're spending on their digital devices, this is what I recommend for you. This is why I recommend it recommend for you. And you know, patients don't like to sell, but you're, when you educate the patient, you don't have to sell because you're giving them what they came in for. That's why they came in to you in the first place because of your expertise in that area. But we have noticed that the average sell price is up. The, 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 the amount that the patient is spending per transaction is up and that the capture rate has increased tremendously. Yep, because I mean, if you're motivated enough to actually get out to any kind of healthcare provider's office, right? Clearly you're motivated. <laughs> you know, most people, you, you don't wanna go, but if you're there, <laughs> you may, you've made the commitment. So I could see why people are spending more. Yes, and, and, no, so and, I'm very and, interested in. You talk. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. No, I was saying I was very interested in your little comment about the myopia control glasses because that's a field of interest of mine. Um, I know it's not approved or even close to the U.S., but what's happening overseas in terms of that um, lens or lens products? Well, we have that? a product. Yeah, we have a product called Celis, and it's it's out, and uh, we have it. It's launched in China, uh, and we're working through, you know, what we have to work through in order to get in, uh, approved to be launched in this country. And so we have all hands on deck, and uh, you know, we're working to bring a good and right solution. And in the meantime, we're just staying engaged and supporting the efforts of the doctors who are working really hard to address those patients' needs with the tools and services that are available today. Mm -hmm. But the science is similar to what um, orthokeratology and the contact lenses that are from myopia control do in terms of what the optics are. It's a similar approach. Um, well, a similar approach, I would say, but the but the actual um, technology and the science is a bit different. And um, unfortunately, I can't go into any more detail on that. But um, <laughs> it's really exciting, and it's. I, I think that when we are able to bring it to the market, it will be a big game changer. Yep. And, and up on the screen right now, Steve, if you want to peruse, I have their press release, which is probably about as much as Millie can say. <laughs> yeah. But she tells us she has to kill us and you can't, you can't tape this either. So it, it's not a viable option. <laughs> have these intimate conversations with Adam anymore if you do that. <laughs> you know, speaking of press release, I've got to compliment you, Millie, and the company on the slickest, well, wonderfully prepared advertising to both the profession, but more important to the public. It is really beautifully done. Uh, I think of, of any of the companies, you, you seem to be best at this. And this is this is your bailiwick right now. You're, you're part of the relationship and, and the link of Tom Tris have to Essilor. Is that correct? Is that is that pretty much your job? Yeah. That is my role. I, I serve on the senior management team, and I am actually the voice of the optometrist on that senior management team. I report directly to the president. So I, so, I, it's my personal commitment to make sure that I look out for the best interests of uh, my colleagues, our colleagues out there, and making sure that, you know, I know that our company is always looking to do the best in terms of services and the products and technology. You know, equipment company that people uh, often forget about, but we work in tandem across these, co these companies as best we can um, to make sure that we're bringing good and right services to to patients and through the doctors. And that is actually the commitment, you know, when I left practice, um, which was a very, very difficult decision. 
uh, because I love clinical care. Um, but when I left practice, one of the things that one of my patients said was that, you know, you've always been an advocate for us, uh, us as patients being able to get great products and services. And I know that you'll continue to do that on a bigger level in your, in your, in your role in industry. And so that is a commitment I made to my own personal patients after 20 years of practice in, in my practice. And that's a commitment that I make today. So, so basically when you are, uh, if you're doing this, you know, uh, I spend all my time on OD wire and I, every day there are complaints. So when, when there's complaints about Essilor, uh, how, what's the best way to reach you so you can address these complaints to the optometrist? Um, if it is something that it can be addressed, that's, that's a, a legitimate um, a concern, I'm going to say, because I think that um, often if we're complaining about something, it's because we care and we want to make sure that we have the right information as it relates to how we best take care of our patients. And so I'm always available, Paul, to you or to Adam. Um, Adam has my cell phone, uh, personal cell phone, my work cell phone, so um, you can reach out to me. And if it's something that um, I am able to address or discuss, I'm happy to do that. If I can't do it publicly, I'm happy to get the information to you. That's great. <laughs> and, and what's the, well, you have the FAO title, um, I see you on your name. What's that second one? What's that last F that you have? What, what does it stand for? <laughs> F-A-A-R-M. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, fellow in the American Academy of Anti-Aging Regenerative Medicine. Cool. And one okay. of the things I believe is that you have to differentiate yourself in this field and that you have to continually reinvent yourself. And when you listen to your patients, my patients were always asking for what they could do themselves, you know, taking some personal responsibility for their own eye and health care and understanding the connection between the eye and the body. And knowing that um, what I used to say as my tagline was the optometrist in practice of the future, look at the whole body while they're focused on the eyes. And so we've gotten so fragmented in the whole healthcare system where there, we're so compartmentalized with each part of the body. Well, I like to look at the body as a whole and the eyes are a window into the rest of the body. And that was the approach I took in practice. So um, part, of doing, uh, part of making sure I could address the needs of my patients was to go back and do that fellowship most of whom were internal medicine physicians in that in that particular fellowship, but there are about five or six optometrists that I'm aware of who also have that credential. And your interest in epigenetics. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, Millie, thank you so much for, for coming here. <clears throat> Excuse me for coming here today. And I actually just I put up your little uh, the uh, fellowship in anti aging and regenerative medicine page just on the the. Uh, the screen so people can see what it is. So that's pretty, pretty neat stuff. Um, so, you know, CE Wire is going to continue on to, into next year. Hope to have you back, you know, in the new year to, to, to sort of talk about how things are going. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that the next time we do a CE Wire, things are going to be substantially back to normal. Maybe I should knock on some wood <laughs> or something. Um, because, you, you know, and I'm just glad that, you know, you've been, you've been there along the way and that, you know, things are, are you know, sort of normalizing for you guys at least, and you found ways to interact with the doctors, even in this really most challenging time that I think any of us have ever had. Well, Adam, thank you for the opportunity to number one, say thank you to all of the doctors out there who've been supporters um, and those who have, have provided even feedback that's allowed us to get even better in the new year. So we're looking forward to it. We know that there's some headwinds there, but we know that we're up to the challenge and we know that each and every one of you are up to the challenge as well. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great day. And we'll see you at the next live meeting sooner or later. Eventually. It's going to be a live meeting where we'll get together. <laughs> so we'll see you then. Yes, I'll, look, I'll look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Millie. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye-bye. Okay. That was fun. Always good to hear very, from Millie. Very bright lady. Yeah. That's that was, that was a great question. Person. That F A F F they play farm. I'm putting it up on the, the screen fellow? again so you can you can see it again. So the fellowship in anti aging and regenerative regenerative and functional medicine. So you can see sort of the fellowship director and uh, 
and who's who's on there. So she's right. It is a bunch of MDs, mostly and PhDs. Um, so pretty neat that she was able to take part. Cool stuff. Okay, well, we we have a problem with Ben Casella. <laughs> uh oh. As a high dialed in number it says disconnected. So let's. That is because I I, the right I, I'm going to I'm going to make no, a they're, guess. They're, I'm going to hazard a guess that you sent him the wrong. It number. wasn't. <laughs> oh, no, let me let me send him. Another, I'll do it again. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, I'll I'll take care of it. <clears throat> well, is he coming on next? Let's look at his schedule. Uh, he's he's coming on next. You guys can chat for a minute. Sure. Oh my God, that's hilarious. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a great example, actually, of cutting and pasting versus typing stuff in again. Um, I, no, I cut and I, paste for I cut and paste exactly what I sent to the other speakers this morning. Uh -huh. So, so therefore, <laughs> your computer's I hope possessed. the other speakers. <laughs> I hope the other oh, speakers no. find this. I, I I think that you know so, you I, might. <laughs> okay, let me, let me, I'm, some, okay, I'm getting it very, very slowly, yeah. carefully. It, it turned a okay, nine into me, a six. I don't, wanna, I don't know how I it don't happened. Wanna, I'm innocent. I really, I was so careful this morning, but you know, it was six o'clock in the morning here. So, okay, we got the first part here. 669-224-3412. Okay, we have and the number. number is... That's the right number, correct? All you have to do is go into the spreadsheet and cut and paste. Literally, control C, control V. 494 917. Okay, no typos. I'm looking. Here we go. Hi, computers. Here we go. Setting it out. And the whole the whole world is listening, Paul. Well, they, they know I'm a schmuck when it comes to this. <laughs> I don't keep it a secret. Uh, One of the many, many bad things that I do, you know, it's uh, it's not easy being me is, waking up. I'll, Rich Whitlin is coming on next, so his, he's lecturing now, so I'll, I'll tell him um, what the numbers are. Yeah, if you want to, Steve, if you want to cut and paste the numbers, what's on the spreadsheet is correct. So. Yeah, I'll do that to him right now. That's hilarious. Okay. And Ben Casella sent his cell number. So look, look on the on the computer if that helps. But I'm I'm certain I sent it right. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. So anyway, if uh, I'm going to send okay. out. I'm going to check the letters I sent out this morning. I I sent it all out. <laughs> oh boy. Well, other people called in correctly. Yeah. So uh, it, it works. Did, so. Things are working at some level, I guess. Right. So. Um, but if oh, let me let me see. We have a bunch of speakers this afternoon, so I'll, I'll check it right now. All right. So anyway, if you look on the schedule, I put it up on the screen again. So um, you're right. So uh, Dr. Whitlin is in his class right now. Laser vision correction update. So uh, that's going to be kind of cool. Oh, somebody just came in. And who might that be? Might that be Ben? Hey, hey guys, what's going on? Hey, sorry that hey, Dad, Dad sent you on a wild goose chase this morning, I think. No, you all <laughs> You're not bugging me at all. It keeps me on my toes. How are y'all doing? <laughs> doing good. Doing good. Okay. So, how are you doing, Ben? I mean, uh, life going going okay? I mean, I, I have we haven't checked in with you now for a few months. Everything going good? Yeah, it seems to be. I'm just trying to keep my head under the radar and waiting for the government to give Pfizer a bunch of crop dusters and just go outside and breathe in the air, I suppose. <laughs> What's your feeling about that? Because I, I, I'm not too hopeful right now that most of our facilities around here are going to be able to handle this vaccine uh, competently. So I don't know how long it's going to take for, well, for guys like you and me at our age to get vaccinated. It might be forever. It could be a minute. Um, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in my late 30s. I'm typo, blood, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I see... I see a lot of people, you know, and I remind a lot of people to put their masks on and I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting it. But I understand that the federal government wants to leave it up to states to decide exactly how they're going to allocate. And that concerns me a little bit. Absolutely. And I mean, even here in Oregon, I'm concerned, too. We're a small state with a, a relatively centralized population. And even I don't see how they're going to distribute this thing efficiently in an area where it shouldn't be that hard to do. 
Um, so I can imagine a state like Georgia, which is actually pretty big, right? Um, you know, you have lot, uh, you, lots yeah, of communities Yeah, we're the eighth throughout. largest state in the U.S. Yeah. So. And we also have two big oh. Senate runoff races happening. Oh, too. yeah, you're going to be number one. <laughs> you're going to be number one in the media for the next couple of weeks. Yep. So we're going to watch it, closely. It is, it is so what do you think about terrible the with these. Good. Good talk, Ben. Uh, hello? Yep. Yeah, go ahead, talk again. Oh, yeah, 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 no worries. I was just making a reference that the uh, political attack ads are just, they're just incredible. It's, it's incredible how much money is being pumped into Georgia politics right now. And the only thing that I really take from it is that undecided voters, I guess, I guess just by and large, are, are not the most intelligent people because all the ads are saying is that if you vote for the other one, the whole country's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 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 incredible. <laughs> so funny. Well, well, at least it's, you know it's outside money being pumped into the economy in, in Georgia, right? And yeah, the ad agencies I, are local. It's being pumped into something. I tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I guess. I is. heard Savannah's rates for their for their TV and radio is ten times the ordinary rates. Wow. So somebody's making a lot of money there. So, I think so. that like a a week's worth of advertising in um Atlanta is like it's like well into six figures. It's it's mm. it's incredible. Wow. And I wish it, that uh, somebody would come on into my office. But well, well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, what you know, you, are you gonna do? You're in Augusta, right? So how are you seeing this creep in yeah. to where you are? Right? Are you seeing billboards everywhere, or is it just like just constantly on the airwaves? Are you just being inundated? Constantly on the airwaves, mm. being absolutely inundated. And uh, people, um, um, Republicans are, 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 are framing um, Warnock and Ossoff just to be, it, 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 there's, there's no ad that doesn't mention Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and then there's no ad that the Democrats are putting in that doesn't mention Trump. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> And what changed somebody's vote? For, I, I understand Purdue won by two or three percentage points. And that, I mean, they were inundated before for the general election. What would, it's just a matter of turnout, I would imagine, on both sides, because he won sure. by enough to have a little bit of a cushion. But again, if the Democrats show up more, then, then the other person will overtake him. And that's why it's. I mean, I, I know they're inundated. The, the buses are going to show up at everybody's home to take them to the polling places. Or can pe can people vote um, uh, absentee? Yeah, we can still do mail-in here, um, and that's what I'm choosing to do. Um, just because in Georgia, there's still a fair amount of people that wear their masks like it's an Amish beard. Oh God! And um, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Or like they like have their masks. It's like they have their mask on, yep. and you can still see their nose. You know, it's like it's like having twins, but only buying one car seat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're, <laughs> but um, you're absolutely right. It all boils down to turnout, and without um, a presidential uh, uh, contest at the top of the ballot, I think turnout's probably going to be less than it was for the general. Um, but you know, we. We shall see, but it can't get here soon enough. Yeah, just get it over with. I'm and sure. Get back to normal. But meanwhile, yes. speaking of speaking of normal, cut the cord. How is your office doing? I mean, obviously, you mentioned people who are abusing their masks in terrible ways. But um, you know, are you sort of starting to see a little more normal volume? We just spoke to Millie Knight, who you know, and and we spoke to to Craig Thomas yesterday, who sort of said yep. his volumes are down, but ticket prices are up because people who do show up tend to spend more. You know, I, I I will say we're up to about we're between sixty and seventy percent of of our so called pre COVID numbers. We pretty much got our moves down. Um, no families greater than two. No, it's 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 it, it's. I will say that our bottom line is better than I thought that it would be. I think we're um, I think we're um, averaging a little more per capita per. Uh, patient. Um, 
And maybe that's because I'm getting to spend more time with people. And we're, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I like the way that things are going now. And I'm, I don't think I'm going to go back to my so-called pre-COVID patient flow numbers. Um, it's, it's, I, I, I'm in, I'm enjoying spending more time with patients. Yep. But the long you said that, short, Ben, because we're getting there. We just interviewed mm-hmm. Millicent Knight uh, from Essilor, and she said precisely what you're saying on, on a national level, that spending more time with the patients, you're now satisfying need rather than selling a pair of glasses. And, and that's why the average person is spending more, because you're satisfying the needs during this uh, crisis. So exactly what you said is what interesting. saying. But, but Ben, here's the interesting what? thing, right? I mean, besides having to like dress yep. up like a human condom or whatever to go see patients now, uh, <laughs> putting, putting that aside, like... <laughs> Is it is it more Well, I'm Catholic, Adam. I, <laughs> but is it more fun now, right? I mean, besides having to wear all the gear, is it more fun now because you can slow down, right? Isn't that the way that people really want things to be or at least a lot of people I know I would just slower, you know? Agree. I agree with you 100%. Um there's still like it it's 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 funny. It's like I'm 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 still keeping things relatively tamped down, obviously. Um there's 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 the scientist in me that that understands that this is the right thing to do and that we're doing this as well as we can and 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 the only thing that really keeps it from being fun is that is juxtaposed with the small business owner in me who is terrified when like a family of five shows up to just pick up like one kid's glasses and they're just like roaming around my office. You know, it's like a a waiting room with people in it used to be a a good thing. And now it's what I fear most, you know? Um, But I will say that, yes, being able to spend more time with patients is, I mean, optometry is a people profession, you know? And, um, and maybe, you know, maybe if there's, if there's any plus side to that, it's that I, I I'm beginning to realize that I suppose, you know, because you work harder, you it's, 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 I feel like I'm working a little bit smarter now rather than working harder. Don't you feel that it's always, you talk, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just wondering, will the practice management gurus that have been preaching one way of practicing suddenly change their whole tune uh, that you don't really have to practice the way they spoke before, where you want to, you know, turn out a very large number of patients with all the automated right. equipment, uh, and and you're going to right. be uh, slower. And uh, will that change? Uh, I'm wondering. I, I know I recall just a quick story. Uh, we had a major fire in 1989. I'm going way way back, and we had to move our practice uh, to 900 square feet from 4,000 square feet. And we, wow. we were only, when we only were, we went down from the number of associates we had to only one exam room, but the practice stayed open from seven in the morning to seven at night, six days a week. And it turned out that the bottom line was not that with the profit, even though the gross was much less, our, our profit, because we were paying much, much less rent, was equal. So we didn't take any loss. And being out of an office for six months, and of wow. course now we went back to normal business. But you know, so a lot of the preconceived notion we we keep hearing about the people that drop the VSP, for example, that is something yep. that most optometrists won't do. And yet we have people on ODWAR that say, "I have never been happier." That I got rid of the vision care plans, and people are just sure. just the medical insurance and no vision insurance, and I'm a happy guy. So I'm just wondering if that's going to be changing now with, with the new world. Uh, the Will that be swept up in the aggregate of the new normal? I would say probably. I mean, and I'm so glad that you brought up the difference between, you know, gross and net. I mean, that's that's such an important concept for people to understand. I mean, if you have a million dollar practice, that's wonderful. But guess what? If you spend a million and one dollars, you're in the red. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Gretchen Bailey from um, Optometry Times and I had a conversation with uh, John Rampakis, and we got into a, a little bit with um, vision care plans and with profit margins and with how the eye exam is going to look going forward. And I basically 
ended the conversation by saying, John, the reason I never hired you to come to my practice is because you would fire my whole staff and then you'd fire me and there would be no one left there. Um, (laughs) It would just be an empty building, you'd say, beyond reproach. But um, what is the eye exam going to look like? You know, some of that's up to optometry. Some of that's up to other forces, but I, I think that there's just no way that we're going to go back to the mindset that we had in, say, January, February of 2020. I mean, this is going to have a lasting effect. It's going to have lasting scars, but there's some good that's going to come out of this, too. So I appreciate right. your point, and I definitely take it well. Yeah. Have you been doing any yeah. telemedicine, Ben? Uh, what's that? Have you been doing any telemedicine? Yeah, I've had like friends other people like, are pivoting. Like, um, yeah, I've, I've, um, I have, uh, I haven't really quite figured out the exactly how to bill for such, um, but I've definitely been doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of small potatoes. If you call my office on the weekends, you're routed to a number, and then my left pocket starts to vibrate, and so I, <laughs> I've, I've. FaceTime and look at eyelids and eyeballs on the weekends anyway. So I guess I, 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 I haven't really seen a huge uptick in that. Um, during the whole being shut down from mid-March to mid-June, um, maybe two or three a week. But uh, no, I haven't really had to incorporate that in, in any in any grand scale form, thankfully. But it has been back to your original thing, is about spending more time with patients, um, I always felt that when I was down to my last patient of the day, I was the most relaxed, I had the most fun, because there's nothing afterwards. It was open-ended. You didn't have to worry about somebody in the waiting room or somebody, whatever. Um, do you agree with that? And then when I, I came out, my staff says, we have three three emergencies coming in. <laughs> but it definitely exactly. is true. Psychological. But you know, you don't talk about you're done. Oh no! Oh, you have a foreign body and a person coming with narrow glaucoma attack. So, <clears throat> so keep the lights on. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I would agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, a day in the life of a private optometry practice or any optometry practice, I should say. I just, I just speak for myself. Is it? It's, it's a roller coaster. But you get over that last hump and you start to slow down and you realize the seatbelt's about to come off and. It's definitely, I, I would agree with you 100%. I feel like my mm-hmm. days are longer now. I'm not sure why, but I feel like like, like at, at like 5 o'clock, I look back and I think, gosh, that patient I saw at 9 o'clock, that feels like it was three days ago. I'm not sure what COVID has done to my mindset, but the days just seem a little yeah. bit longer now. I think you're breathing in a lot more carbon dioxide that you're breathing <laughs> out from the mask, and that slows your brain yeah. function. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty patience, sure that <laughs> yeah, speak, speak when I patience, exhale is uh-huh. – Go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish finish your thought, and then I'm going to ask you something. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, when I exhale, I'm pretty sure God intended that to go out into the ether and not onto the back of a mask, <laughs> and I'm looking forward <laughs> to that being over. <laughs> you, you had a very interesting lecture, yet, course, yesterday on opioids and drugs. Uh, yes. Can you tell us what you – when do you prescribe it in your practice, and what what changes? What, what happens when you do prescribe this? I honestly cannot think of the last time that I prescribed an opioid. I think it's been a couple of years ago. Um, I hardly ever prescribe them. Um, that is not judgment on their nature. I understand that they have their uh, – they certainly have their place. Um, but when I do, like – I. I like a really bad corneal insult is really the only times that I think that I've ever prescribed one. Um, and, uh, I've, 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 um, written for, um, uh, Vicodin because I, I, I personally think that hydrocodone is better at treating pain than codeine. And I feel like hydrocodone makes, makes people feel less, uh, queasy than does codeine. But I write for like maybe, maybe two or three pills total. In Georgia, we're not allowed to treat um, for more than, I, I think, it's either 48 or 72 hours um, a uh, opioid. And um, I really can't think of a case in which, in which I would be solely handling um, a uh, 
scenario in which I would need to do that for more. Um, but I hardly ever do it. Uh, I, I, I do think that it's use, um, that, uh, opioid prescribing seems to be decreasing, um, across the country. Uh, I talked to a, uh, pediatric critical care doctor actually last night and he said, yeah, I prescribe fentanyl like all the time, but I'm a big outlier. So I, I, I think if you're not in a critical care setting, uh, it, its use seems to be decreasing, and that's probably not a bad thing. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're seeing is that it's just used in acute situations now. At least that's my observation, right? If you go out more than 72 yep. hours, you have to have a really good reason for why you're doing this. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and there are a lot of checks and balances. And the CDC really has really good guidelines about, about how opioids should not be first line therapy. Um, and, and there's actually for, for chronic pain, there's all sorts of, um, resources with like behavioral therapy. Um, 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 the CDC website talks about yoga. It, it's, it's, there's a push to get people not dependent on opioids and for a very obvious and very noble reason. Right. I mean, they're, use, they're useful post-surgically a lot of the time, right? This is something that most people oh, yeah. can get behind for, you know, a few days. But beyond that, you really have to start to question. Like, I remember when I got my dental implant a couple of years ago, I couldn't believe the dentist just handed me this bottle of Vicodin. I'm like, wow. <laughs> okay, then. So, oh, so your practice yeah. patterns are obviously, you know, you've been doing this for 30 years or whatever. This is what you've always done. But this is not really what people should be doing, you know. I didn't want to insult the my guy, mom. But... <laughs> um, my mom had um, had a uh, uh, pretty invasive um, um, back surgery. She was prescribed like a hundred Percocet, <sighs> and she didn't take one of them. Yeah, and she's like, "I've got this. I've got access to a hundred Percocet. Like, like, what am I supposed to do here now? Now, when she was post op in the hospital, she was hitting that button as frequently as." she could to get some uh to get some uh, pain relief but then when she got home it was pretty much i mean it was pretty much she um she uh was a good patient she did everything the doctor told her to do and she really i'm i i know it's not cookie cutter but i i think it was interesting that she was given 100 percocet and didn't take one of them yeah i mean well you know <laughs> true confession i i just opened up a a drawer in my in, in my bathroom where I keep old pills. I don't know, I don't throw anything out. And I must have a, a stash of, of pain pills, because I say, well, you never know when I'm gonna need it, but it keeps piling up. So I don't know what, what to do with me. If we ever have a robbery, I think well, the, the thief is gonna be so happy with, with the, the we're stash. On... <laughs> but if, if you come back to Northeast, Paul, if you come back to the Northeast, if you ever fall on economic hard times, you can go up to certain areas and, and make a big profit <laughs> and then go to jail. But, that's <laughs> right. It, like that's you said, right. Adam, I, I, I just had an implant done also about uh, three months ago. My best friend in my life did it. And normally he'd give me a prescription for um, Vicodin also or some of the hydrocodone. And he said, no, I'm not doing it. He said, take the, what we do, the, the ibuprofen, Tylenol cocktail. And you know what? No pain. So it, it shows that the easy way sometimes is not the best. Yep. You, you know, if you take 1,600 milligrams of um, ibuprofen in a day, that would be two of the 200 milligrams Q four to six oh. hours. You, you, that, that approaches the analgesia of a Schedule three narcotic. So it's not like, like Advil works like kind of down here and then opioids are way up here. That's, that's, that's. I tell you, and when um, when uh, Laura, my wife, when we had our first kid, she was prescribed uh, 800 milligram ibuprofen post uh, um, partum, and uh, I tell you, you pop one of those things, you're never going to have a headache again. <laughs> right. Huh? You know, I wonder. Yeah. I... You know, when I <laughs> when Adam was born, uh, you know, in those days, you didn't go into to watch the the birth, you know. <laughs> You know, yeah, 50 you years ago. Smoking a cigar. Huh? So I, you know, I, I really didn't want to go in, but my wife was suffering to give birth. And I said, look, I'm going to use hypnosis on you. <laughs> Those are the days I was still using hypnosis. Well, she threw me out of that, ex that room <laughs> so and, rapidly. And rightly so. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, That's outstanding. Oh my god! <laughs> Outside with your uh, fedora and your cigar and your scotch, <laughs> so, I love it. So, <laughs> so Ben, let, let's how about some clinical advice here? So I, it's been a long time since I studied the science, but tolerance to these opioids can develop pretty rapidly, right? Like within a couple of days. Yeah. So for if you were going to get yes. a piece of advice, I mean, I know that. I would be nervous to have somebody taking these things for more than three days, right? Just because of the tolerance, it will happen biologically. This is something that's going to happen, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's um. um and as you know, it, Ben, it, thank you. I was I was going to thank you for doing the lecture because many states are requiring this information for the ODs. Oh yes, sir. Anytime. It, um, it, it's 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 crazy that three fourths of all heroin users started by using a legal opioid, one that can be legally attained before they went to heroin. And it's, 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 it's 75%. That's a, that's a startling statistic. And you've got to think that a good number of those people were probably prescribed one legally and for a legitimate reason. Um, I, think, I think that the bulk of your work should be done before you write the prescription. I think you just have to really just do a good job of screening who you're going to give it to. You know, you got to really, I guess if you're going to prescribe a bunch of opioids or if you're in a profession where they're just needed, um, you just got to really be able to sniff out who's going to have a negative outcome. And that can be really difficult. And those can be conversations that are just frankly uncomfortable to have, you know, have you ever had a drinking problem? Have you ever, do you take any illicit drugs now? You know, you can tell me it's okay. And that can, that can be difficult, you know? So, but my advice would be, um, um, screen very, very thoroughly before you write a prescription for one. Yep. And by the way, this can, you know, you can, you can have stereotypes about who these people are that are completely wrong. Um, when I worked in an uh, addiction clinic, you know, many years ago in, in Michigan, you would be shocked by the people who came through. Um, they looked, you know, like a, oh, like sure. a cross section of, of, of everybody, you know, there wasn't like a certain yeah. look or a certain type. And I think if more people realize that they'd be much more careful when they start prescribing these things. I agree with you a hundred percent. It's, it's human nature to say, well, these people don't look like me. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They yep. look just like you and me and all the people listening right now. Yep. And, you know, one of these people at the clinics was one of the residents that I worked with, right, who had the secret addiction that no one knew about. But, of course, you work in the clinic, you get to see them on the other side, and it's like, oh, yeah, this can literally sure. happen to anybody. It, it affects all walks of life. It, 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 it's, it's incredible. But we're getting better, uh, but there's still, uh, still a long road ahead. Yep. All right, Ben. Well, thanks for taking the time to you know do the lectures and uh, and for talking with us today. I know you had another one on uh, glaucoma, which apparently is going to be made obsolete by this new epigenetic stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's giving. As a matter of fact, Ben Ben has to walk over to his to to his course. It starts at one o'clock. Behind glaucoma. That's right. I better, I better go. Yeah, that's that's right. I better go put walk. my tie on. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. There may We've be cleared all the light traffic. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not it's not like it's not like Seco, right? Not like Seco in New Orleans, where you had to walk three miles to get to your class. So it's a little easier, at least. Uh, Academy in uh, Chicago, that place <laughs> yeah. is like a planet. I felt like I was in the Truman Show, you know. <laughs> that that was a bad show, but we can go into that another time. But yeah, um, so, uh, absolutely. Oh my gosh! So Ben, thank you for being here, and uh, and hopefully we'll we'll pick it up again at CUR 2021 whenever that happens. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, thank you, guys. I cannot wait to see y'all in person. In the meantime, stay safe. Happy holidays. Wear a mask. All, All right. right. <laughs> Good advice. Same to you. Thanks, Ben. Okay. See you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye, Ben. Yeah. Always great having these conversations. And, and, <laughs> yeah. He writes so many articles for Optometry Times and maybe others. So many. He's so prolific. And he asked me about epigenetics. How does he become essentially a jack of all trades and a master of all. Uh, he knows every year in optometry that he could possibly know from pathology, the contact lenses. I asked him to do a lecture on narcotics and became, uh, he was an a expert on it already, truly an amazing guy. And, and, and um, I believe he was just voted optometrist of the year at the last economy meeting or um, something like that. Yeah, yeah, last Young year. Yeah, be before, before the planet started circling the drain, he, he accepted his award. So that yep. was, yeah, last fall. Yep. Uh, okay, so we have Richard Whitlett coming at, at uh, 15 past the hour at 1.15. Yep.
But now we have a chance to take a break. Do you have really? anything planned on? We have like a 10 minute break. Yeah. Well, in, in the 10 minutes, I could show the, the, the two minute cases again, which we got to a little bit for, from yesterday, which is kind of cool. Well, if, if, okay, we have, you say 10 minutes? Well, let's see, when's, we have, oh, uh, Whitland's coming at, at, uh, at one, oh, we have well, more than that. Oh, so we have a, a fair Yeah, absolutely. Time. Oh, okay. We have, at 1.15. He's yeah. lecturing till one o'clock now. He's lecturing at this time. Yeah, so we have some time then. So we can, uh, maybe what I'll do is, which, uh, we have so many things that we could show people, so many sort of best ofs. You know, I could actually show uh, the Dr. Thomas heat lecture again and start it again so people can get a sense of it because this is one that people can watch on demand if they're really interested in it. So all about MGD and heat. So why don't I start that one and then we'll cut it off uh, about 35 minutes from now. And uh, if people want to finish it out, they can come to see you and see the rest. How does that sound? Okay, so Sounds that's like it. a plan. All right, so we'll see everybody in about okay, uh, 35 so minutes. See you in 35 Bye -bye. minutes. Title of the course, it's getting hot in here, using heat to treat the eyelid. Uh, Cam asked me before we started, say, Dr. Thomas, are you playing Nelly's song, it's getting hot in here like you did a couple of weeks ago? I said, I'm going to save that for the live version. So so when, when I see everybody live, I, I'm telling you, I'm going to throw down, I'm going to put on my, my fuchsia suit like I had at the... Uh, at the all docs meeting and we're going to throw down and have some good fun. <clears throat> so for now, we'll have some good information. And as, as uh, Lisa said, I'm uh, going to concentrate on, on my bony and gland dysfunction, ocular surface disease. Uh, you know, everybody's heard me talk before and, and, you know, I talk about mostly medical stuff, you know, glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy and cataracts and all vitreomacular macular traction syndrome and all of that stuff. I, yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, but I, I like this a lot. And, 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 you know, everybody doesn't have a real sick old practice like I do. And so I was trying to think, you know, what, <clears throat> what can we talk about that practically everybody can engage in and practically everybody can participate in? And you don't have to have a bunch of old sick people to, to, to really engage. And I'm like, well, of course, the, the obvious answer is ocular surface disease. Uh, if you're seeing patients and you're an optometrist, uh, you have patients that have ocular surface disease. It doesn't matter the age, the race, the income. So it's, it's kind of the low hanging fruit. Uh, you guys have, have seen me put up the slide before when we talk, you know, why did the bank robber rob the bank? Because that's where the money is. OK, <laughs> let's talk about where the money is. Uh, it's the low hanging fruit, some ocular surface disease. So financial disclosure, I'm a paid consultant for Conan Medical. It will not affect the content of this presentation. Sorry for the delay there. So. We see, let me get rid of this box here. We see the first slide. We're going to, you know, we'll spend a few minutes on some scientific refresher so we can all be on the same page moving forward. So we'll spend 5, 10, 15 minutes just doing some basic uh, review on our, our anatomy and physiology, just going back to optometry school. <clears throat> so here we see we have a, a diagram of a meibomian gland. Uh, you guys know I'm not going to read slides to you. Everybody can read the slide while I'm talking. Uh, you can see the gland. Uh, you know, you could, I, I kind of talk with the mouse, so just follow, follow the cursor along. Uh, you know, as we see, I mean, some stuff's important enough to read. The, the glands, uh, these little, little acini here, these little nodules, they secrete oil or mybum. Uh, mybum is, is what we call the oil that comes out of the gland. It's, it's made up of lipids and proteins. And so it, it's made in these little bulbs, comes up this central duct, and comes out this, this orifice to lubricate the, the uh, anterior surface of the eye, the eyelids, the, the ocular surface. So just a, a, you know, kind of the anatomy of the mybomian gland. <clears throat> Remember, there's on the bottom lid, you've got about 25 glands going from one end to the other. On the top eyelid, you've got about 35 or 40 glands, a little bit longer, a little bit slimmer. Uh, this is essentially what normal glands look like, kind of a, a grape-like cluster. Uh, before we get too deep into this, I, I've got to tell everybody, and, and you know, Dr. Hamilton will, will second that emotion, and, and, and other doctors will chime in based on, on the meeting that we went to a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow optometrists, it's going to be a real hard to do the stuff I'm talking about for the next hour, hour and a half. If you cannot obtain my biography images like you're looking at here and actually see what's going on inside the person's eyelid, you simply have to have some kind of my biography technology 
to really get into this and for to, to, to demonstrate it to the patient, to get the patient to buy in, to get the patient to understand what we're talking about. I just, I mean, I've been practicing 37 years, just like Lisa said, you know, I've been doing my biography for two years, two and a half. You know, it's almost like having an OCT, you know, how do you practice without it? It's like having a topographer, how do you practice without it? So your first step, if you're going to really uh, kick it up a notch and, and try to <clears throat> figure out how to be a, a more modern optometrist in 2020 and going forward into 2021 and, and you know, and, and kind of deal with the stuff we got to deal with now, you know, with the pandemic going on, and it's going to be going on for a minute, so we, so we got to adjust. You, you simply have to have the ability to look at the glands like this. So you've got to get a mybogger for some kind of way and, and look at the glands like this. So let's assume you know, that in a reasonably short period of time, sometime in the next three to six months, everybody that's really interested in doing this stuff is going to obtain my biography. So you're going to be able to look at the my biography, the, the glands, the meibomian glands. So let's talk for just a second on what's called meibom lipidomics. And, and, and I got to tell you, you know, I've, I've been lecturing on this topic. You know, you guys snap, you know, my, my, you know y'all are my, my brothers from another mother, uh, like the All Docs group. So, I mean, I, I gave this lecture for the very first time to you guys three years ago, if you remember. Uh, so, you know, I, when I started talking about my bone gland dysfunction, my very, very first lecture was to the SNAP group three years ago. And there's three or four pictures in this presentation from that original uh, uh, course, uh, but most of it is, is almost all of it's totally new and different, uh, like this stuff here, because uh, I didn't have I didn't have a clue what my lipidomics was <laughs> three years ago. But as I kept giving the lecture and, and kept adding to it. You know, the, the, the more I learned, the more I needed to learn. And I started learning about Mibum and I'm like, man, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be an expert. I'm lecturing on Mibum. And so I started reading all these articles on Mibum anatomy and how you make it and synthesize it and what it's all the stuff. And, and, and really the study of it is Mibum lipidomics. So you see the little parentheses, the study of the pathways and networks of cellular lipids and biological systems. Man, I was feeling real smart. So I read, I found two or three articles on this stuff. And, and you see there, uh, and, and it's basically, it's, it's, you know, in a, in a simple way, it's really just talking about what we learned in, what I learned in optometry school 35 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, you know, that, that my bum, is temperature dependent. And if you heat it up, it does different stuff. And, you know, just to understand it, you know, I actually, you know, read some articles that talked about it. And, and it's really kind of weird because you go back and, and you're having these nightmares about biochemistry and, and where this carbon uh, atom is, is located on the molecule and, you know, the, the way they're arranged and all that. I mean, that's what all these articles were talking about, all this biochemistry stuff. So this first slide is talking about all that biochemistry stuff. And I just put it up there because uh, I thought it was important to go to the second slide. And so the second slide uh, is, is really the, the important stuff where we talk about different temperatures. And here, you know, these little bullets, this stuff's important, where the first thing, uh, the mybum is not a solid uh, at, at low temperature. So it never really gets solid, but it's, it's kind of a gel. Uh, and it's never really a liquid when it gets hot. Uh, it just gets less ordered. So it's, it's disordered. And so it never really melts. So we shouldn't use melting uh, as the as a you know a, a correct term. Uh, what, you know what you're doing is you're changing the mybum fluidity by changing its temperature, and 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 the temperature is making the molecules and all of that stuff rotate around and do different stuff, uh, and that's what changes its its structure and its physical characteristics. And and this, this these last couple of bullets, this is real important. Because uh, what you're seeing here is that the front, that, that fourth bullet where it's talking about the temperature range, and so to to change the mybum inside the gland, you've got to heat it up. But it's a pretty wide range. I mean, 32 degrees centigrade, that's almost like, you know, somebody that's laying on a slab. Uh, you know, 45 degrees is pretty hot. I mean, it's real hot uh, to where it'd be uncomfortable for almost everybody. And so what you see in that next bullet, 40 degrees centigrade required for maximum lipid disorder. Those are the numbers that are used in reference articles talking about lippy flow, for example, where you're heating the, the mybum up to a certain high temperature, where you've got to get it hot enough to do something, where you've got to melt it 
you know, so to speak. So 40 degrees is apparently the, the standard, and apparently, I mean, I read a bunch of articles, 40 degrees is the standard, kind of the average, where if you get the mybum heated up to 40 degrees, then you're considered to be doing something to it, where it's getting hot enough to where you're changing the structure, and you can express it out or do something to it. Uh, or change it. Uh, for patients we see with severe disease, uh, you're actually recommended to get up to 41.5. But I saw articles that say once you get about 42, 42.5, it's so hot, the person's just going to start burning them. I mean, that's pretty hot. I mean, that's like 108, 109 degrees, something like that. Uh, so, you know, I don't think you need to get it that hot. And the last bullet, proves that you don't need to get it that hot. And so this last bullet, and, and, and I, don't like, I don't like when guys claim superiority when it's just not there. And I got to tell you, even though I got me a lippy flow, I don't like people claiming superiority where they're saying you have to heat the mybum to 41.5 degrees centigrade to get the job done. No, you don't. You just got to heat it. And if you heat it up 2.5 degrees centigrade or higher, you change the, the, the structure of the mybum by 66%. And that's usually enough to start squeezing it out of the glands and doing stuff to it. So, you know, you don't have to get it smoking hot to do anything, but you got to get it hotter than it was. So if you started out at, at 32 degrees centigrade as, you know, before you started heating it up, if you got it up to 35, okay, you can still squeeze it out and do something, you know, 66% of the time. So you don't have to get it blazing hot with some fancy $28,000 lipid flow to get the job done. As long as you're heating it up and squeezing it out, it's better than doing nothing. That's what these, that's what I got from reading these articles on Mybum Lipidomics is it kind of debunked the, the lippy flow marketing claim that you got to get it smoking hot to do anything. Uh, and, and you just got to get it hot. So I think that was an, so that's an important thing to, to know as we go forward. You just got to get it hot. Okay. And let's talk about my Bohmian gland dysfunction. So what we talked about at the start, we, we, we showed a my Bohmian gland, just a regular old gland, kind of normal anatomy and physiology, what the gland does. Uh, we looked at them in real life, like we ought to be looking at them. You know, I got to tell you, I, I, I got, you know, I, I, you know I can be politically cor incorrect. You guys know that. I was at a lecture two years ago. And I went to it because the guy was talking about my bone and gland dysfunction. And I wanted to compare what this guy was saying with what I was saying and see if I needed to add something, you know, to see if I needed to steal something, to be honest with you, to see if I need to take something from his presentation and put it in mine. And so I'm sitting there on the front row. I got my notepad out. I'm ready to get do some serious learning. And this guy starts the lecture. And, and you know, within 10 minutes, he said, okay, now the way you, you're going to view the my bone and glands is you pull out your transilluminator and you transilluminate the lower lid and then you can see kind of what's happening. And I'm like, are you crazy? I'm like, are you serious? You know, pull out a transilluminator. Okay, is that what? You know, I said, come on, man. Uh, I almost got up and left. I was, it was pitiful. So anyway, so we talked about my regular mybomian gland anatomy and physiology. We talked about how to examine uh, and visualize the mybomian gland so you can actually see what's going on. And I'll show you what you're looking at as we go. But you got to, you got to be able to look at them. So now. You know, we're not really talking about taking care of healthy people. That's not what we're talking about. We're taking care of people that have mybomian gland dysfunction, that have some kind of disease process going on in the mybomian glands. And in a technical sense, all these articles I've read, you know, they talk about mybomian gland disease as really a more severe thing, kind of, a, you know, stuff like Steven Johnson syndrome, all that little wild stuff people getting when they're kids. My bombing gland dysfunction is what we usually deal with, uh, which is which is really different than my bombing gland disease. You see the the standard textbook. I got to put it in there to be honest definition of my bone and gland dysfunction. I mean, I agree with it. It's accurate. It's kind of old now. Uh, you know, it's coming from the, the uh, international workshop on my bone and gland dysfunction back in 2011. I mean, you know, you talk about the science has changed so much since then, as far as us understanding the, the, the uh, pathophysiology of this disease and the natural history. So, I mean, I, I, I still reference the article, but every time I see somebody, you know, pulling out stuff that we've already debunked out of this thing from, you know, 19 years ago, it kind of upsets me. But the definition is still accurate. Uh, and the, the, the prominent clinical features that you see there, those two bullets, where it's talking about obstruction of the gland orifices and the ducts. Okay, that's, that is the main problem. Uh, we can argue and not argue, we can debate and, and toss out theories about why that is happening. 
because we don't really have the set answer. I thought we did uh, three years ago when I talked to, to you guys the first time, but I'm actually retracting all that stuff and changing my views now. So you see uh, the, the official definition of my Bohmian gland dysfunction. So just put that in the memory banks. Let's keep going. So, you know, again, why are we talking about it? Well, number one, because at least for me, you know, if I see 35 patients a day, 15 of them have it. Uh, you know, 15 is low. I mean, 20 if I, if I actually start asking questions. So, so the first thing is that's a real common problem. So, again, we're all going to see it. So it's something we can all get into. So I think that's that's the first thing, you know, and, and since it happens to so many people, uh, you know, I, without sounding hokey, I mean, I do want to help people. Uh, I mean, I don't mind getting paid for it, but I do want to help people and people need help with this. I mean, I hear it all day. You know, my eyes are bothering me. Uh, so you see, again, just kind of some pictures and some bullets. And you see at the bottom that that, that where it says the exact etiology of my bone and gland dysfunction is unknown and maybe due to a variety of conditions. Well, three years ago and, and two years ago, I was a big proponent of, of what we were calling and what you can still call dry eye blepharitis syndrome, uh, which was the, 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 the uh, theory that was, was put forth by Dr. Reinerson uh, and his associate of biofilm on the eyelid margin being the primary source of inflammatory eyelid disease and or meibomian gland dysfunction, however you want to label it. And, and what Dr. Reinerson said, and what I believed strongly back then is that a biofilm that was forming on the margin of the lid right here was responsible for secreting these virulence factors and, and, and just doing all kind of crazy stuff to the eyelid where that was what was messing up the meibomian glands and, and the bacteria and the virulence factors, the exotoxins from the bacteria were getting down in the glands and messing them up and doing all kinds of stuff. And that is true. It, I just don't think it's the primary and or dominant reason anymore based on additional uh, uh, research and, and information that's come to light the past couple of years. And I do read up on this stuff pretty regular because I still lect I, I give this lecture several times a year. So I'm always updating it and, and, and keeping keeping the uh, uh, stuff fresh. And so you see now that the I think a more accurate uh, and comprehensive understanding of the development of meibomian gland dysfunction is that it's from one of these things, the, the, the bacterial infection component, which I still think is a really big one. Okay, it's a big one, uh, but, but it's not the only one. Uh, it doesn't explain all the stuff I've been seeing for the past three years since I've been doing mybography and, and serious eyelid procedures. It's, it doesn't explain it all. Uh, the, what, the, what explains it all is, is that, yeah, some of it's from hormonal imbalance and, and some of it's from autoimmune disease and, and, and some of it's just from inflammation out of nowhere, you know, raging inflammation out of nowhere. And some of it's from external mechanical factors, uh, especially contact lens wear, people mashing on their eyelids. Uh, you can see it pretty easy on, on some images where they're tearing up their glands just with mechanical pressure. And here lately, I am out of control with these girls getting these, these fake eyelashes, these butterfly lashes that look like wings and they, they got you know three ounces of super glue on them holding them on and I'm, I'm telling you we're doing one or two of these infections a week uh you know peeling these things off and doing all kind of stuff you know because they come in with with uh, severe uh, eyelid infections from all the glue and the mechanical nonsense of the eyelashes uh so it's, it's kind of funny but in a way but but i've been we've been seeing that pretty regular here in the hood uh so so bacterial infection hormonal imbalance autoimmune disease, inflammation, external mechanical factors. Those are the things that cause my bone and gland dysfunction, in my opinion, in 2020. Uh, so just again, just a, still kind of on refresher review. This is stuff we've all seen. I'm not, I'm not showing anybody stuff you haven't seen. I know that. Uh, we're just getting up on the same page. We're just getting ready to jump off, off together. So, so just another picture of it. You know, you've got, you've got the, the, the clogged ducts. You, you see the, the, the telangiectasia, the, the blood vessels are, are engorged. They look angry. It's an angry lid. He's angry. He ain't, he's not happy. Okay. Inflammation. Uh, so you see all the stuff there, all the bullets I've got listed. Uh, you know, I've been looking at this stuff for years, just like everybody else, but I look at it different now. You, when, when you get an OCT, 
You look at the optic nerve with an ophthalmoscope differently. Uh, when you get a topographer, you look at the retinoscopy reflex differently now. Do I do I, you know I need to go get that topography map and get more information? You know, I'm I'm looking here. I can I can see there's an orifice there. I can see the gland right there. Okay, well that's rinky dink transillumination. Okay, that's I can see all that. Uh, this one looks clogged. That one looks clogged. I mean they look clogged. And and I want to spend just one minute talking about non well actually i'm not my bad i want to talk about fixed obstruction so the the big deal here is, is you've got two you know we, we talked earlier uh, i talked uh, earlier about you know what is what characterizes my bomian gland dysfunction okay the big thing you know 90 percent of it is that the duct going up the middle of the gland gets clogged up the mybum gets thickened it, it gets solid and the thing gets stopped up and once it gets stopped up you know all kind of crazy stuff starts to happen and it's all bad to the gland so it, there's two kinds of ways it gets stopped up. It can get stopped up with what's called a non-fixed obstruction, which is the kind that we want. The, the non-fixed obstruction is one where the mybum is just too thick. It's just done, got cheesy up and, and, and got too thick in there. And, and you know, you got to just heat it up and get it out some kind of way. That, that's what you're hoping is happening. But that's not what is always happening. What is happening sometimes, what's happening quite a few times, honestly, is this second thing where you get these fixed obstructions. So you got non-fixed, you got fixed. And the fixed obstruction is called periductal fibrosis. And these things are a bear. And, and what the periductal fibrosis is, is when the whole, you got to imagine what's happening, you know, the, 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 the mechanism of action. So the whole eyelid is inflamed. It's not just the margin. It's not just the follicles. It's not just the mybomic gland. The whole structure is inflamed. The whole thing, you know, all the connective tissue, all the collar, it's all inflamed, the whole thing, you know, the whole lid. So, you know, the, the gland, we, we look at the glands like they're sitting there in isolation, like sitting in styrofoam, you know, surrounded by protection. Well, no, they're just sitting there with, surrounded by a bunch of tissue and the tissues getting inflamed right along with the gland. And what happens with the, when the, the extra glandular tissue gets inflamed, it forms these, these strictures, these fibrous bands that form around the gland and as the the strictures these these Fer these periductal fibrosis bands, as they mature like a scar, then they kind of constrict and, and shrink down and they squeeze the gland, then kind of close it shut, like you see right here and, and you see right there. So that's an example that, you know, an artist's rendition of periductal fibrosis, where the thing is being squeezed to death by this inflammatory scar tissue that's forming, circling and circling the myboma gland so that that that's that's a big deal there you don't want that because you can't fix that uh now, now you can't heat that up you can't squeeze it out so so when you squeeze you express a gland and nothing's happening and 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 nothing's coming out and the thing is open it's not capped up this might be the explanation and you might be having some fixed glandular obstructions going on either right up here at the beginning where the orifice is or you know somewhere down the line because see here if the if the uh, the periductal fibrosis is right at the orifice when you squeeze this gland nothing's going to come out and everything's going to go on the back and mess the gland up it's going to kind of explode going backwards all this introductal pressure going back if the if the constriction is here when you squeeze this gland there'll still be mybum coming out but the back half of the gland is going to go crazy because because the the mybocytes all the ace and I, they're still secreting oil so the oil's still coming out you see these arrows the oil's still coming out but it can't go anywhere and so the the back of the gland almost blows up like a balloon like you're blowing up a balloon full of air and it's going to bust open and it just tears the gland up and and that's how you'll see it shortly that's what explains these mybography images that we see is is these these fixed glandular obstructions and and you got to go big time if you want to deal with this i mean this ain't for the meat 
week. I got to tell you, I mean, uh, I'm pulling out the big guns when I'm working on these people. So, I mean, I do this when I have to. I don't do it because I want to. It's a pain. I don't like it. The patients don't like it. It's high drama. I ain't recommending it. But, you know, if I got somebody in the chair and, you know, and I got to fix them, then I got to fix them. So sometimes you got to go in there and pop that thing open and you use these little masking probes. So you got to numb up the lid. I numb it up with lidocaine, prepare it. This, I, a bunch of cream I rub on it, put a contact lens on it so I don't mess up the cornea. And then I stab them with this probe to open the gland up. Okay, we, we're not going to talk about that no more. So just if you wanted to, you know, every once in a while, you got to go serious, but that's not what this lecture is about. So, you know, just to, to say, just to say you've heard it. So you know the difference between non-fixed obstructions and fixed obstructions, okay? We're going to spend the rest of the lecture talking about non-fixed obstructions because that's what most of them are for most people. All right, so let's get into now some mybomian gland atrophy because what we were talking about was my mybomian gland dysfunction. So you got my mybomian gland dysfunction is caused by one of three or four or five things, you know, the bacterial infection, hormones going crazy, uh, autoimmune disease, okay, you pick, pick your poison. So, so the, the glands are getting messed up. Well, they're going to stay messed up. It's an inflammatory disease. It's a chronic disease. It, it occurs when people are young. It occurs when they're old. It's there for a long time. And if it goes untreated for years and years and years, it will lead to what we call mybomian gland atrophy. So this is the 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 more advanced presentation of the disease. So it's a continuum. You know, my mybomian gland atrophy is just the end stage of my mybomian gland dysfunction. But I want you to see it's really two different clinical presentations on the mybography images because you can have a normal looking mybography image like that second slide I showed where all the glands look fat and happy, but they could be stomped up and not working. You can squeeze them, nothing coming out. And so you got all kind of mybomian gland dysfunction going on, even though the glands look normal. When you have mybomian gland atrophy, the glands don't look normal at all. And so remember the mechanism of action. It's really important to be able to understand it, be able to explain it to the patients. You're going to see patients once you get your mybography capability, and, and you'll, they'll say, well, what's this? What's that? I mean, and you're just going to wow them. I mean, I, I've given uh, uh, presentations to the staff because the staff is taking these images. They don't know what they're looking at. And I'll spend 30 minutes with the staff at an office and show them and explain to them what they're looking at. And it's just, it's, it's just so much different when, when everybody knows what's happening. So here's, here's what we're looking at, everybody. So remember, you know, that we're, the obstruction of the glands leads to stasis of the mybum. So, so let's say, you know, I'll use a gland here as an example. So you see this, this big gland right here. So this gland, there's the orifice. You know, the, the gland next to it looks pretty normal. The gland next to the here is gone, and there's nothing but a little fragment there. The gland next there is is this one that here is breaking up. This one's gone. You got little little discontinuous segments. This one is these are fading away. It's not that the image is blurry. This is this is actually a phenomenon: fading or poorly defined glands. It's like a, a, a intermediate stage of gland death. So what happens? Here's your your step by step. So the first thing is the gland gets stomped up. So right here, this gland got stomped up. This part of the gland is still working. It's still making oil. This part of the, all the it was still working. All these little bulbs right here, they're, they were still trying to synthesize oil. The oil can't get out. Okay, so the oil, is, it basically got nowhere to go. So it starts to expand the gland and you can see the gland is separating and what, it's, a, it's a term we call unzipping. So this gland right here is now unzipping because it got stopped up right here at the orifice. It kept secreting oil. The oil couldn't get out of the gland. It causes increased intraductal pressure so now the gland starts to, to, to separate laterally. You see that? So think of me blowing up a balloon. I'm blowing up a balloon, filling it with air. And when, if I put too much air in that thing, it's going to pop. Okay, now your gland's not going to pop. But if you put too much pressure in it, it's going to start to separate. You get this dilation of the central duct. Then the little bulbs, the little acini, they start to die. So they, 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 they don't like that. 
there's like too much pressure. It's like, man, why are you doing that? It's too much pressure. You know, you know, I don't like that. Okay, I'm gonna just shut down. I'm gonna shut it down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut this thing down and stop working. So then they stop synthesizing oil. But now it's too late. The thing's already is it's already messed up. So then what will happen is that where it, right here, see it, it's separating. Eventually, I'm sorry, my bad. Eventually, it's gonna break off. And if you go up to the top, you'll see here these segments, these, these segments, segments of discontinuous gland tissue. So look at these horizontal pieces. Okay, it ain't no horizontal meibomian glands. That thing's supposed to be vertically oriented. So this little piece here broke off. It snapped off like a piece of a lizard's tail. So what happens is that this gland got stopped up right here in the middle, and then it... <laughs> stayed clogged up for who knows how long and then eventually the thing just broke off and, and you see these little pieces roaming around so that's what so that's what's happening so you understand what you're looking at so these are, are different stages of my bomian gland atrophy okay and, and, and this can happen in anybody uh, i mean I, I i've seen this nonsense in 15 year old people wearing contact lenses here's a 30 year old contact lens wearer that, and, and you know this person coming in and say hey doc my, my contacts are a little dry can I get some new contacts? I'm like, sure. Let me do some mybography on you before I just start wasting your time and money. And let's see what we're dealing with. And as soon as I get the mybography image, I'm like, oh, okay. Well, we're not dealing with a whole lot here. It looks like like you got one gland that's halfway crazy. These little pieces are fading. And you see here where it looks like it's gray? Okay, there's no glands there. Okay, they're gone. This is my Bomian gland atrophy. There's no glands. They're gone. There's like three and a half of them left. It's pitiful. Okay, this was the other eye. Okay, they're just, they're going crazy. Okay, this person's 30 years old. I'm telling you, I've been practicing 37 years old. When this person's 57, they're going to have cornflakes in their eyes. Okay, they're going to be miserable. <laughs> they're going to be, mis they'll be miserable. Okay, and I'm going to try to fix it because uh, I found it when they're 30 instead of 60. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is poor prognosis here. I could have been working on this guy 10 years ago. Okay, easy. This has been, it took a while for this to happen. So you see these other risk factors. Uh, the, 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 the smoking. Smoking is 10% increased risk of, of my bony gland dysfunction, cigarette smokers. Uh, the, all the drops, the drops, all these chemicals that seems to diffuse down in there and mess stuff up. If you got real bad allergies, GPC, uh, vernal conjunctivitis, man, it raises it way up. Uh, contact lens wear to me is the number two thing behind the bacteria because the contact lens where you get the mechanical stuff where you're mashing on your eyelids all the time and you get this bacterial biofilm that forms on the contact lens to increase the risk of the infection. So, you know, this stuff happens all the time. So then you say, well, so, so what, so what? <laughs> okay. Well, the big deal. And this is where we've done had everything upside down for the past five, 10, 15 years, but we are fixing it now. The big deal is that if you don't fix this stuff, it will cause what we used to call dry eye syndrome. So it'll lead to, so once the mybomian glands are messed up, you got no lipid layer on the tear film, you get, you get the, the water starts to separate, you get this mucus collection, you get these dry spots forming, you get de desiccation of the cells, they stain them with the lysamine green, you get all kind of bad stuff. This is what we call, I guess the correct term now, dysfunctional tear syndrome, uh, what we always used to call dry eye syndrome. Uh, so if you, so what all the science shows now, and everybody's seen the stat, that's why I didn't put it up here, you know, 80, 85% of the people that have dry eye syndrome is because the mybomian glands are messed up. Okay, mybomian gland dysfunction is the cause of dry eye syndrome in 85% of the people. That's what the stats show. So, you know, when people, uh, you know, I remember the, I, I gave one of these lectures and the COPE guys made me change my slide because I had the slide in there. It says, you know, 85% of the people with dry eye, the, the, the cause of the problem is mybomian gland dysfunction. Why even run a bunch of tests to figure it out? Why don't we just start with the default diagnosis of mybomian gland dysfunction? And if you treat the mybomian gland dysfunction and six months later, the dry eye is not better, okay, well then you can look at something else. But why, why spend a bunch of time and money running a bunch of tests on people trying to figure out if mybomian gland dysfunction is the cause when mybomian gland dysfunction is the cause 85% of the time? And they, they want me to take that slide out. They says, well, you're recommending that the doctors don't perform a diagnostic workup. I go, well, yeah, I'm recommending that because it's not necessary if you know what the diagnosis is 85% of the time. Just start with that and work your way down. So my recommendation is let's start with that and work our way down. So 
Let's pivot. We have now spent 40, 30, 40 minutes on refresher, uh, science, background, my Bowman gland dysfunction. We are all up to speed on the, on, on the anatomy and physiology. So now what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about fixing it. How do you fix this stuff? That's what we're going to talk about now. Best practices. In my opinion, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a three-part program uh, where, where you part one is you got to clean the eyelid mechanically. <clears throat> There's three or four ways to do that. You can pick whichever way is best for you. I'll show you a couple. I'll show you what I do. Uh, the number two, you're going to apply heat to liquefy the mybum. Uh, you can do that three or four or five, six different ways. Uh, again, I'm going to show you what I do. There's no, there's no right or wrong. There's no best. There's just different ways. And then you got to top it off with some whipped cream on the top and, and put some kind of topical or, or oral or anti-inflammatory therapy on them. Okay. And we are back. And let me see if the other guys are here too. So, hey, guys, are you uh, there? Rich is here. Uh, Hi, yeah. Rich and I are smoothing. We're all buddies. Uh, we go to Yankee games together. Oh, at awesome. least when they had games. Awesome. And uh, yeah, how's... back when they had games, right? Back <laughs> in the good old days. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're back on the air here. So, so Rich, thanks, thanks for showing up here today. Um, let me. You're very welcome. Let me uh, pull this, pull this on up. I'll pull up your picture here. So here we go. Um, so, so C Wired drags on. So thank you so much for coming out and doing this for the 85th time. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, it seems like uh, you guys have uh, lots of demand. So congratulations. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's been you're a really, you're really filling a need. I mean, you're really filling a need. I mean, with everything else shut down, it's very difficult to get education and credits. And you guys really are doing a great job. Yeah, I mean, that's why we extended it throughout the year. We were just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And we had the infrastructure going already last February. So we figured why not? So uh yeah, so we're just glad that we were able to, you know, get folks like you to come back and want to do it over and over again. I know you must get tired of hearing your own voice at some point. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so, so do my kids, so it's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at least they don't pay you. All right. <laughs> right. It's um, true. <laughs> so, so I guess, you know, the big, the big question about your lecture, you know, all about laser vision correction, I know that this has been kind of a disruptive year, right? Um, where perhaps, you know, things haven't gone the, the way people have wanted to, but uh, the tech is still the same, right? That's, you know, the, what's been going on in the field probably still rolls along. So maybe you could just sort of give us a little overview of what's been going on in the LASIK market besides sort of the stopping and starting that people have had to do with surgeries this year. I really think that's that sums it up really well, Paul. I mean, it really has been stopping and starting. I mean, obviously, as elective surgery got shut down, so did... So did LASIK. It's kind of interesting. I have noticed recently that there does seem to be an uptick. I don't know if uh, people are, you know, just tired of putting things off like we all have putting everything off. I don't know if the fact that, you know, people aren't spending money on things like travel and dining, so they have some more available cash to spend on other things. But uh, we're starting to see some more more interest than what there was, you know, a couple of months ago in the middle of this pandemic. So I don't know, maybe it's a combination of those things. Maybe we're all hoping for the vaccines and the light at the end of the tunnel, but definitely getting more inquiries. Excellent. Are patients feeling a little more comfortable about venturing out to the office and, and getting surgical procedures done? Yeah, they are. Uh, there's still some that are skittish. There's no two ways about it. I think you don't see them for LASIK. I noticed it on the cataract side. Um, we'll have you know, patients who postpone the surgery. I had one just the other day who was a physician. He just came in and needs a surgery, and he just got himself all worked up, even though, you know, at the surgical center, obviously it's probably the safest place to be. I mean, you know, everybody's wearing PPE, you know, gear. Everything is wiped down. You know, all the patients are screened. They have to get COVID testing, but you're seeing people still put stuff off, right. no doubt about it. Right. Uh, especially elective surgery. They're just kind of skittish about it. And, you know, I'm in the in the Northeast, and uh, you know, this is the time of the year we get snow and all kinds of stuff like that. So some gives them another reason to go, well, let's wait till March, and we'll do right. it when the weather warms up. Right. So, you know, for the ODs who actually did make it to your lecture, and I know that's a lot of them this year, right? We've had about 6,000 people come in through, through CUWire, but I know some people still haven't, but your lecture will be available on demand. I guess one of the topics that, that you know, people are really interested in is sort of 
uh, the, the pre-op assessment of the ocular surface and getting things ready, right, so that you can have the best outcome possible um, when, when the patient finally goes to surgery. Do you just want to sort of talk about that, about what it is that you expect, you know, when you finally get the patient on the table, what is it that you want to see? I think, I guess it's more important what I don't want to see. And what I don't want to see is any kind of corneal staining. Um, these, you know, you're doing an elective procedure that you're going to sever corneal nerves. You're going to put them on some medications. So you're going to disrupt their ocular surface. They've got to start off with a healthy surface. If you don't start off with a healthy surface, you don't get good measurements. And then you end up in a situation where you've got a patient postoperatively not really seeing well because they start developing you know, SPK or it gets worse and it affects their comfort, it affects the quality of their vision, and you go ahead and think you did great surgery, yet the patient's not happy, and usually the ones who are hearing it are the referring doctors, because, you know, I've seen the patient for the eval, a lot of my doctors see their own one-day post-ops on forward, so they're the ones who are going to deal with it. So it really becomes important to get that ocular surface healthy, and by that, you can do whatever it is you need to to do based on your individual patient, you know, whether they have blepharitis, whether you're going to do something to treat the blepharitis, whether it's just going to be artificial tears, or it's going to be some kind of prescription therapeutic med or fish oil supplements, whatever you need to get that patient's ocular surface looking as pristine as you can get it is just a real big help to me, and it's a real big help to your patient. Right. And I know, Steve, you've, you've seen a lot of patients, right, pre and post. Um, you've been responsible for sending patients off to surgery. Do you, do you sort of take, take that uh, advice of just sort of getting the ocular surface absolutely as good as you can get it? Um, <clears throat> Rich knows I do. Um, yeah, we, we always test people for all the uh, dry eye conditions and uh, obviously um, fuchs history, et cetera, to make sure. And we give them a heads up that uh, there's a problem if we don't get it quite under control. Uh, we also always evaluate the retina, and that's becoming a, a new norm. Uh, in fact, well, I'm going to ask you a question along that same lines. Um, I remember back when, when we pra practiced with knives and bear skins, and you used to do ultrasound on a very dense cataract and a, um, a PAM to, make, to see what their vision was. Um, and now I guess that's by the boards. Are, are people, are you doing more, or uh, in general ophthalmology, doing more OCTs of the retina, and how bad is it when somebody has a dense cataract? Could the OCT still burn through and get some decent results of what the retina looks like before you operate? In terms of, I mean, I, I don't do OTTs on every patient, but I'm very liberal on doing it. There are certain classes of patients, Steve, that to me, I, I have to have an OCT. If, I, if I'm going to put in, you know, an advanced technology lens implant, then I want to know that that macular is, is pristine or, you know, I'm going to end up with, you know, a disappointed patient, even if they spend some money. You know, diabetics, people like that. Um, all, you know, if I can get a good look in uh, with a 90, let's say, and the level of cataract and the level of vision, the commensurate and the macula looks good, I'm really okay going ahead and doing this if we're just doing a standard monofocal lens. Uh, but, and the OCTs will give you some value up until you start really getting close to a three to four plus cataract, and then the sensitivity and everything starts to degrade. I mean, you do what you can do, but yes, you do have to counsel the patients that, you know, everything looks okay as far as you can see it. Cool. But you do see, um, especially for the referring ODs, that they're doing more and more preoperative yes. um, analysis, and in some yes. cases they might defer the care to you, in other cases they do it themselves. Yeah, I, I, look, I have no, I have, uh, and as you know, Steve, because we've worked together for so long, I'm very happy having the, you know, the referring doctor do as much as they're capable of. I mean, not everybody has an OCT in their office. More and more people do, but not everybody does. And I think if you don't have one, you can still do a good job taking care of your patients. But if, if, if you've got an OCT, and especially if you're talking to your patients about their lens options, and I wish I could get more people to actually at least initiate the discussion a little bit, but if you've got a patient that you know would be very interested in a multifocal or extended depth of focus lens, and you know, you know this patient for many years, I'm going to see the patient once, it's helpful to me 
if you've had some conversations. And if you're going to talk to them about it, yeah, it's really good to get an OCT. Know that it's normal so you know that this patient really is a potential candidate. Because if it turns out they've got an epiretinal membrane or a lamella hole, in my opinion, in my practice, I won't put in those kind of lenses. And there are a few people who do, but I tend to be a little bit more conservative because you end up, I think, with happier patients. Once patients start paying a lot of money out of pocket, um, they expect certain results. And if the macula is not so good, you're just not going to get the results that, that they want. But you're right. The practitioner referring doctor who just punts to you and says, okay, I have cataracts. Let's see Dr. Whitland. Let him take care of it. Without giving people some guidance, some advice, some um, broad knowledge of what's available in terms of uh, multifocal lenses, um, certainly in terms of um, uh, different uh, femtolaser, et cetera. I, I have always had that discussion. It makes it really easy for you when you present that to them. Uh, I think they're, um, they're making it really difficult for you by punting the whole um, discussion to you to do it. And, and then they're doing the follow-up care or, or maybe doing the follow-up care. So. Uh, I know you probably find a big diversity in, in referring practitioners and how they approach things. Do you agree? Yes. There's a. You are always on the more of the forefront end of it, Steve. Quite honestly, uh, not everybody does. The other thing that it's really you know critical for me in a referral setting where you've seen Mrs. Smith for a number of years and now she you know is ready to get her cataracts done. I can look at her ocular anatomy, but I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> and, you know, there's there's a certain patient types that really do quite well with some of these advanced technology lenses, and there are other ones that don't. And I try to be careful about not putting the lens in the wrong person. Do you know what I mean? Somebody could have a good anatomy, uh -huh. but emotionally, psychologically, not be the right person. And this is really where the referring practitioner who knows that patient can really be a big help to me in terms of sometimes offering me guidance on the non-ocular things that actually are really important in making a patient happy. Yep. And I guess the, the other thing is setting expectations, right? Um, I wonder sometimes if people have this expectation about these advanced lenses that it's going to be like they're 22 years old again. Um, they do, uh, Paul. They they do, and it's and it is something that you really have to, uh, you know, disabuse them. You have to really set set the bar and let them know that this is the best technology that we have currently available. But you're absolutely right. You're not going to see like you're 25 years old. I never promise them they're going to be 100% free of glasses. Now I have a significant percentage, of course, that really don't wear glasses. But I'd much rather tell them up front that my goal is to get you out of your glasses, you know, 90 plus percent of the time. But there are certain circumstances when, you know, you might need, you know, a little help for driving or if you're in a dimly lit restaurant, if we ever get to go back to dimly lit restaurants, you know, to see the menu, uh, if you're trying to read in bed, you might have to put on a pair of cheaters or something. So it's absolutely critical. You're, you're right that you set the expectations realistically for the patient, but that's also why I was saying before in terms of some of the psychological or emotional stuff, because some people, typically we always say like, you know, engineers who are so precise and so, you know, they notice little things that maybe somebody else isn't, isn't going to bother them because there are some dysphoto, you know, dis, you know, chromatopsies, dysphototopsies that people get with multifocal lenses. Most people you know, neuroadapt or whatever you want to call it and learn to ignore it. But if you've got somebody who's so precise that they're going to be consciously aware of all these little things, they may be somebody who's really better off, uh, you know, with a good old monofocal lens. And the other thing that I will, I still do in my practice, I mean, especially in people who've been already been adapted to it with their contacts, uh, monovision still works. It's still a very reasonable option for certain people. Um, so you okay. really do Paul have to Farkas, work these people. Paul Farkas here, Richard. That was my very question. My wife has been probably the first monovision patient in America. So <laughs> she's been monovision for, for many, many years. And when she had cataract surgery, 
there was no question that she was going to be getting monovision, and she is still a happy person after all these right. years. Right, and, I, and I, as I said to you, I think that it's a it's a good option. I find, especially in patients who have been doing that with their contact lenses and were satisfied and liked it. Um, I'll just duplicate it for them if I can. It also saves them, you know, a boatload of money, and they're happy. Uh, I have, if I have a contact lens patient who has never tried it, but I think it might be a good thing, I will often send them back to their, you know, referring doctor and say, "Look, do it. Get, go, go get it. Go back see Doctor So and So. Try Monovision for a month, and come back, and we'll talk about it. And if you like it, and it works for you, yes, we can do it. So I absolutely agree with you, Paul. It still has its place, and it still works. And, and uh, speaking of the same thing, when you get the, someone in that has been myopic through the years, do you do you try to overcorrect them so they're slightly myopic with the uh, after cataract surgery? Not well, as I, I myopic as it, they were, but at it least really they can walk around. You know what? It really depends on when I, I'm the thing that that I quickly do in the office is I ask them when they wear their glasses. You know, if you've got somebody who's a minus six, let's say, and they've been obviously myopic their entire life, and they take their glasses off to read, and that's how they read, I agree with you. I will not get rid of their myopia. I may make them a minus two and a half or a minus three, and I just go, look, I can I can make it so you can you can bring that a little further away from you and you have a little better walking around vision. But I I you got to be real careful about taking somebody who's a habitual myope and taking away their myopia. Uh, they're really unhappy. They're also the kind of people, the low myopes, the, the twos and threes, are very difficult to make happy uh, with multifocal lenses because, as we, we all know, with, they take their glasses off, they have perfect close vision. I mean, it's just perfect. And we don't have a multifocal that will give you the same thing as a natural minus three. So those are the people that I'm really careful with because I may think I did a great job and they're just not happy because they go, I used to see better before, Doc. Uh, so you got to be really Rich, careful um, with those. Rich, I'm doing a lecture uh, to next C wire uh, uh, iteration on um, the pharmaceuticals, the topical pharmaceuticals for presbyopia. But as you're talking, uh, especially the, obviously you're not going to improve accommodation in somebody who's pseudophagic. Um, but the meiotic uh, drugs, which are the first few to come out on the market, do you think they're going to perhaps ameliorate some of these problems? Because, again, if somebody can't read quite well, but you stop down their pupil, et cetera, uh, it just seems like the optics will get better in, in all these cases. Uh, are you, um, do you have any opinion yeah, on that? I think, I, think it, I think it will help, um, but now they're on a, on a drop, which they weren't taking right. before. So I think it will help. And it might help rescue you from certain situations where somebody's not quite as happy as they could be. So I think there's a role. But I'm just saying that in general, the low myopes who take their glasses off to read and have done it since they were, you know, a kid, I'm very reluctant to take that away from them because they tend not to be happy. I agree with one, minus two. I one final be. question back to the future. Uh, about PRK, uh, do you do it? Yep. Uh, do you, and when? When and why? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I did a PRK on a referring doc's uh, nephew last week. High myope. I had reasonably good corneal thickness, but it was a very high myope. And I just felt that, you know, you, you the, the, the one bugaboo you're always worried about is the possibility of you know, inducing some type of corneal ectasia. And when I start to have to take away a lot of tissue, uh, I get concerned about that. There's pretty good evidence that biomechanically, the anterior stromal uh, la layers are the strongest part of your cornea. So I like to preserve that. This was a, you know, a 23-year-old, and I'm going, you know, this cornea has got to last another, you know, 70 years or whatever. And I think that they're better off with a stronger, thicker cornea. And once you explain that to them and you 
get them where they're, okay, yes, my vision is going to be a little blurry for the first week or two. I'm not going to get that wow factor after LASIK. I think in the long run, they end up happier. Also, sometimes you'll get a cornea where you think it's probably okay, but maybe there's a little, you know, inferior, superior asymmetry, and you're still a little concerned about ectasia. Um, I will sometimes just be on the safe side because this is just a practical matter, Paul, but practicing in America, if one of your patients gets ectasia, you're going to get sued. It's as simple as that. Even no matter what you did to try to check it out, if your patient develops ectasia, they're going to find an attorney and you will probably find yourself in a courtroom. Yeah, if they're closer to New York, the more likely this is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, yeah. the, uh, also, the final question. Well, you know, basically, Paul, in, in <laughs> Arizona, we just, we just go outside and we have a gunfight. So. <laughs> 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 uh, the one question that, that over the long term, uh, how comfortable are you doing cataract surgery on people that have had LASIK? It comes up all the time. Uh, the, the challenge is not doing the cataract surgery, as you know. The challenge is getting the lens implant power correct. And we've made progress in that. I think that, uh, you know, we've gotten some formulas that have gotten better. I always use intraoperative aberometry um, as a way to double check the measurements and everything. It still is a challenge. I always caution the patient that despite all of our best efforts and all the calculations, it is possible to get a power miss and that sometimes you have to go back and you have to do something. And it's important that both the referring doctor and the patient understand that this is just a fact of life and sometimes it happens. The actual surgery itself is techno technically, you know, the same. It's no different. It is just trying to nail the power because obviously these are people who don't want to be. You tell them they're twenty twenty, but they're plus three. They're not very happy. <laughs> so the corny is. Want to get it to work? No, that's not be the case. The the corny is not weakened uh, from the. The corny is really not weakened. It really it really acts perfectly normally, Paul, during surgery. It's not. It's different than an RK. You know, I had a patient the, just the other last week who had you know. A million billion years ago had radial keratotomy. Those corneas are weakened, and you have to be careful uh, in terms of how much fluid and everything you do in because some of those incisions could separate or swell. So RK, yes, you have a structurally weakened cornea that's unstable, but I haven't found that to be a problem with a, a post-LASIK or post-PRK cornea. Right. Do you try to get the, um, if you weren't the refractive surgeon, um, patient came to you, whatever, do you try to get the pre-LASIK um, K readings? Does that help in terms of the accuracy? Yeah, there's a, that's, Steve, that's another way to do it. If you can, there's, a, there's a historical record you know, method where if you do have their pre-op Ks and pre-op refractions, it's definitely a help. Unfortunately, you know, we've been doing LASIK and refractive surgery for so long, it's so typical for somebody to come in and say, well, I had it done 15, 20 years ago, and they don't even most exactly. of the time remember who the hell did it. <laughs> I went to New York and I had somebody do it. Like, I don't, okay, who, I don't remember. You know, that's a very common answer. So, you know, yes, if I can get the data, if somebody was coming out of a practice like yours where you have all that stuff and you've saved it, it's very helpful, but it's not always available. Right. Aren't they called the Holiday 2 formula? Is that still used? Yes, that's a, but again, the, the, what I like, what, what I the formula that works best for me is Hagis. He's a German guy, H-A-I-G-I-S, uh, post-myopic or post-hyperopic. There's modifications that, that he's, you know, from his research that he built into the, his regular Hagis formula. And I find that the Hagis post-myopic usually will get me pretty close. I can then go on certain websites like the ASCRS has a, you know, calculator. And again, usually what I'll do in something like that, I'll calculate it two, three different ways and then use the intraoperative aberometry. And hopefully they all, mm -hmm. you know, coincide or at least are close. Um, it, it, the more different ways you do it, it just gives you some idea, at least you're in the right range. I mean, you may not, you may still be off by a little bit. If I'm off by a diopter and the patient comes out of minus one, they're still going to be happy. I don't want them to come out plus three because then I've got to go back and really right. do something. They're not going to be happy. Exactly. And the other thing I, I would say that is if you do. 
Sorry. Uh, I was going to say that, but by doing that, um, if you recall, well, I think it was about eight years ago, I think we were on the same court case uh, as the right. first wit- witnesses. Um, and the doctor, the person had uh, like a 20-20 minus cataract, and um, he was post-LASIK, and he didn't use the proper formulas, and uh, the person wound up plus three, and they were not a happy camper. Uh, we know how that came out. Right. So, you know, it's, again, and I think it's important for the, for the, for the you know, co-managing doctor to recognize, and if there's a problem, because again, the same thing in my practice, a lot of times they're going back to their doctors and I may not see them after surgery. If you get a situation like that, don't sit on it. Call me, you know, call your surgeon, send the patient back because it's, it's going to be easier to fix early on than later. And that plus three is not going to get better on their own. So you might as well just face the fact that something's got to be done. And if I'm going to go ahead and do a lens exchange or something, it's so much easier for me to do it, you know, four to six weeks after than somebody who's sitting on it for six months and now the patient comes back and now it's a challenge. So if there's a, yep. if there's a mistake, it's co-management, communicate with your surgeon. Got it. All right. Well, it looks like we are coming to the end of, <clears throat> excuse me, end of our time. But do you have any sort of uh, parting thoughts or last words? I can't believe that CUR 2020 is coming to an end. I, it seemed seemed endless. <laughs> um, uh, all I can say is you guys, you know, did a great job. Uh, I look forward to being part of your course for 2021. And boy, it'll be nice when... Uh, I can go see a Broadway show again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, uh, I think we're all feeling pretty cooped up. Any Yankee, any Yankee game. Yep. Any, any Yankee game, right. Yep. Right, exactly. So fingers so. crossed. I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to make it by April, but hopefully as the summer wears on, they're going to start letting more and more people back. So I'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed for us. You got it. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, gentlemen. Well. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Bye. You're very Bye. welcome. Bye-bye now. Okay. Okay, we learned something. Okay, um, yeah, and just that advice um, um, about the there was a, a change in the schedule that's on the schedule correctly between um, uh, the doctor uh, was in the wrong time frame, but he has he's on the schedule so, for later this afternoon. Yeah. So what what happened here? What happened here is that inside of the conference itself, they had the old version of our schedule up there from November. So the schedule is actually correct on the CUR 2020 website, where that PDF can be downloaded. Uh, and they're just replacing the, because what happened was they left the November one in place inside the schedule. Um, and a few of the classes have moved around. We try our best not to move the classes, as you know, um, so people can go from track to track and take a different track each time. But occasionally things do move and people, you know, people's lectures move. So that's what happened here. So, um, yeah. So they're just going to fix the schedule that people okay, are downloading. Okay. So for the most part, though, when people download the schedule from November, it looks just like the one in December. There's just a couple of small differences, um, and they're going to make sure the December one is up there. Yeah, these are very um, A-plus speakers, and, and things have changed. Uh, at the beginning, they could be on Saturday, but now they're in office hours. So we have to accommodate these people. They're coming back uh, several times, and they're being very nice to us to, to redo this. So um, it's challenging to have them exactly the same time, exactly the same right. so here's, day of the week. Here's the example that we're having. Movement. Yeah, here's the example we're having a problem with. Uh, Dr. Gellies couldn't make it last time out, so his, schedule, his thing got pushed to 4 p.m. Eastern time today, which necessitated them moving other, <laughs> other things around. So it's, the schedule's mostly the same, but you will see differences, and I apologize for having the November one still up. Um, so they're fixing that right now. But the December one has been available for a long time on CUR2020.com. It's right here. Most people have been downloading that where it says view live schedule. So, yep. all good. Uh, live and learn, right? Okay. We've only, only done this like 25 so, times this year. So, <laughs> well, it's still live, and live is live. So, yep. it's, uh, things are going to happen. But it's all, it's nothing really. Uh, pe- the people who are attending the conference are planning their schedule based upon. Um, the new one now, so it'd be no problem. Yeah. And, and the schedule I had I emailed out to everybody a few days ago. That's also this new one, so it's the correct one. I, I had an interesting question uh, by email. Uh, will this program be available? What we've done yesterday and today for the future, if anyone wants to listen to it. Oh, you mean this live stream? So if, if someone yeah. wants to sit here for seven hours and do it, so the answer is yes. It'll be up permanently, actually. 
in the thread on ODY, or there's a thread where the live streams live, and you can always go back and replay all seven hours if you're a masochist. However, what I plan to do for a bunch of the interviews that we've done is actually chop them up into small pieces and post them on OD Wire as well. Because if you want to hear somebody for 10 minutes, you don't want to have to sit there you know, six hours or whatever it is. Um, so that's in, my, in our off season, which for me is going to officially start uh, in a couple of hours. <laughs> Thank God. Um, I'll have time to actually take all of the interviews that we've done and chop them up into 10 minute segments and repost on OD Wire. So you don't have to sit through the, the massive seven hour long archive, so, although people do. Um, I, you know, oh, yeah. people, I, so, I was actually for those looking. who are listening, yep. for those who are listening, Adam is lying. He doesn't have an off season now with the way uh, our schedule goes. So um, <laughs> he has an off day maybe or right. two. I, so, I, you know, I, I used to, to laugh about it in all the past years of CE Wire because we'd have this great schedule where the live conference would be done and then the baseball season would start. And so I would say, all right, I'm going to just take, you know, some time off for myself now because the live thing's over take some time, watch some baseball games, and just chill out a little bit. And this did not happen this year. It was the saddest thing in the world. We, the, you know, the February conference ended, and then we're like, well, we got to just jump right back into it. So we've had no time. Um, this is going to be the first time off that I've had, actually, starting, I guess, this afternoon since the pandemic started. So, yeah, just a couple well, days away. All right, so so the, the, the snippets will be available right through to 2021? Yeah, so what's going to happen is as I, as I have time to actually do the edits, I'm going to put them up on ODWR. So we're just going to have these little threads, you know, with people's interviews in them so, so people can go back and, and you know, watch them. Yeah, some of these interviews are pretty good. Yep. Back stories that are pure gold. Yep. And for those who want new content and need credits or just want to have the education, we'll be back again in the middle of March, uh, March 13th and 14th, for the next uh, iteration of uh, CUI 2021 this time with um, – uh, multiple times to be able to watch things live till June 30th. Yeah, so, let me um, just before we, we have, before we have our next uh, guest come on here, which I think is Sue Resnick. I don't know if she's here yet or not, but uh, um, I just, yes, I am. Oh, oh, Sue, you're here. Okay, well, before before we, Hi, we start talking to you, let's let me just quickly. I just want to really quickly um, show people your just mention to people that CY 2021 is coming for better or worse. <laughs> um, on I'll put up the the slides so people can see. Um, so on March 13th and 14th, it's going to be the, the next live show that we're doing. Uh, and it's going to have all new content, 100% new lectures, a bunch of new speakers, and of course some classic speakers like you, Sue, um, coming back. Of and course. So 64 credits, so we're calling it a 64 4 and one 64 credits, four live events, one low price. So basically you pay once and it's all you can eat for those four live events. So it's essentially going to be like a 100 day long conference. <laughs> <laughs> between the four live <laughs> events and all the stuff that goes on in between with the sponsors and everything's on demand. So it's going to be fun, but I can't really think about it right now, actually, because my eyes are crossed. I'm just so tired from 2020. The <laughs> year um, of the I'm, I'm, I'm writing these dates down now because it's the first I'm hearing about it. Oh, is no, it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew about the March one. As a matter of fact, while I've been enjoying all the lectures that I had to catch up on, I've been working on my my next one for you guys, and it's going to be exciting because I'm partnering with the great Melissa Barnett. So um, we yeah. have a really cool lecture. But anyway, that's uh, I don't want to do any commercials right now. She'll be on at 3.15 today. So. Yep. Yeah, so right, we're, I know. We're, we're I know. <laughs> so, you know, this has been, this has been quite a year. And, and before we talk about any ridiculous clinical stuff, I wanted to ask you, Sue, how's everything going for you? You know, you, as everyone knows, you know, you're from the New York area where the pandemic really got its legs, unfortunately, in the beginning. What are you seeing now? How are, how's everything going? So it's, um, you know, we're still not up to like normal volume. Um, we are doing fine. I mean, you know, it's oh, everything's relative. Um, so compared to places like lower Manhattan, where it, you know, there is no traffic anymore, people have, it's like abandoned. Um, and compared to some other areas in Manhattan, we're doing okay because we're, we're next to a residential area. And the uh, other part that, thank goodness, is we have our Long Island office. So we literally had an exodus of patients to that location, patients who are kind of still hunkering down on the east end of Long Island uh, or even the northern suburbs are finding it uh, easier to come see me in the Long Island office. So 
you know, we're getting along. Um, I look forward to the time where things are back to normal. We clearly uh, don't have the volume we, we want. And that's for two reasons. One is there isn't the volume we want. But number two is because it's still we're trying to socially distance, we've cut back uh, a third of the patients uh, to sp space patients out more. So, you know, we're getting by, but uh, we want it to be better. Sure. You know, I, I made mention uh, a couple of hours ago about our fire in 1989. You were with us then, right? I was. I was only working out of the Long Island office then, but I was getting you know, getting the blow by blow. But, yeah. but, the, but, but the point being that uh, we went to 900 square feet right. and uh, worked from 7 in the morning to 7 at night, and, and our profit was not that different. Right. <laughs> Doing and it so that way with one, one office. Right. And that is exactly the, yeah, we're having the same sort of the same effect now. Uh, it's a little different, but yeah, we're thank goodness, um, you know, we're, we're maintaining. It's just that um, our expenses have gone, gone up probably since then. <laughs> um, uh, we are, you know, we have more staff. So yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's fine, but, but very similar, Paul, very similar. We're, we're very fortunate that we can, we can do that. Right. Yeah. You find, Sue, that people, um, I have a friend who's a dentist in midtown Manhattan also in a, a very high class practice, much like yours. Um, and he's finding a lot of people are seeking care um, locally because they're working from home in suburbia, whether it be Long Island, Westchester, White Plains, et cetera. Do you find the same thing that people, some people are dropping out because they just don't go into the city anymore and it just was convenient before that's not convenient now? Um, thank goodness, no. Um, because I guess for the fact that we see so much medically necessary contact lenses, yeah. so th these aren't the minus threes. As a matter of fact, we are experiencing the opposite. So whereas people may have, you know, previously been going to other places, like, uh, how shall I say, fragmenting their care. Let's say they were going to a local ophthalmologist for their dilated fundus exam or a local optical for their glasses. When they come into us, they want one-stop shopping. So they are now yep. taking advantage of the fact that we are a full facility service, whereas in the past, because we are so well known as a specialty contact lens practice, we over all these years of internal marketing, we still couldn't um, impress upon people that we could do everything for them. And we were also very, um, how shall I put it, wary of taking patients away from their other practitioners. And, and we still are, we, we value, the relationships we have with our referral sources, but if they're not aligned with one of our referral sources, um, or they really express a desire to just quote unquote get it over with with us, um, then we are obviously accommodating them. So we are kind of going case by case. Right. It pays to be the best or, or a specialty and be the best at that. It really does help, it, especially the right. rank and file one who probably but sometimes, is suffering. You know, sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. You can also. Uh, pigeonhole your practice. I mean, I, you know, as much as I'm doing a lot of myopia management, I feel like I still am not getting the number of kids I want. And I, I have patients coming in, you know, after our 6,000th mass email and brochure and yada yada, they're like, oh, you do children? You know, <laughs> it's, I just, I just, I, I'm sort of numb at this point. So, uh, you know, we still can't impress upon them that we are uh, kid friendly as well. I guess maybe we don't, the office doesn't look that way. So we'll have to figure that out. But anyway. Hmm. Wow. So meanwhile, shift, shifting I, gears. I, enjoy, I enjoyed your, I enjoyed your talk with Rich Whitland. Um, <laughs> you know, I had to laugh because when he says I'm not a psychiatrist, I thought to myself, sure you are. We're all, <laughs> we all have honorary degrees in psychology. Anybody <laughs> in our care, somebody ought to let him know. <laughs> You have to have uh, a coffee with Rich one day. He's a great guy, a really down-to-earth yeah. uh, surgeon, and uh, really just, uh, competent uh, beyond belief, but also really Yeah, no, he's great. I, I think over the years, I do have some patients to comment. I've, I've attended all of his lectures. No, I love his um, pragmatic look on everything and, and the way he practices. I agree, Steve. He's great. Oh, man. So, so Sue, I got, anyway. a question. I got a question for you. So, yeah. you know, your sure. lecture, your, your one lecture here, you did many of them, but this one is on ptosis. So this is a disease that was universally ignored <laughs> by people until very recently, right? <laughs> That's right. Because they couldn't That's do right. anything, right? And you didn't want to offend anyone. But now, of course, you can right. offend everyone because you actually have a treatment right. for this. <laughs> yeah, so interesting because, you know, I just did the uh, lecture on this and we addressed the differential diagnosis and how do you measure it and what the surgeon and what the options were. And 
I had to put on the chat that this lecture was drafted and given before UPNIC was approved. So a lot of, I got some comments like, has anybody tried UPNIC? So I tried to direct everybody to this little chat, but yeah, you're right. I mean, up until now, I mean, I've been guilty. The habit has been to do a rather cursory look at the eyelids, not paying much attention to the position or function, unless there really was obvious asymmetry or the patient brought up concerns. But, you know, now knowing that we have alternatives to surgery, uh, it's important to look at the lid anatomy and function, you know, both qualitatively and quantitatively, you know, in a methodical fashion on a routine basis. So, um, Apneek gives us the advantage of, as you, you said, insulting people. We try not to do that. We, uh, we have methods of uh, bringing that up uh, in a very politically correct fashion. Um, sometimes a patient will bring it up, but oftentimes the way I will do it is, uh, you know, when I have them under the microscope and I'm explaining what I'm looking at and I go from one eye to the other, I'll say, gee, I'm measuring a little difference in the position of the eyelids. Is that something you've ever noticed? And that will be a springboard. If they say no, then I'll say, okay, that's great. It's not an issue. Um, just know that if it ever bothers you and I explain to them what the symptoms might be down the road, that we have a drop that can lift the lid. And then I leave it at that, done. But if they say, gee, oh my God, yeah, my eyelid, look, if it's bilateral ptosis and they say my eyelids have always been heavy uh, or I feel like um, I'm just, I don't like the way I look in pictures. I mean, then it's easy to just say, great, we have this great option, and, and I go, we go from there. We, right. uh, we do a little in-office uh, trial with Upneek, and, and then we, teach, we show them how they can get it. Right. Well, what I liked about your lecture, too, was you reviewed the anatomy and physiology of this condition, right, which is something I think everyone's forgotten. Um, and I know that yeah, some, people, I mean, I, some yeah. people are better candidates than others, right, based on what's actually going on. Yeah, sure. So it's for, the approval is for acquired blepharoptosis, which, as you know, Adam, is more prevalent with age. As a matter of fact, the statistics show that about 11% of patients will acquire, you know, some form of blepharoptosis as we get older. Um, now, interestingly, being in a time, Paul will know this, um, Paul basically set up our entire demographic for Upneek because back then we were fitting hard, you know, he was fitting hard lenses and I still have many of those patients. And, you know, these patients literally come in, you know, lifting up their chins and looking down at their noses. Uh, some of them have significant bilateral ptosis due to the essence of the lid uh, from, you know, pulling on that lid in terms of uh, removing the contact. So for us, it's probably more than 11.5%. Um, but it can also happen with soft lenses. But yes, acquired blepharoptosis, the differential has to be made because, you know, there can be underlying serious systemic or, you know, isolated conditions. Um, you know, the isolated acquired Blepharoptosis, such as trauma, surgery. I mean, that's obvious. The patient will basically walk in and tell you the story. Um, but if they walk in and it's neurogenic or myogenic, then you do have to be careful. Uh, the first thing I do is I look similar to pupillary, um, you know, differences in pupil size. Uh, you know, first thing I do is I have to look at a picture from way back or their their driver's license, and if it is something new, then it has to be investigated further. Right. And so with the patients that come in, you actually, if you've determined them to be a candidate, you actually give them a trial right there in office? Yeah, so basically I do the exam and if I'm going to, let's say, dilate them, I, I actually will put in the, the upneak first, wait a couple minutes, and then I'll put the dilating drop right in after. So while they're dilating, we're waiting for their pupils to open and their lid to lift. <laughs> I take a picture, the company provides us with a tablet with an app. Uh, oftentimes I'll just use my cell phone or, right. or use their cell phone because what's nice is then they can just look at it, take it home and show their friends and family. And we take a before and after. The onset of effect is about five minutes for most patients. At about 15 minutes, you've pretty much achieved maximum lift. And um, un everybody has to understand that this is an alpha adrenergic and it works on Mueller's muscle. And, we, and as we know, Mueller's muscle is only responsible for one to two millimeters of lift anyway. So you can't expect more than that, but two. But there's there's a couple of studies that showed um, three and a half millimeters of lift on some patients. So that's an interesting one. But if you get two millimeters of lift, I mean that's significant uh, because most ptosis or noticeable or functional ptosis occurs at about uh, you know when the when the marginal reflex distance is about down to two millimeters or three millimeters. So. Um, yeah, it's very effective. And what's nice is 
There's no tachyphylaxis. So in other words, you can use it for weeks and weeks. The studies go out to six weeks and it shows the efficacy is still there. In terms of how the sustain, uh, how long the effect is sustained, um, we've looked at patients at you know six, eight hours, and it is sustained through that. So it's a once a day drop. It is um, preservative free, and you know it's um, you know a safe drop, very safe. You know there may be some contraindications as you would have with any alpha adrenergic, which would be significant cardiovascular problems, but most patients do not fit into that category. Right. And uh, patients... Respond. Do you get any additive effect? I was going to ask, do you get any additive effect with phenylephrine 10% or it's the same pharmacological action with all the side effects that you uh, don't feel any benefit in combining them? Uh, no, I wouldn't use phenylephrine 10 I mean, I've never tried it, but just I would not clinically use phenylephrine 10%. Um, to me, that has far more side effects. You have to understand that this is a selective adrenergic blocker, so much the same way that you have selective beta blockers for glaucoma. Um, this is a selective. It's mostly a alpha adrenergic two, a more than one. So what's nice is you do not get rebound hyperemia. Right. And, in, in and you certainly don't get pupil dilation either, so that's nice. Right, and in terms of patient response, can they actually notice the difference straight away when you, when you do a trial with them? Their chins, do they, their chins come down finally and they can <laughs> look straight oh, ahead yeah. again? So, um, yeah, I mean, so those are the more severe ones, but absolutely, I mean, I have my whole cell phone now, aside from pictures of my grandson, is basically my patients with, uh, I, have all my, I have all my up and patients uh, on my phone. Um, and yes, yeah, so, um, you know, it's marked, and not every patient suffers from, you know, visual, they notice a visual field defect. It's only the more severe ones that will actually, you know, lift the chin. Most patients complain more about the cosmesis and just feeling more tired. And, you know, we're used to looking at dry eye, we're used to looking at binocular vision defects, but we have to keep in mind that ptosis can create the same complaints. Yep. I even wonder how many people in their in their EHR mark this off when they're seeing patients routinely now, right? Actually taking any measurements. Do people even do that? I think they will. I mean, we do. When we are prescribing a medication, we're always more careful to quantify on the record, certainly indicate it as a diagnosis. So I think if you're going to be prescribing it, um, yes, I, I would agree that people should start doing it if, if they haven't been, you know, previously. Excellent. And do you still sort of use things like crutches and so forth, or these <laughs> old school old school methods, or have you moved moved on? Yeah. So I mean, no, I don't use crutches. If a patient has that, you know, if if it's not a mule, if the levator is that the hip, uh, you know, Mueller's muscle ain't going to take up all the slack. So for that, I would did you know refer out to oculoplastic. And nobody's saying that this is a substitute. Uh, for some patients, it may be. I uh, mean, you know, if they have a mild ptosis or mild asymmetry, um, or for some reason can't undergo surgery, but most patients in the end, the more severe ones, will want, you know, an oculoplastic surgical, you know, remedy for this. So uh, it's, uh, it's a, you know, a, a way to kind of co-manage. Sure. And, you know, one, one question I had, too, is this all sort of came out around the time of the pandemic, right? Um, it's sort of, <laughs> there's like an overlap. And my question would be, is this generally available, like, out here in the, in the wilds of Oregon? Do pharmacists, can they get this product? Or, I mean, I guess in Manhattan, it's, oh, it's yes. easy, right? So, oh, so this is a very unique, uh, how shall I put it, um, how, the, how they, how they um, provide it. So RVL, which is the company that developed the um, formula, they have their own pharmacy. Mm. So a couple of things everybody needs to be aware of. Um, one is that it, you can only get it through RVL, so you actually can put it through your, your normal EHR, or however you order your pharmaceuticals for patients, through the computer. And then the, the company will contact the patient to finalize the delivery. They'll take their credit card number. It is not covered by insurance, so it's out of pocket. Um, so anybody can get it anywhere in the country. Um, they are, it's a small company. They are trying to get reps out to the boonies, as you said. Uh, they, are, they are not yet in every state and every region, but they're trying. Um, you can email the company or email me if you wish. I'm happy to put you in contact with them, and they will get back to you and go over how to do this. They have, they have brochures that um, 
you give, well, not brochures, but you know, just a slip of paper that you give the patient as to the how to get it and what's going to happen. Um, so it's very simple to do. And just as an aside, um, coming this Wednesday night and then for a few other nights, we're going to be going through all this, uh, me and a couple of the other um, uh, KOLs for UPNIC. We're doing webinars, and I'm, I'm going to be pairing with Dr. John Feza, who has an amazing practice in Florida. So he and I are going to be doing two presentations Monday, uh, Wednesday night, and then there are a couple after. So just go on if you, you know, you can um, find the link and just sign up for one of our presentations and we're going to take everybody through all of this. Oh, very cool. I'm, I'm happy to plug it for you. If you could, if you could send the link or I could find it here. I'm on actually, oh, I'm, I'll do, yeah, because I'm on a, a yeah, big site sure. right now. Adam, I'll send, I'll send you the link uh, in the, yeah, I'll, send, I'll email it to you because um, I don't know how else to get it to you. It was sent out in email, then you can figure out how to transfer that. Sure. I'm really bad at that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm actually uh, browsing I'm their website I right now, so you're absolutely right. So you have to go to the, their Uplifting Pharmacy Experience, right? So they have a website. Right. And the, the procedure that you go through to actually uh, get the, the drug to the patient. So that's pretty yeah. cool. They, they, you know, they make it so easy for you. Like, you do nothing. All you do is, like, uh, put it into the... the the EMR, the uh, not the EMR, the you know whatever pharmaceutical platform you use, and then they take it from there. But to answer your question, we do provide the patient with about a three-day sampling. And if you call the company, if you don't have a rep, they will send you samples. Uh, it's in individual tubes, and again, you use it once a day. You have to, you know, you have to tell the patient it's uh, it's always preservative-free, and it is. Um, you know, it's a very comfortable drop to use. I haven't had any stinging or burning or, you know, anything like that. Very cool. Excellent. Well, you know what? If you can get me that link, what I'll do is I'll take this little interview that we're doing and I'll clip it out and I'll put it on ODYR so people can just watch our little talk here and I'll put the link right beneath it Great. because I know that you said it's coming up on Wednesday. So that I, it's mine and Dr. Feza and then I know Dr. Carpecki and a couple of uh, of the other, as you put it, classical speakers. I like that. Instead of saying old farts, a couple of the other. Thank you for that. A hey, couple of the other class, class, classical speakers um, are on there. Um, we what what uh, what RBL did was so cool. So they paired ODMD up for each of the presentations, so we can really combine, talk about how we do this, compare notes. Uh, it's really it's a it's a nice way to bring um bring the professions together <laughs> very cool yeah great so i will send that to you shortly adam all right excellent well thank you for doing this and again thank you for being part of Wire again for the 85th time <laughs> i'm glad it's over <laughs> i mean it's been fun but you know this year has, has been dragging on a little bit too long well you guys are just doing an amazing job and i was looking at the uh attendance and i'm just so impressed that people are still logging on and forth and, it's uh, it's know. surprising to me i don't know if, yeah i don't know if you heard we we got our six thousandth uh participant yesterday morning for this year wow do they get some sort of a prize or something? <laughs> that's actually a good idea for sure um yeah. i think you should have had a drone deliver and, like balloons. <laughs> send them some up and you're correct sue the amount of people in the rooms are just phenomenal. People are you know, getting their last, I guess some states have their biennial be the calendar year, so they need the credits desperately, as well as right. the great education you provide. Exactly. All right, so um, okay. enjoy, uh, you know, I'm gonna enjoy the rest of the meeting and you guys just get through it and uh, get some sleep. All right, well, thanks Sue, and we will catch up with you in, uh, in 2021, so after our, after our little Sounds vacation. Good. All right. Thanks. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Catch you later. Hey, you bye. All right. So always great to speak with her. Um, and as we mentioned, of course, CUR 2021 is coming, whether we want it to or not. <laughs> Those are the dates. Um, Steve, hopefully you made it clear to the speakers that these are the dates that we want them to be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all want the first date first because they don't know if the world's going to end after that. And uh, uh, they all have um, all the dates now, at, le at least the speakers I have. We have almost our full um, consortium of speakers, but a few more 
uh, yeah. so high-profile people. We should definitely on. let them know that these are the other dates that we want them to be there as well. Hopefully they can make it. Yep. Again, we tried to schedule those that, you know, away from major meetings, right? We don't want to yep. step on anyone's toes like, like Expo or whatever. So. As, as the world gets more normal, it gets harder to have the speakers come back. It was easy March and April of 2020 when they were locked in the house, but now we have to accommodate their needs. Yeah, it's going to be challenging, and I'm sure we're going to be moving dates around and stuff like that. Like from Saturday to Sunday, people are going to be switching, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll figure it out. Yep. Um, you know, one thing you haven't done yet today, you haven't thanked our sponsors. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, so before a break, maybe one of yes. you who made yes. all this possible. Let me bring up our sponsors. You're absolutely right. I apologize for that. It's been such an action-packed day here today on our very last day. Um, so let me pull that up so people can see. So there we go. So thanks to our sponsors for um, taking part in the conference and making it possible. Um, the lectures are actually kind of expensive to produce. The entire event is expensive to produce from getting the speakers and especially having them come back over and over again to the technology behind it and so forth. So it's, it's a lot. Uh, and we couldn't do it without our sponsors. They provide us with kind of the seed capital to get running here uh, each year. So thank you to them. I can quickly just go over. So thank you to Marco for sponsoring the live stream as usual. Um, they've done it from the beginning. They have a bunch of rebates and discounts and so forth that you can see on the screen. Uh, go into their booth to learn more. And also they're having that 0% uh, financing deal and deferred payments for six months, uh, as many, many companies are towards the end of the year. So you might want to check them out. Um, and again, they have a lot of specials on lean equipment that you can check out as well. So Optos, makers of the wide field camera. We've been talking a lot about wide field over the past day or two. Apparently, this is becoming, you know, a real thing that offices want to have. Um, you know, it used to be sort of an adjunct, right? When this was a new technology, I remember people were saying, well, what do I need that for? I have my little regular camera here. But no, this, the technology has advanced so much. Uh, and the pictures that you're getting are so good that it seems like a, a necessity these days in many offices. So thank you to Optos. They wanted to remind uh, everybody that they have social distancing available on their devices as well, as you can see here. I know many people haven't used the device in this way, right, where you're standing far back from people, but it can be done. Um, and so they just wanted to remind everyone. Um, also, year-end deals, if you're thinking about trading in a unit, this would be a good time to contact them as well. So thank you to Optos. Conan Medical, we had uh, Ian from Conan on yesterday, uh, just talking about the different devices and everything that they have going on uh, as well. But they also have some deals going on um, that he mentioned. So the Cellcheck specular microscope. Now, I know, Steve, you use the older version. There is a brand new yep. one that has come out, uh, apparently much faster than the old one. And um, you might want to go check that out. He was talking about how they have demos available. Yep. Uh, starting at $16,000 for the brand new unit, which is a steal relative to, to what it costs new. Well, the footprint, uh, it's like everything else. Um, I'll get an iPhone every six months also. <laughs> so definitely go check it out. They have these show specials and demos. Um, so thank you to Kona Medical. So Mackie Health, we had a, a good conversation with Jim Stringham yesterday, uh, all about lutein and zeaxanthin and talking about where the stuff comes from, how you know it's used, um, and talking about why the ARIDS formula might be considered by some to be obsolete, right? Because it doesn't have zeaxanthin in it. So, uh, and I didn't realize this, Steve, that there's there's not an ARIDS three coming. <laughs> this is it. Um, there was. So I wonder why. I mean, it, it took a lot of years, and there's a lot more information that we have that we didn't have before. The the yep. meso, the other components like zinc. I, I just don't. I know it's expensive, but um, the, that was now 15 years old. They, yep. So they yeah, data, so. I, I don't. I don't know. He said they're still analyzing the data from the last one, and there's not even one in process now for a third one. So, but anyway, he was talking about the mesozeaxanthin and how it wasn't included, but how they included in in Mackey Health supplement, um, and because clinically and, and looking at the science, it looks like it is very important to actually include. Um, so. Steve, you were uh, you, you've mentioned that that you're a big user of Mac Health in your practice, and I had the and question, myself. and I just want and and I want to confirm it. Uh, Mac Health is only available through eye care practitioners, and not through uh, mail order or anything else. You can go on the website and purchase the product directly because it is a vitamin; it's not a drug. Um, you can buy it um, directly from the website, but uh, you might get a better deal, frankly, purchasing it from the doctor. 
um, especially with his guidance on, on the use of it. So, no, you can buy it directly, not mail order, for, but through Mackey Health directly. Right, and it's not something you and, do to see and, at pharmacies. And basically, you take it like a vitamin. You take one a day, yep. even if your eyes are healthy. Well, it, it does several things. One, um, it helps to prevent macular degeneration, also helps to prevent progression. But because it gets that yellow pigment in front of the macula, people, and if you listen to John Nolan's lecture and his science and his research, people simply see better. So um, it's even, I've been using it for athletes, for example, who want to see a baseball better or something like that, because supposedly it just makes your overall visual performance and visual acuity better. Now, my, my office doesn't see um, 100,000 people a, a week to do a scientific uh, study, but uh, people have reported better vision. So it's used for visual enhancement as well as uh, the health of the eye. That's why I take it. Yep. My golf game is getting no better. <laughs> In fact, one of the but other things... But I can see my misses perfectly. So one, one thing that Stringham also told us was, you know, the amount of spinach one would have to eat or kale that one would have to eat is so excessive that no normal human would want to do it. Yeah. So this is why supplementation is important. So. You know where they get it, actually? Um, I don't know if he discussed that with you. Um, I was uh, on a jet plane, literally. <laughs> um, they get it from the marigolds in Mexico, and they distill it down, and that's where they get the meso zeaxanthin, which makes sense because it is a yellow pigment, and... Marigolds, last time I looked, were yellow. Yep. So that's the, the source of the product. Yep, pretty cool. Okay, so Lunar Technology is a platinum sponsor of the conference, and thank you to them for coming on. We've been doing a lot of work with them, actually, and exploring their, their technologies, um, including, you know, we did a webinar with them on standardizing uh, your practice with dry screening, which was cool. We had a talk about their eye refract system, and I did an interview, and I played it yesterday. I'll probably play it again today so people can see it, and obviously we're going to put it on on OD wire as well, since we just finished editing it, um, with Dr. Rasa, who started up 11 cold starts in Chicago. So <laughs> she literally opened up 11 offices around the city um, and tied them all together. She did it over a period of about three years and tied them all together using a digital refraction system, which is, which is to me, pretty impressive, right? I would never consider doing something like that because it sounds, frankly, insane to me. Uh, I don't have that kind of energy, <laughs> but, but she does. Um, and so it's amazing, yeah. it is kind of amazing. And so to make it work, she wow. needed a way to do a lot of stuff remotely. And she implemented this system called iRefract. And we, you know, I interview her about it um, and how she implemented it. So pretty cool stuff. So thank you to Luna for, for coming on board and sponsoring the conference. And again, if you go to lunotechusa.com slash CEY, you'll see a bunch of the resources uh, that they have um, are there that we've created this year. So Hog, makers of the octopus, and we have deals. They sent me some deals and you know, at the conference, so $2,500 mail-in rebate for the Octopus 600 Pro, uh, and then a bunch of deals on chair stands and stools uh, bundled together. So, so this is running just at the conference, so definitely go to their booth and contact them that way. The Neurovisual Medicine Institute, so they identify and treat patients with binocular vision dysfunction using fractional units of realigning prism. So the institute's a place where you can go to learn how to do this and implement it in your practice. So basically it's an intensive couple day course where you fly into, they're, they're, they're actually in suburban Detroit, so you fly into Detroit, you drive a half hour north, and there you are. And over a couple of days, you learn how to diagnose and treat this, and then importantly, how to market it to your patient base as well. So it differentiates you from other doctors in your area, and you're providing a service that many doctors really don't understand or, or aren't doing. So go to their booth, check them out, and then check out their website as well. Uh, tear care, we had Craig Thomas on yesterday talking all about heat and meibomian gland dysfunction. This is one of the systems that he uses, although it sounds like he's cornered the market in every single kind of device possible to treat MGD. Um, <laughs> so, but he has a great strategy, as he outlined to us, of, of when to use which device. Yep, it's so he, he, he tries to determine which patient would do best with each, and tear care is part of his strategy. So this is a small and affordable system, uh, different than sort of the, the ones where you'd pay, you know, fifty or $100,000. This is much smaller, portable. That thing that looks like a hockey puck is the size of a hockey puck. Um, you know, you pay for the consumables, but if, obviously if you're not using it, you're not paying for consumables. You pay as you go, so it's a variable cost. Um, so definitely go check them out. Their product, they have this thing called the Olympia study, which came out earlier in the year. Again, the pandemic put the kibosh on everything, but Olympia was published uh, just before that. 
and it sort of showed that the device has equal efficacy to other heating systems for treating M MGD, but it's much, much less expensive. So let's go check it out. Uh, VTI Natural View, so they make a, uh, a custom soft multifocal uh, that you can use as a multifocal uh, for presbyopes, or you can use it to treat uh, and do myopia management. Um, and we had Dr. Michaud on yesterday. Um, again, he, as he mentioned, th these soft lenses are sort of part of their overall strategy for doing myopia management. And I know, Steve, you use this lens as well. He does use it a lot because I missed that part also. Unfortunately, I had to be away, but he does use that probably as his go-to myopia control lens at this point. Yeah, so, you know, he was actually, it, it was an interesting just talking to him about his strategy, how, again, he uses multiple modalities, and soft lenses are just one part of what he uses. Um, and, you know, you really have to tailor the treatment to the patient. I was asking him, frankly, about the kids and their willingness to go along with all this stuff. Uh, I have an 11 year old, it's hard to get him to do anything sometimes. So I'm always amazed that kids are willing to go ahead uh, and engage in this. Not to talk my own horn, but I, I lectured with uh, Dr. Bolomar um, about five years ago, not four years ago at the academy, about the combination therapies. In other words, doing um, multifocal contacts and orthokeratology, and sometimes even atropine with the you know, high risk cases. Uh, you get a child who's seven years old, whose parents are minus 11, and they're minus three at that time, that's a high-risk patient that you don't want to go on to being a high, high myope. So that, he, he took up the uh, slack and has done all the research, but we just did it by the bootstraps at that point in time. Yep, and the research is getting better every day. So these are all tools that you yep. can use. So, so definitely check it out. Uh, Zeiss, so what more can I say about Zeiss? So they have been incredibly responsive in the face of this pandemic right from the beginning. Um, big supporter not only of the conference, but of eye care in general. So when the pandemic unfolded, they immediately started giving out shields, breath shields for slit lamps, not just for their own devices, but they'll fit on any slit lamp. Um, and they immediately started publishing huge amounts of educational material online that people could use, both how to sort of secure your practice uh, to make sure that you're as safe as possible. And, you know, frankly, just educational material that you'd have a hard time getting elsewhere because you can't travel, you're, everyone's been stuck. Um, so they have been really great right from the beginning. They virtualized their operations, so they didn't even have a little hiccup, even though everyone was working from home. Um, of course, their instruments had a lot of remote capabilities built into them from the beginning that, that most people never took advantage of, and now they are. So it was sort of fortuitous, right, that the devices actually had this capability, and now people are using it. Um, so they mentioned they have a couple bundles going on here that you want to go to, to their booth and talk to your reps about to try to get these discounts. The Retina bundle, which has the Claris, again, which is a wide field camera which, with incredible images, uh, and a choice of OCT unit, or a glaucoma bundle, which, uh, which is a perimeter of the HFA3, and a choice of OCT. Um, and again, they have trade-in discounts for those looking to upgrade their OCT units and for those looking to upgrade their fundus cameras. And what's hilarious about this of course, we we're talking to Craig Thomas. He took one look at the Claris 500 and said, I absolutely have to have one, and immediately bought one, even though he had multiple other fundus cameras around, and they're now just sitting in his garage. Um, he's retiring these old units. Of course, I, I, the, the immediate question is, why didn't you just trade it in? <laughs> Do you want a museum in your garage for these old units? So I'm not sure what he's planning on doing with them. <laughs> but... That's just him. So AVMAX, uh, makers of this uh, device for anterior blepharitis, a second generation device, um, clean all the junk off the lids before you actually get started uh, on other treatments. So this is an incredibly important thing to do and inexpensive too. Um, the device itself is relatively inexpensive. The consumables cost about half as much as the first generation device. Myco, uh, the company that makes it, has a bunch of deals going on. Go to their booth to see what the latest ones are. Uh, critically, um, if you've never gotten started with this before, they'll train you via Zoom. Uh, the device is actually not difficult to use. The treatment itself is not painful at all. It tickles a little bit. I've had it done a few times. Uh, it tickles, but it's, it's very easy. And in fact, your staff can learn to do it themselves. You can see a certificate up on the screen. Michael will create these digital certificates for you that you can then you know, have your staff hang on the wall or whatever to show people uh, that they're certified to use it. So NeuroLens, uh, makers of the device to manage misalignment between the two eyes, and then uh, the device spits out a prescription, and you can get custom lenses made with contoured prism from NeuroLens's lab. And they wanted to, 
to let everyone know that, you know, obviously now, now's the time to take advantage of Section 179 tax benefits. You can defer payments on the system for six months, uh, and they'll also issue a $500 lab credit when you dispense 10 pairs in a month, right? So if you have a volume of, of patients coming through, um, you can probably meet that, that lab credit. In fact, I should have asked Sue Resnick about it because I know they're big users of NeuroLens in their practice. Um, and I completely slipped my mind. I should have talked to her a little bit about it. Uh, but if you want to become a provider, go to hs.neurolenses.com slash become a provider uh, to jump on board or visit their booth. And Oculus, again, makers of a large number of devices. They've been with us since the beginning as well, so thank you to them. You know, devices like the Pentacam, which we started talking about a lot, um, and the Karatograph, which we've, again, spoken about a lot this past weekend in the context of dry eye. Um, you know, they make these, these multifunction devices that are like Swiss Army knives. Um, they also have a sale going on right now. I think this is still happening on uh, open box sale on the EasyField S. I'm assuming they still have some of these units left. I don't know for sure because, uh, again, it was an open box sale. So $59.95 plus a six-month warranty. EasyField is kind of a cool perimeter. Uh, you don't have to do it in the dark, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and it's very portable. Hard to see in that picture, but you can easily put it in the trunk of your car. Uh, if you're doing things at, let's say, nursing homes, very easy to carry. It's not a not a big hulking. I thing. would think they're getting people are upgrading to the newer versions with the better keratograph. So I think they're taking in the old ones. So I think they'll have a, a nice supply over the next uh, few months at least. Yep. So and that's the other really cool part about Oculus that I love. You know, they're a German company, but they're local-ish. Uh, you know, they're local to me actually. They're right up here in Seattle. That's where their service center is. So um, they have sort of this, the resources of a large multinational company, but a very sort of local feel. If you want to talk to the CEO of the company, he makes himself, the American leader of the company, he makes himself available all the time. Uh, you'll see him at trade shows all around, setting up the booth himself <laughs> with their staff. So he takes a real hands-on approach. If you have uh, questions about their software, or you want to see features implemented, they actually do take your feedback seriously. We have multiple doctors who sent them requests to build into the software, and you see it actually roll back out. Uh, into the devices, which to me is amazing. So they really are listening, so definitely check them out. And Science-Based Health, makers of HydroEye Supplement. Um, so again, Science-Based Health uh, looks to the latest available science when they're making their formulation, and they modify their formulations over time on their products too. As the science advances, so do they, which is a really cool thing. So you're not going to get a lot of hand-waving from them. If you have any questions about the science behind dry eye and supplementation, you can ask them and they will give you very pointed responses. Um, they know what they're talking about. So it's like Zach Denning, who we've had on here before, you know, is up on all the latest science. If you have any questions about the science, just email him because he's a huge resource and a, he knows a great deal about this topic, probably more than anyone I know. Um, so really, really good folks, easy to work with. So definitely check them out at Science Based Health. Covalent Careers, so this is the largest job site in eye care. If you want to look for a new job or if you want to post a job, right, if you're looking for an optician or another OD, this is the place to do it because their listings are syndicated everywhere, um, including at odwire.org. I can pull that up just to show you. Okay, so if you click on jobs, you'll see a listing. This is actually syndicated from their servers. So they put these listings like in a million different places. So um, if you post with them, you know it's not going to one place, it's going all over the place. So definitely check them out, um, worthwhile. They have 10% off if you, uh, from ODWire. So if you go to odwire.org slash jobs and then click um, here, 10% off all monthly job listings, you'll get 10% off when you want to list. And iCare Live, makers of a, a uh, telehealth system, uh, specifically for eye care. So again, if you've been doing telehealth over the course of the pandemic and you've been doing it sort of by hand and ad hoc with Zoom, it's probably best to implement a system you know, like iCare Live. There are others as well. But what they all do is really formalize the exam and give you a structure to put up and post your results and, and record them in a structured way, which you're going to need, right? Because reimbursements are going to be changing. Insurers and, and Medicare and so on and so forth are going to start demanding more documentation. They were very lenient when all this started, but you know, knock wood, the pandemic hopefully will be well contained and hopefully over by summer. And when that's the case, people are still gonna to expect to use telehealth and I have a feeling the third party payers are gonna want much more documentation. So a system like iCare Live can help you get that done without pulling your hair out. 
and iCare Pro, makers of software to help you market your practice online. They build websites, they'll help you with your social media presence, um, which is critically important, and things like Yelp and Google Maps, because um, you don't want to be that one practice that has one star. So when someone sees you on Google and they look on the map and they see that one star or two stars, they just you know, walk away. They'll show you how to actually get your rating up um, to get people who are your biggest fans to actually contribute reviews, which is sometimes the biggest problem, right? Because usually people only submit reviews when they're angry. <laughs> That's not what you want. You want to have good reviews up. So check out iCare Pro. Um, they can save you from a lot of misery of trying to do this yourself. Black Rivera, maker of punctal plugs. You can see their latest, whoops, latest discounts there we go, up online. Um, enter code CYR2020 at their site when you're ordering to get 10% off. Uh, you can see sort of the menu of stuff they have up there right now. And finally, Optometry Times, practical chair side advice. So um, the great Gretchen Bailey, who's been under the weather, so unfortunately she couldn't be with us here today, which is making me very sad because she's a fixture here with us. And uh, hopefully she'll start feeling yep. better soon and she'll be back back in action and hopefully when this pandemic all ends we'll have her back out here again um, and she can be by my side while we're while we're doing this uh, for the for next year's show uh, but anyway practical chair side advice so uh, as their name implies very practical journal uh, they give you little bite-sized chunks that you can use and implement in your practice quite easily ben casella is their chief optometric editor we interviewed him earlier in the day um, really good folks, easy to read. They don't expect you to build a shrine to optometry times in your office. Once you read the thing, especially on paper, chuck it out when you're done. Um, you're meant to, to use exactly what you take away from it uh, and not save it for another day. So check them out. And finally, Vision Equipment, Inc. So this is Leo Hadley's company. Unfortunately, Leo couldn't make it here to be with us today. I wanted to talk to him about all the stuff that he's got going on. But if you go to his booth, he's updated all the equipment that he has for sale because they handle refurbished equipment. So their inventory is constantly turning over, especially with COVID, right? We've had some office closures. So he's got a good inventory now of stuff. Um, he wanted to let everyone know that you can receive an extra 5% off orders placed this month by mentioning CYR 2020. Um, so go to his booth to learn more and see what he's got. One thing I can tell you about Leo is that he thoroughly refurbishes whatever he gets. Uh, and he's been doing this for a long time now. I think it's like 15 years, maybe longer, 20 years. Um, so he's, wow. he's a true expert at this. And uh, go to his website too, because they sometimes has fun videos of him, them you know, breaking equipment apart so you can see how refurbishing actually happens. It's pretty neat. All right, and I think that's it for our sponsors. And I will mention one more time that CUR 2021 is coming um, after our little vacation here. 64 credits, four live events, and one low price. So the idea is that essentially you're paying once to attend, and this is gonna be like a 100 day long event where you can choose to come to any one of the four events or all four of them. All the credits will be offered live at each one of the events. So if you want, you can come to one event, sit there for 16 hours, come back the next time, sit there for another 16, and so on and so on. So if you're brave enough, you can get 64 hours live. That's the theory. And you get it for one low price. We, we're not gonna nickel and dime people and make them register twice and so on and so forth. We want this to be affordable, particularly because the pandemic is still going on. And my personal feeling is that there won't be any significantly large in-person meetings until the summer. So that's, that's what I'm prognosticating. I don't know about you guys. Um, so that's why we picked yep, the dates. That I we agree. Did. So, all right. So that is all I have to say okay. for now. So I think we have a little break, and then we have a few more interviews, and then we're out of here. So why don't I play for you guys? You know, we we mentioned Upnik just a few minutes ago. We were talking about Tosis. Should we play Sue's uh, Tosis lecture um, just so people can see it if they haven't already to understand the disease process? That's what I loved about hers is it wasn't really so much about the drugs or anything else. It was also more of a lesson about ptosis itself and what to look for. Um, think I should play that one? I think it's a good idea, yeah. All right, yep. so let me get that one going, and I will see you guys. I guess we're picking up here in 45 minutes or so, I think. Yep. Um, all right, cool. So I will see you guys then. Okay, bye. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk on acquired blepharoptosis. We thank C.E. Wire for the opportunity to present on this uncommonly discussed topic. I'm here today with my co-presenter, Dr. Whitney Hauser. I'll be starting off the discussion by reviewing normal lid anatomy, the changes in structure and function which lead 
to blepharoptosis and an overview of the etiology and classification. Dr. Hauser is then going to take us through the clinical workup and conclude with an overview of current treatment and management options. These are our disclosures. Let's start by just reviewing eyelid structure and function. If you'll recall, the closure of the eyelids is facilitated by the circumferential orbicularis oculi muscle, which is innervated by the facial or seventh cranial nerve. The elevators of the upper eyelid are the levator palpebrae superioris and Mueller's muscle. The levator is the main upper eyelid elevator and is innervated by the ocular mo motor or third cranial nerve. It originates from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone and becomes fan-shaped and it extends through the aponeurosis as it enters the eyelid. It penetrates the orbital septum and extends into the upper lid, fanning out across the entire length and inserts on the anterior aspect of the tarsal plate. Mueller's muscle is a smooth muscle. It arises from the undersurface of the levator just posterior to the fornix and inserts into the superior tarsus. Mueller's muscle is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. The muscle is responsible for the over-elevation of the eyelid, such as when a patient becomes excited or feel fearful, and if the patient is fatigued or inattentive, it can lead to mild ptosis. So how do we define ptosis? Ptosis is an abnormal, low-lying or drooping upper eyelid margin with the eye in primary gaze. It's a common disorder. There are millions of individuals affected in the U.S. and worldwide. Severity is typically assessed based on the amount of measurable eyelid droop, and Dr. House is going to go into this in more detail a little bit later on, but just as an overview, if there is a droop of one to two millimeters, it generally leads to limited visual impairment, two to four millimeters with mild to medium visual impairment, and more than four millimeters with significant visual impairment. Blepharoptosis can be unilateral or bilateral, and based on the age of onset, we categorize it as either congenital or acquired. Acquired is typically associated with aging. So mechanically, ptosis is linked to the dysfunction of the muscles responsible for eyelid elevation. Loss of tonus in either of them will result in ptosis. Because the superior palpebral levator is the main retractor of the upper eyelid, deficiency in its function produces a more significant ptosis. The levator receives its innervation from the superior division of the third cranial nerve. Denervation of Mueller's muscle, on the other hand, will only cause a mild ptosis of about one to two millimeters. So what about epidemiology? How prevalent is this and in what populations? According to the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, eyelid surgery was fifth among the top plastic surgical procedures in the U.S. in 2018 at over 110,000 procedures. It is the most common surgical procedure in the 65 plus age group. This slide looks at the result of a retrospective chart review study on all patients referred for ptosis to the Oculoplastics Division at the University of Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary between 2007 and 2010. The final etiology for each patient's ptosis was determined based on history, standard eyelid measurements, and ancillary testing. And then they categorized it as aponeurotic, neurogenic, myogenic, traumatic, or congenital. And the demographics, including median age and sex, were analyzed for patients in each category as well. The ptosis um, clinical findings that they used were measurements of marginal reflex distance, levator function, palpebral fissure, and they used ancillary testing. For instance, single fiber electromyography and acetylcholine receptor antibody testing was used to help in diagnosing myasthenia gravis. Neuroimaging was used in cranial nerve 3 palsy, and Horner syndrome was tested for pharmacologically and then further investigated with imaging. And they concluded that a significant portion um, or proportion of patients referred with ptosis 
had more serious conditions such as neurogenic or myogenic ptosis. Thus, we as clinicians have to maintain a high degree of suspicion and thoroughly evaluate all patients with ptosis. We want to properly assess for underlying systemic conditions, and we're going to talk more about that shortly. But just keep in mind that the congenital group had the youngest median age at 10 and a half years, and the aponeurotic group had the oldest median age at 62 years. So how does ptosis impact patients' lives? I think we're all familiar with patients who come in and express dissatisfaction with cosmesis, um, but there are other things that patients will uh, experience as well. And while cosmesis may be the primary concern for some individuals with ptosis, more advanced cases are associated with visual field disruption, eyelid strain, altered head position in an effort to compensate, and headaches due to forehead and scalp muscle strain, and all of this can decrease a patient's quality of life. I know in my practice, a lot of times patients will come in just complaining that their eyelids feel really heavy, and they are actually aware of decreased visual function. So let's talk now about the causes of blepharotosis, and we're going to start by looking at congenital versus acquired. Congenital blepharoptosis is typically caused by developmental myopathy of the levator muscle. Acquired, on the other hand, is most often caused by stretching of the levator or disinsertion of the muscle complex from its insertion on the anterior to superior tarsal plate. But it can also be caused by reduced nervous input to the muscles that elevate the eyelid, and we call that neurogenic injury, which is traumatic, excess skin or heaviness of the eyelid, which is mechanical, and then there are certain cases, they're not as common, they're quite rare, where there's actually primary muscle dysfunction, such as in certain forms of muscular dystrophy, uh, which we call myotonic dystrophy or myogenic blepharoptosis. So an overview of aponeurotic ptosis clinically, how do these patients present? You'll see a reduced MRD1, which we call margin to reflex distance. You will see a high upper eyelid crease. There will be near normal levator function, and there will be decreased palpebral fissure in down gaze. So as the patient looks down, the palpebral fissure actually reduces at a higher rate than somebody who does not have levator dysfunction. In myogenic and congenital ptosis, you'll see a weaker absent eyelid crease. You'll see poor levator function and again, eyelid lag on down gaze. So this is just a schematic um, on how to break down congenital versus acquired. You'll see that congenital will define as occurring or diagnosed at birth to about a year, and then acquired um, from a year on. And in both categories, we can further subdivide them into isolated and non-isolated. So let's first talk about congenital ptosis. It's ptosis that's present as bir at birth, as we said, or within the first year of life, and it's most commonly isolated, which means it's not associated with other ocular findings. In about 75% of the cases, it's unilateral. The majority of congenital ptosis is due to myogenic descent, dysgenesis of the levator muscle. It most often does not affect vision, but in severe cases, the drooping eyelid may occlude all or part of the pupil and may interfere with vision, resulting in amblyopia. Congenital ptosis may occur through autosomal dominant inheritance. So when we see a child with um, ptosis, we want to be sure we are finding any underlying cause. It may be a good idea to question the parents about other relatives having been born with a lid problem, and certainly we want to address it to prevent any potential amblyopic changes. To briefly review other possible causes of um, isolated congenital ptosis. There's something called synkinetic ptosis, which many of us will remember as Marcus Gunn jaw winking syndrome. And if you recall, that's a rare congenital ptosis, and it's due to an aberrant, aberrant innervation of the levator muscle by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So what happens is there's a brisk upper eyelid retraction when the person is chewing, smiling, or sucking, and often the parent will notice this 
right after birth when they're feeding the child. In aponeuroticosis, that's a congenital defect results from a failure of the aponeurosis to insert on the anterior surface of the tarsus from birth, and it can follow a forceps delivery, and the skin may remain, the skin crease may remain normal or high, depending on where the aponeurosis is affected. The levator function is generally good, and there is no lid lag on down gaze. And to review just a few of the causes of non-isolated congenital ptosis, that may be due to close embryological development of the levator and the superior rectus muscles. Congenital ptosis may be associated with superior rectus weakness. And then there is a congenital form of Horner's syndrome which can occur in infancy, which also presents, just like in adulthood, with ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and progressive heterochromia. Again, the lighter colored iris will be ipsilateral to the affected side, and the lesion may occur anywhere along the oculosympathetic pathway. So in these patients, it's important to evaluate for possible etiology, such as congenital varicella, tumors of the neck and mediastinum, and vascular lesions of the internal carotids or subclavian artery. And then there's congenital third cranial nerve palsy, which may be partial or complete, and it may present with uh, ptosis together with other signs, such as the inability to depress, elevate, or adduct the eye, and the pupil may, may be dilated. So let's focus now on acquired blepharitosis, which is the main subject of our talk from this point on. Acquired blepharoptosis is typically associated with aging. A study of 400 patients in the UK found that blepharoptosis was present in over 11% of adults age 50 and older. And if we extrapolate this to the United States population, this prevalence corresponds to an estimated 13 million patients age 50 plus in 2020. Other known risk factors, either temporary or permanent, include ocular surgery, and this can include glaucoma surgery, cataract surgery, corneal strabismus, which can lead to temporary or permanent blepharoptosis. Contact lens wear, wearing hard or soft contact lenses, has been found to increase the incidence versus no contact lens wear, and one potential mechanism would be levato aponeurosis dehiscence due to the method of hard contact lens removal. And then, of course, we always have to be suspicious for underlying disease, <clears throat> such as myasthenia gravis or diabetes. <clears throat> as previ previously discussed, you know, similar to congenital ptosis, acquired ptosis may be categorized as isolated or non-isolated. The most common cause of isolated acquired ptosis is aponeurotic. It's most common in adults. The abnormality is in the levator. There is a dehiscence, disinsertion, or stretching. It can occur in younger patients as well. In younger patients, as mentioned, repeated manipulation of the upper eyelid during contact lens wear, and this can occur in both hard and soft lens wearers, may cause disinsertion of the levator. It occurs frequently after ocular surgery and following trauma. There are some other causes, though, and that can include eyelid trauma from an infection or allergy, blepharochalasis, pregnancy, chronic use of topical steroids, and frequent lid rubbing. Mechanical ptosis is caused by excess weight of the upper lid. There are a multitude of causes that can easily be dis distinguished on physical exam. A few common causes are edema, inflammation, tumors, chalasia, dermoid cysts, neurofibromas, and amyloid deposits. And scarring from inflammation, surgery, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or ocular pemphigoid can also lead to mechanical ptosis. Always perform orbital imaging in patients with an underlying mass or infiltrative lesion. Acquired traumatic ptosis can develop as the result of any trauma to the orbit. 
Traumatic ptosis can be neurogenic, aponeurotic, myogenic, or mechanical in nature. Iatrogenic causes account for roughly 50% of traumatic blepharitis. And traumatic ptosis has been reported to account for 11.2% of blepharoptosis in a tertiary care oculoplastic setting. And there was a study that showed 4% to 12% after cataract surgery procedures. And there's about 10 to 12% after trabeculectomy alone and combined trabeculectomy phacoemulsification. The causes can include disinsertion of the levator muscle or damage to the levator tendon with scar formation. Alternatively, cranial nerve 3 damage can also sustain damage leading to the ptosis. In severe cases that result in significant damage to the levator, patients may require multiple surgeries with a poor probability of restoring natural eyelid anatomy. Patients who are at increased risk for cranial nerve 3 involvement Includes those, include those with head trauma injuries, post-traumatic cavernous sinus thrombosis, orbital apex fractures, and nerve compression by foreign bodies. Patients with CN3 damage will typically resolve on their own with time and should be observed, observed for spontaneous recovery over a period of three to six months before considering surgical intervention. As we mentioned, rigid lens-induced eyelid ptosis is a well-established condition. It's thought to be caused by years of mechanical traction from pulling the lids while removing the lens. Patients can typically resume wear of their lenses two to six weeks after surgery and are instructed to use a plunger. Some patients, however, may best be suited for a soft lens refit. An update in the contact lens parameters may be necessary after surgery due to the change in eyelid and lens dynamics, so you want to warn patients that their lenses may sit differently. They may have more problems wearing their lens, even if the lens is in exactly the same positions, and patients may feel drier and have more trouble wearing their lenses after surgery. Investigators compared the rate of hard lens wearers lens users in ptosis cases with that in a control group and then estimated the odds ratio. So the study you see here included all patients aged between 30 to 60 years who were seen with aponeurotic ptosis. And it was, ptosis was defined as a margin reflex distance of both eyes that was less than or equal to 1.5 millimeters. And the controls were subjects with an MRD of both eyes that was more than or equal to 3 millimeters. And the, the control subjects were selected from an age-matched group of female hospital employees. And they concluded that the pathogenesis was, induced ptosis is aponeurogenic and is similar to the involutional changes that are associated with attenuation or disinsertion of the aponeurosis from its distal insertion in the eyelid. As we discussed earlier, before treating blepharoptosis, it's important to conduct a differential diagnosis to identify any potentially serious underlying cause. Because in some cases, ptosis can be a sign of more serious cause, a focused neurological exam should be carried out on patients. And serious conditions masquerading as blepharoptosis can include Horner's and myasthenia gravis. If Horner syndrome is suspected, pharmacological testing with eye drops such as hydroxyamphetamine um, and iapidine and imaging may be an important part of detecting the underlying cause. Myasthenia gravis is a unilateral or bilateral ptosis with upper eyelid position variability that is often accompanied by diplopia and or strabismus. And those with myasthenia gravis could also have respiratory compromise or a concurrent thymoma. A history of intermittent diplopia and worsening symptoms throughout the day suggesting fatigability should increase our suspicion for myasthenia gravis. And in 85% of patients with myasthenia, the initial symptoms were either ptosis or diplopia. The gold standard for diagnosis is serologic confirmation of autoantibodies to the acetylcholine receptors, as well as electrophysiologic studies. 
Um, so there are bedside tests such as edrophonium and prostigmine that result in temporary elevation of the totic eyelid. Also, cooling the affected eyelid with an ice pack for two minutes may also result in temporary reversal of the ptosis. The sensitivity of edrophonium testing and ice pack testing is roughly 80% for each test. Treatment with cholinesterase inhibitor medication often improves the ptosis, and surgery may be considered when medical therapy fails. Other non-isolated neurogenic conditions include chronic external ophthalmoplegia and ocular motor or third nerve palsy. Chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia is characterized by symmetric bilateral ptosis and ophthalmoparesis, and the patients are usually in their 30s. A family history showing a maternal inheritance pattern, imaging studies to rule out other possible causes, and a muscle biopsy can aid in diagnosing this. It's a mitochondrial disease. Because, because CPEO may be associated with Kern-Sayre syndrome, these patients often warrant additional workup for cardiac conduction defects and pigmentary retinopathy. Another cause of myogenic ptosis can be medication-induced, typically steroid or tenofovir. These have been described in the literature and, stre and stresses the importance of reviewing a patient's medication. Ocular motor nerve palsy is characterized by ptosis accompanied by ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, and poorly reacted dilated pupil, and can be a result of ischemic injury or aneurysm. CN3 palsy may necessitate imaging to rule out a compressive etiology. So let's just take a look at a couple of cases here. The upper image shows CN3 palsy. So just recall that the ocular motor nerve innervates the medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus, and inferior oblique. It also innervates the levator palpebrae and carries sympathetic innervation from the edinger westphal nucleus. So dysfunction can result from ischemia, infection, compression, trauma, and demyelating disease such as multiple sclerosis. Some patients may present with any combination of ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, and a poorly reactive dilated pupil. The ptosis may actually be profound. So when seeing a patient with um, CN3 palsies, you have to differentiate between complete and incomplete. Um, in other words, pupil sparing and pupil involved. Pupil sparing CN3 palsy is commonly due to ischemic injury in patients with vascular risk factors such as hypertension or diabetes. In older patients, typically older than age 55, giant cell arteritis needs to be considered. Pupil involving third nerve palsy often indicates a, comp a compressive etiology because the parasympathetic fibers supplying the pupil travel on the outer, more easily compressed portion of the nerve. And these should be attributed to compression from a posterior communicating artery aneurysm until proven otherwise. So therefore, they warrant urgent investigation. You want to send these patients out right away for computed tomography angiography or magnetic resonance angiography. The lower image shows Horner's syndrome with a classic triad including unilateral ptosis, ipsilateral meiosis, and anhydrosis. And since Mueller's mus muscle only contributes to one to two millimeters of lid retraction, the associated ptosis is mild. The syndrome results from damage anywhere along the sympathetic pathway, which can be divided by first-order neurons. That would be hypothalamus to spinal cord, second-order neurons, which is the spinal cord to the superior cervical ganglion, and the third-order neuron, which is the superior cervical ganglion to the orbit. So it's important to determine which order neuron is involved because Horner's syndrome secondary to involvement of the first or second order neurons may be caused by underlying malignancy. The diagnosis of Horner's syndrome is confirmed if a apiclonidine drop testing results in reversal of anisocoria. And then you use hydroxyamphetamine drop testing to localize the level of dysfunction. The drop will result in pupillary dilation if the dysfunction is at the level of the first or second order neurons, 
while no dilation will occur if the third neur order neuron is affected. So now Dr. Hauser will conclude this section on differential diagnosis by talking about pseudoptosis, and then she'll take us through the clinical uh, evaluation of ptosis patients and talk about current therapies. Dr. Hauser. Now, what is our differential diagnosis for pseudotosis? Pseudotosis, again, you're having that upper lid droop and the absence of pathology of the upper eyelids. So what are our options here? Our causes can be dermatoshelasis, brow ptosis, superior sulcus deformity, microophthalmus, and hemifacial spasm. What we're going to do next is take each of those piece by piece and kind of unravel them a little bit and figure out which one of these may be impacting our patients. First, let's look at dermatoshelasis. Dermatoshelasis is redundant or sagging eyelid skin. Depending on what your practice is or where your practice is, odds are you're seeing this almost every day. The patient population that I primarily work with is patients, generally speaking, 50 and up. I see dermatoshelasis all day, every day. So it's an important thing to identify in our examination. Manual lifting allows for assessment of that positioning of the under eyelid skin. And the reason that's important is, and we'll find out later as we look at brow ptosis, it can really be a differentiating factor between true dermatoshelasis and more of a brow ptosis. Now the prevalence of this in individuals over the age of 45 is about 16% and it affects males more than females. Now, why are we seeing these changes? We're seeing this because we're living longer, and the longer we live, the more chronic problems that we have and more involutional eye problems that are identified. Now, with dermatoshelasis, there can be a couple causes to that. It can be the traction, due to the contraction of the orbicularis muscle over time, but there's also a second part, and it's the second part that really is, is not a friend to any of us, and that's gravity. So gravity can also play a role in it. So we're looking at traction and gravity uh, to play a role in dermatoshelasis. And eventually we're gonna see a change or a loss of that quality and quantity of elastic tissue in the skin that causes those lids to kind of droop. All these factors ultimately are gonna result in a lowering, particularly of the lateral one third of the eyebrow and that excess skin kind of weighting it down on that lateral corner of the upper eyelid. So the thing about dermatoshelasis, not unlike what I said about ptosis in the beginning, is dermatoshelasis has a cosmetic concern to the patients. The patients have those droopy eyelids and that, that dull appearance. However, they also can be subject to ocular irritation, and sometimes this goes unnoticed uh, clinically. So why do they have ocular irritation? It can be secondary to chronic blepharitis. They can also have dry eye issues. And sometimes misdirected lashes can also cause problems for the patient. Additionally, dermatoshelasis can cause a reduction in both superior and temporal field of vision and quality of vision changes as well. So there can be definite visual impacts both from how the patient sees and how the patient feels. Now, it's fairly predictable that you're going to see as the margin reflex distance measured in millimeters decreases, you're going to see an increase in the percentage of superior visual field loss. But this study proves that uh, point for us. So as you can see here, as the lid goes lower and lower, you see an increase in the percentage visual field loss. Now, what this study doesn't say, but other studies have found, is that you can also have a decrease in contrast sensitivity with some of these patients who have dermatoshelasis. And there have actually been reports of significant improvement in contrast sensitivity of patients undergoing blepharoplasty surgery for dermatoshelasis. So it actually can improve the quality of that patient's vision. Now, why does that happen? The proposed explanation is that that redundant or heavy skin that overlays the eye actually blocks some of the light entering the eye and can cause some level of diffraction. So having a surgical opportunity to go in and resolve that, it's not just an aesthetics component. It's not even just a visual field potential improvement, but the patient may actually have better quality of vision as well.
Now I mentioned brow ptosis a little bit. We're gonna talk about some of the etiologies of that and then how you can evaluate for it clinically to see if your patient is suffering from a brow ptosis or perhaps dermatoschelasis. So as you see here, there's several different etiologies. Number one, involutional changes. Number two, secondary to weakness of paralysis of frontalis. Now, what does that mean for us? You know, this could be patients who have Bell's palsy, maybe an acoustic neuroma, surgical trauma, it could be a birth trauma, or it can even be congenital. Now, I've had a couple patients that have fallen in this particular category. I've had a patient with an acoustic neuroma and one with surgical trauma who's ultimately had a brow ptosis due to those uh, two factors. The other possibilities there under the secondary uh, weakness of paralysis is uh, myotonic dystrophy. You can also have uh, myasthenia gravis, a lot of different options. You also may have patients who have brow ptosis associated with neoplasm, as you can see here, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell, uh, and so forth. Now, how do we do that differential diagnosis testing? This is, you know, really easy test to do in clinic, uh, requires no special equipment, but it's really valuable. And perhaps some of you are already utilizing this, but as you can see here, we have a patient uh, on the left, this is the same individual, but patient's image on the left is his natural lid posture. And you can see the, the brows look a little lower. Normal brow uh, is gonna sit above the superior orbital rim. So we do see that little bit of lowering of the brow. Again, male brows tend to be lower than female brows typically. Uh, but what we see in this, the second image, the image to the right, you have to kind of take a peek right up at the edge of the top of that image where you can see some fingertips that are in there. What we have here is the, is the patient's brow is manually being lifted. You're seeing it elevated. So it, maybe that front talus isn't fully engaged. And when we manually lift it and stabilize, you can see that there's a resolution of what appears to be an acquired ptosis. So we don't even have a frank uh, dermatoschelasis in this patient. If you look at it at just face value in that image on the right, one may interpret that as a dermatoschelasis. However, with elevation of that brow, you can definitely see that it's not exactly so much about those heavy sagging lids as it is the brows not really fully engaged and lifting the brows as they should. Now with superior sulcus deformity, now this is not something that I personally see a lot of in clinical practice, primarily because this is gonna be a, a cosmetic problem in an anophthalmia patient. So as you can see here, our patient, uh, the, the left eye is, uh, posture has more of a, an inophthalmos is pointing downwards. And part of that can be because a lot of these patients are subject to orbital floor, floor fracture. They've had fracture, this has been corrected. This is their, now, their posture or, or from a prosthetic. And as you can see, there's a different exposure of the lid. So she's got a heavy kind of hooded lid over on the right eye. The left eye you can see has more of a totic type posture. So not something, again, that I've seen a lot of clinically, but it's definitely something that you may encounter. Uh, and it can also have that displacement because there's just changes in the volume of bone and orbital fat. Um, Microophthalmists, again, as I already identified, many of my patients that I see are in that uh, older patient population, 50 and up. And I don't see a lot of pediatric patients like you see here, but just taking a look at this uh, patient's reflex, you can see that the MRD1 or that reference distance or reflex distance in the left eye is gonna, have a, is gonna be smaller than it is in the right. So measuring from the reflex to the lid margin, we're seeing what appears to be uh, an atosis, but may not necessarily be identified as that. As we look at the etiology of microophthalmus, Frankly, the, the precise etiology of it really is unknown. Um, however, there are some factors that may play a role, and many of those tend to be environmental or hereditary factors. So what would those be? It could be the maternal age, if the mom is over 40 at the time of birth, multiple births, low birth weight, and gestational age. And it could be gestational acquired infections, which I'll go through here in just a moment, some of those specifics or exposures and deficiencies. So if you have a patient with microophthalmos, 
you definitely want to get a good birth history and pregnancy history from the mom to see kind of what might have been risk factors for this particular child and you know what some of the gestational and acquired infections are there's several of them uh, most commonly you're going to see uh, risk factors like rubella toxoplasmosis and varicella you may also see cytomegalovirus as a risk factor parvo b19 even influenza virus which is definitely of all those that i've listed so far probably the most common that we would expect someone to be exposed to and coxsackie a9 in terms of the deficiencies or exposures the mother may have encountered during pregnancy vitamin a deficiency fever hyperthermia uh, exposure to x-rays, solvent misuse, and exposure to other drugs like thalidomide and warfarin as well as alcohol. So again, getting a good case history in these patients is really important to have better understanding perhaps the origins of their microophthalmia. Hemifacial spasm. Now, hemifacial spasm, and we're going to kind of go through this as it relates to our, our image there on the right, but first of all, a little bit about the, the patients that are most at risk. So more frequently in middle-aged women or elderly women, uh, more commonly amongst an Asian patient population, and you know, really what happens first is the first symptoms tends to be an intermittent lid twitch that can ultimately lead to a forced closure. So this is above and beyond our typical myokymia that patients experience. So patient comes in with a lid twitch, we hear this all the time, and they say, you know, this started, frankly, it can be really alarming to a patient when they experience myokymia, and we're usually recommending things like lower your stress level, rest more, uh, decrease your caffeine consumption. However, for hemifacial spasm, it's really taking it to a whole new level. So again, you get that forced lid closure, and you can even see that spreading of the, uh, of the uh, spasm into the lower face. And you, as you can see here in our, our image, the patient's mouth is drawn to one side. This can be related to nerve injury or tumor. However, many of them are without known apparent cause. So you may not know the, the etiology of this, and uh, which can be really tough for the patient because then sometimes it's harder to know when this could resolve. Now, as we look at assessing acquired blepharitosis, so from a clinical perspective, how do we not only identify our acquired blepharitosis, but how do we make quantitative and qualitative assessments of this? Now, one of my favorite tests for this is the marginal reflex distance, or MRD1, and we've talked a little bit about that already, but just to kind of circle back and, and hit on that one more time, as you can see here in the illustration, MRD1 measures from the corneal reflex to the upper lid margin. Now, MRD2 measures from the corneal reflex down to the lower lid margin, but in assessing acquired blepharitosis, we're going to be focusing on MRD1. Now that marginal reflex distance, again, is really important because it's giving greater precision than measuring strict total fissure height. I know a lot of clinicians like to measure just fissure height, but you're really getting a, again, more clear assessment by measuring that MRD1. Additionally, in my own clinical practice, I'll use visual field testing, and we're gonna go through those various types here in just a minute. Uh, I have not leaned as much on levator function and the eyelid crease height, which is used in superior sulcus deformity evaluation. With the levator function, what you're doing is assessing by firmly pressing on the brow and measuring the distance moved by the upper lid margin when the patient shifts from downward gaze to upward gaze. So just food for thought about how you might want to incorporate this differently into your practice as you're evaluating a patient uh, with acquired blepharitosis. As I mentioned, some different visual field types. We're pretty familiar with all of these, Goldman Visual Field, Humphrey Visual Field, and LPFT. However, you know, many of us in clinic are using the, the Humphrey Visual Field type of, of analyzer. It's, it's sort of a, a mainstay, if you will, of clinical care. One of the things that I would say in terms of a ptosis patient, I might potentially rely on a Goldman visual field in a few cases. If a patient has some mobility issues, if they have trouble concentrating, 
you know, some of my elderly patients, and, and these folks are ones that are going to be more subject to that acquired blood protosis, they may need that little bit of extra time to get the precise measurements that we want. So, you know, I might kind of go towards a, a Goldman visual field for that subset. So all of these work for, for measuring what we need to do in terms of superior field, but they do it a little bit differently. Again, Goldman being our kinetic perimetry versus our static perimetry with our HVF and LPFT. Now, what about severity? You know, as you look at these illustrations here, the first one you might look at and say, no big deal. Okay, and we're going to end that video right now, and I'm going to see if uh, Paul and Steve are back. Paul, Steve, are you back? I'm, I'm back. Excellent. Alexa, Alexa woke me up. <laughs> I don't know that one. Alexa, there you go. Stop. <laughs> uh -huh. <sighs> that's, that's my company for the day. <laughs> that's pretty sad. <laughs> well, you know. Um, you got to get to someone that likes you wherever you can get it. Oh, there so. you go. So Steve <laughs> should be back momentarily, <clears throat> I assume, and then we are going to have another guest. Let me uh, pull this on up. Yep. Uh, looks like I'm here. Hi. Oh, Melissa, you're, you're here. <laughs> Thank you for. Hi. You got here. You got here right on time. Awesome. Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. So how's it going, Melissa? Going. Yeah. Going just fine. <laughs> so uh, you're all set for your class. You have a class today, right? Oh, it just ended. Yep. Oh, how oh, did it, it, go? Ended. Oh, how did it well, go? Yeah, it was good. You know, I like the positivity um, from all these lectures. Like the audience, they always they're very nice. So did you, did you have an audience? Does <laughs> anyone show uh, up? Yes, I, I had you know? positive. No, no. I mean, I, I was just communicating with the people, and they said nice things. So it's always it's nice to receive a little feedback well, you know, from these online lectures. Yeah, and it's amazing too that we're still getting people showing up, right? Because we've only done this like how many times now? Um, <laughs> Eighteen or something. Yeah, time. I mean, it's been crazy, <laughs> but people are still yeah. showing up. So I but guess. Melissa, I, yep. I was in Melissa's uh, room, and she had quite a few. She had over two hundred people. Oh my gosh! Counting. Really? Really? Um, yeah. Well, this is the you know last guest for credits. So, uh, and, and when you get somebody like Dr. Barnett, you, you, you don't want to miss it. Wow, well, that's awesome. <laughs> no, it's it's nice, and I I was saying I really like all the positivity, and you know I think it's it's really nice to at least have some interaction with the participants. So, yeah. well done. And and people do ask questions. Oh yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. So the. And that, that anonymity is a wonderful thing. People are not afraid that in, <laughs> in the classroom, no one is what's going to go, get up there and ask questions. Right. So here is it's okay. Right. And, and there's even and there's people from all over the world that have attended these lectures. So that's pretty cool, too. Nice. Yeah. They, they do yeah. it in the middle of the night. It's, it's remarkable. Right. So, you know, Melissa, you are, you gave a talk, and I guess you gave it multiple times now, all about the nutritional approach to dry eye. Um, and it's funny, we had uh, one of the research scientists who works on one of the supplements. He, he actually helps them with Mackey Health. And he was saying that, like, on, on you know, to get the equivalent amount of um, lutein, you know, from his product, you have to eat, like, I don't even know how much spinach, like a kale, enough so you just want to, you know, you wish you were dead. Um, and I'm kind of curious, you know, when we're talking about nutrition and dry eye, how, you know, there's this perception, at least in supplementation, that, you know, you, you get mega amounts in small amounts. But can you actually get a lot of what you need just from food as well? Well, yes, you know, there are a variety of food items that you can do. Of course, the supplements will give you all of that. But it's interesting when I'm talking to some of my patients they're, they're kind of hesitant to, to take supplements. Um, there are also patients who are hesitant to use any sort of, say, prescription eye drop as well. So we can talk about all sorts of um, dietary uh, intake as far as supplements, but you probably don't want to be eating like fish 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, for other reasons as well. Right. And then we know that other things like flaxseed are not as effective. So that's why taking a good quality supplement is pretty important. 
Right, because I would imagine that, that most people, even if they think they're eating pretty well, if you really looked at what they're eating, they probably aren't getting enough of what they need, right? Because not everyone, you know, has exactly. fish all the time, right? I mean, most people, it's probably very rare. As a matter of fact, if any of you are watching the uh, TV series called The Crown, uh, there was a complaint uh, by some of the royalty that all they can get at Buckingham Palace is salmon. <laughs> That seems to be the food that they, they seem to eat there. So, yeah. so maybe Queen Elizabeth well, knows something. Well, I've heard good things about that show, but I haven't seen it myself. See, see, well, Paul, you got to you know, what happens. You want to really start it from the beginning, so it's a commitment. So Paul missed the point of that, though, that they, they were complaining about the fish, but then the one who didn't complain was one of her favorite kids, right? They were trying to show you the contrast, how about the favorites won't complain about the fact that she always makes them eat salmon, right? So that that was the that's that's <laughs> yep absolutely so even though it looks like they're having wonderful meals there it's always salmon yep so <laughs> I call my but wife have salmon every well, night because <laughs> I did because you you you're off of everything right you don't eat red meat but were you still like eating chicken <laughs> uh, limited so it's like the Mediterranean yeah Mediterranean diet with mostly fish and. Because my wife doesn't eat fish, and I don't eat red meat. We meet at chicken once a week, um, I so see. I can still so, stay married. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> the, the problem is, Melissa, is it, that um, at least fish oil has gotten a bad rap because the old formulations are even some of the stuff out there now. People burp and whatever. But I know what you're um, offering the patients are, are far better without any side effects. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. And do you know what was funny in this? Uh, presentation, I have a picture of all the options of fish oil that you can get when you look at a store. And I was actually at a, a different store last week with even a greater number of options. And so I took a picture. And so when I give this lecture next time, I'm going to put that in there. But there are so many different options. And so that's why I think that doctors should recommend something specific uh, to their patients so they're not overwhelmed. Sometimes patients have no idea. You know, they look and they might be taking something that they might think is good and or they might have omegas, say, in their multiple vitamins. And so, of course, you don't want to overdo it. But having an omega that has something like GLA in it is really beneficial. Uh, some patients who can't swallow pills, having a liquid version is another option. Uh, of course, there are options for those who are vegan as well. So having, I think, a the doctor should recommend, just like we recommend anything else, uh, say eye drops or contact lenses or solutions, it should really come from the doctor, the specific recommendation. And then, of course, you know, those patients who are prescribed an omega from, say, their cardiologist or someone else, we want to make sure that we're not uh, overdoing it for our patients, that they're not having to take too many omegas. So, so coordinating with other specialists, whether it's primary care, cardiology, et cetera. All of those things are helpful. Yeah. I think one of the big challenges that people have, if you're not an expert in this field, it's almost impossible to know what's legit and what's not when you're looking at it in the supermarket. I mean, I know that I haven't studied this that extensively. So when I go to the supermarket and I see all the fish oils, I just, I, I just shake my head. I'm like, I really have no idea where this fish was from, what this company is, and how it works. So I'm sure if I'm having this much trouble, someone who has no training at all must be having real trouble. Exactly, definitely. So I'll, I'll show you all that picture later, but it's, it was, I mean, it really blew my mind too, you know, because I, I was looking for something different, but I saw this whole entire wall thinking, you know, patients are just so overwhelmed. Right. And the same thing if we talk about artificial yeah. tears, you know, if a patient right. goes to a store, there's so many different versions. They don't know about the preservatives. They don't know about the AK and the artificial tears. And so educating our patients, I think, is really important. Absolutely. And, you know, one other problem I think that you probably run into a lot is that people, you know, they don't necessarily want to change what they're doing. Um, and how do you actually get around that? Because it's changing people's behavior, I think, is one of the, the very hardest things you can do, particularly because when you're encountering someone, you, you see them so infrequently, right? You might see them once every few months. So how do you actually go about doing it, trying to make these suggestions and having it stick? Yes, that's a good point. Um, 
I, I kind of like to tie in the science uh, behind everything. And of course, different patients are different. But if I can state some studies specifically for their condition, say Sjogren syndrome, uh, for example, uh, that's one uh, where I find that omegas are really helpful for my patients. I also have that clinical experience that I'll share with my patients that this is this has worked for so many of my patients. And then I'll put a timeline for some patients. They they feel more comfortable that, okay, I think I could try this for you know three months or six months, something like that, that I don't have to do it for my whole entire life. They get a little bit scared, like you're wanting to make a change for my life, for my whole entire life. But if I put a specified time point, and then I do see the patient back um, now with COVID, it could be uh, by video visit or an in-person appointment, but I see them back and we, and we talk about it. And it's kind of amazing. Even this week, I had three different patients this week who said, I can't believe it. After just a few days, my eyes felt incredibly better, so much better. And then after a month or so, they felt even better. So I think that's one thing as far as, as supplements. When it comes to a patient's diet, um, that's tough. You know, that, that is continually um, talking to my patients. I think that my dry eye and probably my specialty contact lens patients uh, like to communicate with me. Uh, quite a bit. And I do, we have messaging where we can message back and forth. So if they have a question about something, they're going to ask, they're going to, you know, ask me a question, or if, if, if something's not working, they're going to let me know that as well. So we actually have more frequent communication, which is probably better for the patient. Um, but when it comes to diet, I have one patient recently where she has severe dry eyes. They're so incredibly severe, but she also has this soda drinking habit, mm. which she, at one point I got her to kind of cut it down, <laughs> maybe not discontinue altogether, but she cut it down. She increased her water. Uh, herbal tea is a great uh, alternative as well. But then when I saw her last time, it came back, stress of COVID, et cetera. Mm. And so now she's drinking far more soda, which has not helped her systemic health yeah, either. The, her eyes yeah, that, that's are worse. The, the Diet Coke people. You know, I was just looking. I ran out into the, my bathroom while we were talking, and I am addicted to krill oil, not fish oil. You know, the, from I guess it's fish oil that I get from uh, from Costco from Kirkland, and I, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure if it helps dry eyes because there's nothing on the bottle. So my question is, do some of these supplements help you by saying good for? Here it says, help support a healthy heart and superior absorption. But it says nothing about dry eyes. So do any of these yeah. specifically say dry eyes on them? Well, uh, something like Hydra-Eye with all of the studies that show that it benefits dry eyes, that's you know, something that uh, can help. There are other ones like uh, the Nordic Natural Pro Omega. They also have the GLA formulation. Uh, but yes, there are different types of omegas. And so some of them are, are really not beneficial at all uh, for those who have dry eyes. Yep. So, so krill oil, even but though that's, that's, you don't, you don't but, but I, I do want to share the, the, the ending to that story of the patient with the soda. So we had a big long talk to, to kind of answer the question. We had a long talk. We talked about how her eyes felt better before when she could reduce her soda intake and really how it's affecting uh, her systemic health as well. And that's also something I think is very important right now during this pandemic, because a lot of people are under a lot of stress and not exercising or eating as they should. And, I'm I'm seeing a lot of detrimental findings in my clinic. I'm sure others are as well. Absolutely. One one interesting thing okay. about the, the pandemic, of course, is, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people are like me, at least here in the Portland area and probably in California where you are too, a lot of people are getting groceries delivered to their homes. And to me, the funny thing about that is, of course, you're ordering it online and you actually get to physically see what it is that you are ordering. <laughs> <laughs> and it really puts it in stark relief when you actually list out everything that you're getting from the supermarket. And I don't know, I found that 
having that has actually kind of changed what I'm doing too, because it's like, oh my God, like there's nothing green here. <laughs> Am I really doing this to myself? <laughs> you can count, like, you know, I, count all the fruits and vegetables and count all the treats and all things like that. Right. Like, you know, you don't want to get yep. the, the Twinkies because, you know, the act of physically putting it into a shopping cart <laughs> online is horrifying, right? Versus your supermarket, you just start grabbing stuff. So I wonder if that's actually been kind of helpful to some people, being able to really see what it is they're actually eating versus what it is that they think they're eating um, when they're not really thinking about it too much and just grabbing stuff at the supermarket. That's a good point. But I've actually seen a lot of my patients put on a lot of weight. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm and I'm not and I'm not the best. I'm really not the best at judging that at all. But when it's significant, it's oh, you know, it, it's hard. Oh, I'm wearing sweatpants so, under here. You can't maybe. see that I'm. I got sweatpants on because I know that there's no way I'm fitting into my dress clothes. Like I have to like to go back into training if I ever want to go to like Expo West in the fall. Because <laughs> assuming it'll be there because this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> You could put wear pole stuff. <laughs> well, I recommend the Peloton bike. Almost, yeah. That's been, that's, that's been a lifesaver for me. Yeah. So, in fact, actually, we we have a treadmill coming in the next couple of days. So, finally, caved in because in Portland awesome. there's no more sun. So, you know, the summer's gone. So, it's like okay, got to do something. So, um, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Melissa, how'd you become such uh, an expert in anterior segment everything? Um, I know next um, iteration you're going to do something with neurotrophic keratitis. Uh, just your general um, uh, interest, or did you pursue it in other ways? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm excited for next year's two CE Wire lectures on neurotrophic keratitis and secrets of the sclera. Um, let's see. So I've been at UC Davis for... Uh, 15 years. And prior to that, I was in private practice ophthalmology. But when I came to UC Davis, there was really a need uh, to bring in more specialty contact lenses. I've always had an interest in dry eye um, and specialty contact lenses. And I think it's a way that we could really help our patients. Um, and I do have an interest in just contact lenses in general, because they're, they're life changing technologies in both spaces, where it can benefit a patient's quality of life. So it's something I enjoy. I do like the back of the eye too, um, but thrilled to come back uh, in 2021 well, and looking forward to it. Unlike a uh, retinal specialist I spoke to years ago where his, his contention was the cornea is only there to keep dust off the retina. I, I think you don't agree with that. <laughs> not at all, not at all. That's and I take, I take vision from retina with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Well, cool. So, Melissa, yeah, it's been great having you here this year. And, and again, you know, thank you for doing it 15,000 times because I know it gets a little bit tiresome to hear your own voice over and over again. Um, so, you know, hopefully next year we're only planning on doing it four times. So um, four times, you know, from March through June so that people can get in all their live right. credits because we, we have a feeling that yes. the world is going to revert to sort of semi-normal by June, according to Arbo, right, according to their prognostication. So we're trying to let everyone get all their online well, I, credits as fast as possible. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, I, I'm so appreciative of all of you. Thank you. And really the audience, the participation, and the positivity. So thank you so much for having me and looking forward to next year as well. All right. Well, we will definitely catch up with you. And I hope, to see, I hope to actually see you on the road eventually, too. I mean, hopefully this will all come to an end that and we can actually get out there. fantastic. <laughs> yep. I'm looking forward to that. All right. Most definitely. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye, you bye. all. Bye. All righty. She's great, and she's one of the more responsive um, speakers. So when we need to get stuff in, she gets it in that, that day and um, always is very – she's not a – on yeah, a high perch where she thinks she's special, although she is. Yeah, no, she's great. She's and her her lectures are fantastic, and obviously that's why she has several hundred people to show up now after the yeah. nine thousandth time that we've given the show. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's three thirty in the afternoon, and when she finished, it was three o'clock. But we're getting tons of people watching the the lectures. So I guess because. Um, it's, it's getting to that point, you're getting the West Coast and the East Coast being able to participate. Yep. And this is with uh, football on TV also. <laughs> yep. Is there, foot, is there football on, on Sundays? Sunday afternoon? Got the what? <laughs> is there still football? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
when I, I, I look for the schedule on PBS on Sundays and there's usually opera on, but nothing today. Uh, so I, I'm not exactly a football fan. Oh, my goodness. So, well, that's the way it is, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, uh, but please. So we, we're still getting a large audience. So that's terrific. Yeah. You know, right. Well, especially get... for the three the three o'clock time slot has less speakers, so they're all ferreting into two tracks, and so a tremendous amount of them. I'd say at least three or four hundred in each one. You, you know, the, the the quality of speakers has become so good, so so much better than the CE stuff uh, for years ago. I, I think uh, people have learned how to how to speak to audiences too. Uh, I don't know if it's just because it's not live and they're. they're they have can take their time taping it, or uh, they're just everyone's a, a better speaker now. So it's great. People don't fall asleep. Yep. <laughs> we hope we're picking people who are in their wheelhouse, and they're going to do a good job no matter what. And like you say, when they have time to prepare it, and then if they don't like the way a slide came out, they can redo it. it it's going to be just like a edited book rather than a stream of consciousness uh, composition. Right, and I think also we're we're giving people the latitude to talk about what they want to talk about because it is a general conference, right? We're not pigeonholing people. If Melissa feels like she wants to do something on NK, great, go ahead and do it. You know, we're not gonna say, oh, no, 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 you know, you're gonna stick to just nutrition or whatever, you know? If people have a passion for something, they can then go do it. I mean, you look at someone like Sue Resnick who's covered so many different things, right? In the time where she's been doing this, just because they interest her. So whatever you're interested in, go for it. Uh, I think that helps a lot too. I think the audience also doesn't want to listen to another regular dry eye lecture or a diabetic retinopathy lecture. They want to have diversity. And uh, and some of our speakers are doing topics that we never thought that people were interested in. Uh, Jennifer Liley about cosmetics and anterior segment stuff. And I'm just mentioning her just because it comes to mind, but so many diverse topics that people want to listen to, even though it doesn't show up in their practice every day. It's just uh, general knowledge. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there are some, and of course, then we have, like, we're going to have Ben Chudner coming on here momentarily, um, you know, talking about private equity, right? And again, you know, these are the kinds of topics that are timely and that we just love to create. And in fact, we're going to be creating a special one. I know he and um, uh, Craig Steinberg are going to team up and create a special one for the next CUR, which is going to be killer, um, where they sort yes. of, because as, as, may, as you, people may or may not know, they're on sort of opposite sides of this. <laughs> world um, yeah. with with Ben working for a, a private equity firm and then Craig representing a lot of people whose practices get bought out by private equity so that should be cool yep. they prom and by the way he's actually traveling to Hawaii um, uh, dr. Jodner to meet with uh, Craig to do it together uh, it's a terrible task he has to do but I think somebody's got to do it. <laughs> in fact maybe Craig should just open up like a recording center out in Hawaii and people would just you know randomly show up there because that's the easiest way to get a recording done clearly <laughs> you know we, we we try to get Craig on to, to speak with us but you know he's on California time and he doesn't want to miss golf so yeah, we, I don't, we I don't have blame to him keep with his golf here. Uh, and I, I can never get him to come on here for I don't blame I don't blame him hour. one bit. And you know, if we had any sunlight here, I would be outside too. So um, this is the <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, we sure. never we never broadcast, right? This is we never broadcast this time of year. Usually we're we're kinda out of it, but like so when when we usually do this, you know, it's early early spring maybe, but now this is like the really the gloomiest time here in Portland. Um, the sun just does not come out. You know, it's out for a couple hours oh. a day maybe, and it's just total darkness it's like living in a submarine so <laughs> yeah no. I, I should help them with that recording Something like barrel alaska yeah no i mean it's it's really bad here i can see why people get depressed um and why a lot of people bug out of here during the winter they'll go you know have a second place in arizona or something uh, it's not too far yep so, so who's our next amazing, we have somebody coming up pretty soon yeah ben chodner should be here hopefully um and in the meantime, I can remind people that CUR 2021 is coming uh, as this one slowly winds down, although I guess not so slowly. If you're telling me we had you know, a few hundred people in each room, this is more people than I thought would be here this afternoon. I thought for sure the, the place would be totally dead. Um, wow. <laughs> we just can't. What a finish. Go into 
And of course, one's Craig Thomas, so um, makes it easy. <laughs> right. I'm just scrolling down, down, and names keep on appearing. I'm not even in the count, but it's let's see, about three or four hundred in his room, and the same in Dr. Malady's room. Wow. Um, so that's tremendous for um, the end of the conference. But people need the credits, and these are two great lectures, also. So yep. We all know about Craig, but Dr. Malady's doing something on. Uh, he's a He's an oculoplastic surgeon. We try to get diversity, and we try to get um, some other fields involved, also ophthalmology, PhDs, et cetera, so um, people are interested. Yep. So again, up on the screen, you'll see CUR 2021 coming, and again, uh, these are the dates that we picked to avoid conflicts with major things going on. Um, and so you can see 64 credits, four live events, one low price. And we're determined to keep the price as low as we can again. Um, especially if you're listening to my voice, you're obviously taking the existing C wires. So you know, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm speaking out of turn, probably. but one of our people on OD Wire took, <laughs> took a course in, sponsored by the New Mexico Optometric Association, mm -hmm. and it cost him 10 times as much as we charge. He was paying $30 a credit. Wow. For, for the course, but I guess they forced him to take it, and he, he rationalized and said, at least I saved $400 in travel time, in travel <laughs> expense. Right. But that's nervy, for, to charge that much for in people, our case, especially, it's... you know, with young people, they, they don't have the money. They, they shouldn't do that. It's, it's not fair. You know, it's a cash cow for the state associations, but they shouldn't do it on the back of, of everyone. There should be some sort of differential pricing for people fresh out of school for the first five years. Yeah. Well, I, there is in New Jersey, and I, I'm not sure in New York, I believe so, that the first year you should be exonerated because um, you just got out of school. And then it's sliding. But then by the fifth year, when you're still not totally um, uh, in, in your full floods of your profession, you're, you're back to your full credits. And it's, like you said, expensive. Uh, just the uh, hotel, airfare, and um, meals uh, cost more than the lectures, which are expensive to begin with. So, my um, yeah, and my feeling is this, that associations are going to have to come up with another reason for these meetings existing, right, beyond continuing education. There are some probably a lot of state-related issues that people would want to, to learn about it and, you know, be present with their peers at, right? that just go beyond general education about dry eye, right? Why would you want to do that at your state association meeting when you could do it effectively and cheaply elsewhere? Whereas at, at those kinds of sure. meetings, wouldn't you want to discuss things that are germane to your state and really focus on that yeah. and networking with people in your state? I mean, that's just my opinion, that they should probably get out and, of the business of providing general education. Sure, and, and as we'll a make country, it so it's a, and as we move towards a, a more medical model, there should be more wet lab types of courses. Yep. I mean, how are you going to learn this uh, by, you know, to, to want to do laser surgery, for example, or whatever, whatever comes up soon. Yep. Uh, even, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the older people don't even know uh, about how to remove a foreign body. It was never taught when I went to school. Yep. It, and, uh, and how many foreign bodies did, uh, one of the issues that we have with, with education with optometry now, there aren't enough patients for patients for, uh, for optometry students to get proficient uh, during the four years that they're going to school. And unless they take a residency where they're top heavy with pathology, they don't have enough hands on experience. So the, the association should take up some of the slack. They took the words right out of the mouth, Paul, and um, some schools don't have the diversity of population of a, a Salus or a SUNY or some other areas. Um, luckily, in this day and age, uh, there aren't that many farm bodies coming to this country, so you don't have to deal with them as much. Sorry about that. But, um, but, but no, but seriously, I think, I think you're right. Like The idea behind a wet, la wet labs would be great. State-specific stuff would be a great thing to have at these events. But to charge premium prices for, quote, education, especially the general education, I think is, that's got to go away. I don't know. It's, right. I mean, it's sort of like Vision oh, Expo, right? Rubber when you think about a Vision Expo, what do you think about? What comes to mind, most importantly, at Vision Expo? It's not learning about dry eye, right? It's, it's the event. It's the spectacle. It's being yep. able to play with all the equipment, right? And, you know, that... But, uh, especially in the Vision Expo, yep. they, they, they have so many sponsors so many booths 
that they make millions from the boots. There's no reason that they have to charge the prices that they're charging oh, for the courses. Well, and more to the point, though, if I were a vendor at Vision Expo, I'd want as little education there as possible, right? I would want people who are there to be focused like a laser beam on the actual expo, on the equipment, right? As opposed to sitting right. in some hour-long class, you know, whatever, about punctual plugs or whatever, or just whatever. I'd, I'd want people out there and networking and mingling and not sitting in a classroom setting. I mean, that's just me. Um, you know, Expo obviously has a lot of good classes. They have many of the similar classes to what we have here, right? Because it's a general conference. But I just kind of feel like I'm, I wonder, ultimately, is that what they are? Are they an education conference? And I would say no. Um, I would say that most people I, who, who go to Vegas or New York don't want to sit in a classroom for eight hours a day. Also, on the vendor side, if they're subsidizing everything for a ridiculous cost, some of these um, booths, which aren't booths, but they're small cities, cost millions of dollars with plush carpeting and yeah. um, wine under the table or whatever. Um, they're not, if, if they've had the experience, they could do almost the same thing online without the expense of moving staff and equipment all over the world. They might go to these places, but they'll scale down their size and their investment and their, their presence. And if they get the same return on investment, there's just no need to spend all that money. Right. And, and we might find that some of these big conferences, at least there's so many of them, and now they're, because they're being pushed forward into the um, time frame uh, after May or May to yeah. begin with, if it does happen, it's going to be conference after conference after conference. People just aren't want to go, don't want to but, go to that. But that's what I'm saying. Vendors. That's what I'm saying. I think conferences like Expo should focus on the vendors to the exclusion of all other things, on vendors and networking, and not having people tied up in class for eight hours a day, right? Make it about the spectacle of actually going and, and playing with all of Zeiss's equipment, right? Of going to the booths, of actually meeting people and going face to face, not sitting in a classroom listening to, to boring nonsense for eight hours. Um, yeah. But that's that's just me. And I, I think, Ben, are you here listening to our boring nonsense? <laughs> yeah, I am. But as someone who's spoken at Expo, I take offense to the boring nonsense <laughs> part. But other than that, it's fine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though, right? You go to Las Vegas, you don't want to be in a classroom. Come on now. You know, you want to be out there. No, I, I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course. <laughs> We've had too many glasses of wine together, Ben, to feed yeah. it otherwise. <laughs> I get, it. but first of all, happy Hanukkah to both uh, yes. of you. Yes, happy, happy Hanukkah. It's Thank uh, you. Thank all you. three of us. Yep. You know, before before Vision Expo, uh, Irv Bennett set up Optifair, and uh, they they didn't even know that it was part of an optometric management's uh, job to, to publicize it, and it started out at the Hilton Hotel for many years, uh, and it, and there was there was not enough room at the Hilton. Uh, after a while, and that's why they had to move it to the uh, to the Javits Center. Uh, by the way, do you have your uh, Ben? Is your speaker off? Your your computer? Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, no, no one. There's no feedback. Okay. Uh, and once he sold out to the op to the to Vision Expo, that's when it became a big, big deal. Uh, you know, the, this it became a real profit, a real profit maker. So. I'm not sure that they're going to want to listen to us uh, because they have a, a very winning formula uh, and they may want to keep it the, the way it is. So, sure. I, I, yeah, as an original speaker at, at uh, Optifair, I can tell you that it used to get big crowds for sure. Sure. Yep. I just think that going forward, the way things are looking, the conferences are going to have to decide what they really are. Right, and having an association meeting charge literally an order of magnitude more money to take the same classes as what's being offered elsewhere online, I just I have a hard time seeing that working in in the long run. They need to come up with a new gimmick, right, a new formula to get people physically to want to go to the association meetings. So, but that's just me. No, I think that's fair. I, I think another issue is we're hearing from vendors uh, that 2020 was actually a pretty good year for them uh, in general. Um, and so with them not having to spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on multiple um, uh, meetings throughout the year, uh, it may really change uh, the way that, that they view these meetings as well, which will be the death knell. I mean, if you don't have, if you don't have vendors coming to the exhibit halls, um, I don't know how these, these uh, meetings survive. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a huge, huge challenge. And that's why I'm saying I think if they scale back the education a little bit, 
and try to do whatever they can to get people to interact with the vendors, I think that's what's going to have to happen in a lot of these, these meetings, um, particularly because you can get this content now at places like CEWire. And, you know, our booths don't cost $50,000 for the vendors. <laughs> so, yeah. I, mean, I, I just realized Steve was on the call, too. So when I said happy Hanukkah to both of you, I guess I meant all three of you. All, all three? I, I yeah. apologize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so meanwhile. I thought you forgot Paul. So meanwhile, Ben, what's going no. on? What's yeah. going on in your world? I hear you're going to be going to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try. Yes, uh, I um, uh, Yes. So the the uh, next year's course that I'm going to do on CEY with Craig um, Steinberg on. Uh, I think we are going to. I'm hoping we're going to go with the yin and yang of private equity because yep. it'll be it'll be both from the uh, the legal the seller side as Craig is a uh, represents. Um, sellers now and then from the the buyer side on the piece side which i represent so it could be kind of fun uh, and, yeah, and and unfortunately steve is uh or excuse me craig is uh in hawaii uh, when we need to record this so i think i'm gonna try to try to make that happen we'll see <laughs> yeah so meanwhile how well, what's happened with business uh with the uh, were there acquisitions during this this COVID time there were not uh um there were some that happened right before the closure that weren't announced. So it appeared as though they may have happened during the closure in many cases, but uh, there were no uh, acquisitions to our knowledge during uh, the period from really um, uh, March through June, for the most part. Uh, they may have, been, may have stopped actually in April, uh, but they started right up again uh, in June, in July, uh, but there was no money. Uh, banks weren't, weren't releasing funds and uh, investors weren't spending. So there's really a. Have you a found you're getting more of a feeling? I know when we spoke in March and April and May, you had no feeling of whether optometry is going to come back at all. And now you have some feeling of what's happening in practices. Do you see it um, uh, recovering to the point of being almost normal pretty soon? Uh, it came back to normal for uh, most of the private equity groups right away. Uh, in fact, um, you know, one of the advantages of having uh, the scale and multiple practices plus a huge management team behind it is we were prepared for reopening. I think we had about, I think we calculated it was about 62 different work streams going during the, the six or eight week shutdown. And then we opened up, uh, and this was pretty uh, consistent among all the groups. Uh, and then we opened up in phases. So I think uh, we started with 30 practices a week uh, until we got up to 100%. I, uh, I think that was pretty consistent. Maybe, maybe some were gone to 40 or 50. Um, but when we came back uh, strong, we were hitting comp numbers from year over year. And uh, originally, we all assumed that to be um, due to a backup. You know, we had canceled all these appointments and we had this backup. But honestly, we've we've uh, exceeded what we did last year and actually hit our 2020 original plan every month since reopening. And I think that's pretty pretty uh, similar across the board on the private equity groups. So at least for us, the larger groups, uh, we're back. Uh, and, uh, and we have a couple dozen practices that actually have hit plan for, that hit plan for 2020, pre-COVID plan that we, you know, we come up with 2019, several weeks, if not months ago. So um, yeah, I think optometry is back. You know, it's tough to say what the independents are doing, the, you know, the smaller, uh, you know, one location, smaller practices are doing, but the larger locations seem to have come back pretty strong. Right. And we... So, uh, so what uh, happened to the small... At, George, yeah, I had one question. Uh, most optometrists try to keep their staff on because they have emotional attachments to their people. I would assume that the private equity groups, being hard-nosed businessmen, would say, hey, we closed our doors, take off, you know, collect unemployment. How, how did the private equity groups handle the, the, the closure months? Uh, most of us were able to keep uh, a large majority of our doctors and associates uh, still employed, uh, maybe not at full salary. Uh, I heard as, as many, you know, someone to 80% salary and they laid off uh, associates. Uh, we actually went significantly deeper cuts than that and kept uh, 80% of our employees employed uh, with benefits. Um, and, and then we had to furlough about 20% of our employees and we were able to bring them back pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, again, it's yeah, maybe it's the, the belief that how bad private equity is, but we looked at it as a long-term play. We wanted to be able to come back and we certainly wanted to protect our, our employees uh, and, and have them back when we were ready to reopen. So we did everything we could to uh, to keep our employees. The ones that were furloughed, 
uh, the situation was actually better for them to go on unemployment and take advantage of the federal um, aid that was available in the, in the beginning of COVID. Uh, so for the most part, um, we took care of pretty much everyone we could. Great. And, you know, I heard, uh, now we've spoken to several doctors, including uh, Craig Thomas, right? We spoke to Ben Casella this morning. Yep. And one of the fascinating things that we've heard is that their volume is down, but the average ticket size is up. And so what's ended up happening is that the doctors are spending more time with patients. Um, and actually, you know, on balance, the revenue is kind of getting close or, or the same, but they're getting to spend more time with patients and just the average order size is going up. Have you seen some, something like that in some of your practices? We have, uh, not to the same extent. Um, we have, uh, we do have one practice uh, in our fleet that sees patients every 10 minutes. Uh, they have an amazing support staff. They have uh, refracting techs using uh, Marco Epic units. They have two in each of their offices. Uh, we could, we could not go back to 10 minute ex uh, exam slots uh, because of uh, social distancing requirements, uh, specifically uh, not only our policies, but also the state policies. That, that they operate in. So that practice is one where uh, we definitely have seen a, a significant decrease in transactions relative to last year. But to your point, the ticket sales, uh, the, the average ticket has gone up. But for the most part, we're down just a little bit, uh, very low single digits in terms of number of transactions. And that is due to um, our COVID policies where we're uh, making sure we have social distancing in place and stuff. So. Uh, it certainly isn't for a lack of patients wanting to come in, uh, but yes, we've seen uh, the average ticket go up significantly um, compared to last year. And, and it's tough to explain why that might be. Uh, could be the doctors are getting to spend a little bit more time have, and having the right conversations with patients, but that is consistent with what we're seeing. Right. And it may also be because everyone's trapped at home in general, right? You're not going out to restaurants, so you have a little more disposable income that way. Uh, you know, yep. you're, you're spending literally like just all day sitting in front of a computer, like doing what we're doing right now. So why not treat yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be <clears throat> certainly. Um, and it's been a trend since we came back. So we haven't seen it um, uh, really trail off at all. Yep. So that, that's interesting, you know, and, and I know it's funny because we had Millie Knight on from Essilor as well. And I think she said she's seen the same thing on their side, right, on the material side. Um, so I wonder, is this going to continue? You know, will people be able to continue to sort of upsell um, for these products? And, you know, I, I, guess, I guess we'll find out soon enough, right? I mean, hopefully this pandemic is going to come to an end in, by June, I would hope. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I mean, you know, we deal um, with so many states now. We're in 12 different states. So, you know, we're following different guidelines. So we see these ebbs and flows in each of the states. But in general, um, it, it sure seems like that's holding. And I, I hope you're right. I, I hope with, uh, you know, with the news on vaccines and uh, we start to see some lessening of restrictions as people can get out more, too. And, and, and that might help. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to predict. And, and it certainly makes predicting what 2021 is going to look like as we're trying to come up with what our what our plans should be, you know, and, and, you know, what is our budget and what do we expect to, you know, to collect and you know, how do we prepare for new acquisitions and, and, you know, hiring people and all that stuff is you just don't know how to compare to 2020 at this point. Right. And I think another problem, a personal problem that, Ben, you and I are both going to have is that you're going to have a situation where things are like partially reopened, right? Because presumably you and I are both in a similar risk group, meaning we're not going to get this vaccine for a very, very long time. So we're yeah. going to be, you know, sort of down on the totem pole where we're not going to be covered by this, yet a lot of other people are, and they're going to start going back out and doing things. So you're, you're going to have this, yep. this strange system over the next several months where, you know, I, I'm personally not going to travel very much, right? Because that would be the, you know, the, the, the icing on the cake if I got COVID right at the very end. I'm not going to let that happen to myself. <laughs> but I, I kind of right. wondering, like, is what's it going to be like then for a lot of these businesses where you have people who are maybe in sort of the part of their working years, right, in their 30s and 40s, who still can't really do as much as they want to because they don't have access to a vaccine. Yeah, it's interesting. We're in, you know, we're looking with, you know, we employ, you know, well over 2,000 people. And, and our question is, what are we going to do when a vaccine is readily available? And, and, you know, do we, we're certainly not going to force people to take a vaccine, but, you know, do we have them not wear PPE if they do have had the vaccine. We, we've made the decision that we aren't going to do that. Everyone will continue to wear PPE until the CDC says, says, sure. says differently whether or not they've had a vaccine. We're certainly not going to ask people to show us their vaccine card. Yeah. But more interestingly, which is going to get more challenging for us as business owners, not just us, but you know, independent practices as well, 
uh, and especially in some states like Texas, where we tend to have um, people who are uh, very against mask uh, masking um, in general, um, is that what happens when patients have taken the vaccine and they no longer want to wear a mask when they go into a public place? And, and are they going to, you know, is that going to be an issue where businesses are going to start demanding to see people's vaccination cards to prove whether or not they can be in without a mask? It's going to be an interesting time as a business owner um, that manages, you know, deals with a, a business specifically that is public facing and, and how we react to this over the next six or 12 months. Yep. Um, should be fun time. How are your, how are your practices dealing with, uh, with, with the associates and or uh, assistants that come in with uh, the COVID that are infected? Uh, we what have, do you do with the practice? Yep. So we have a, we have what's called a COVID committee that, that really meets, Pretty much every day now just because we have so many instances where we either get a notification from the department of health that a patient had been in the office or we get an associate or a doctor that has symptoms uh, we have a whole uh, policy in place so um, knock on wood uh, we've yet to have a single uh, episode where we can trace uh, and we try to trace uh, that people uh, caught covid within our practices so most of the time even if there's been more than one associate in a practice uh, that test positive for COVID, we've been able to to trace it back to outside um, exposure. So it depends. Uh, uh, you know, in some cases, we will close the practice down for uh, a day for a deep cleaning, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, we certainly will require any associate to isolate. Healthcare workers, uh, the CDC I separates us in terms of their policies. So if you have a healthcare worker with a positive exposure uh, to COVID, a known exposure, they actually don't have to quarantine according to the CDC. They can they can continue to work and monitor symptoms. So we fall under that. Um, so we watch that very closely and have our associates monitor symptoms. But we've certainly had to close practices down uh, and had them cleaned. We've had, uh, you know, or we have a, a smaller practice with one doctor and four associates and two of the associates are out. We just can't open the office because we don't have a staff. We've had to close offices for that. Uh, each case is unique, um, unfortunately, and it's uh, it certainly is challenging. Yep. And I think I, I, I assume I assume you have staff lounges in many of your your practices. Well, what's yeah. the policy there? The staff you I know we had one in my practice, and the lunch was they had their lunches there. Uh, yep, not anymore. What, <laughs> so what what happens now? What's the policy? Everyone has where they go to eat. The restaurants uh, are closed. In, yep. Where, so where they'll eat in their car. Yeah, they'll leave in their car or if they work close enough to home, they'll go home. But we do not allow, unless the staff lounge is large enough where you can be socially distant from everybody, uh, we don't allow people to eat together in the staff room. So in a smaller practice, we may stagger lunches so that it's only one person at a time. Uh, but for the most part, most people are eating outside of the office, whether they're bringing their lunch in and, and eating in their car. Some people like they can go home. Um, but we've, we've taken a pretty hard line on that. Yep. And my suspicion, actually, I think, you know, you were mentioning the situation where some have masks, some don't. What, what's going to happen? I suspect, you know, and I don't know, but I suspect that the federal government come January is going to have a mandate for 100 days or whatever it is where universal precautions will be it. And that's going to be the policy. And obviously enforcing it at the local level is going to be difficult in certain places. But I think that's, yep. that's going to be it because assuming anything other than universal precautions, I don't know how that would work. I can't imagine. Could the federal Agreed. government mandate that or suggest it? I'm I think they're going to mandate it. I, I, think, I think that the federal can. government's going to try to mandate it. I think it's going to fail in many places, but they have to try. I think it just makes it easier for employers, right? The federal government should use their authority to say this is how it should be. Um, why should individual employers mm. have to decide about this, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, we'll, we're hoping the CDC will take a stand. So we get asked, you know, we obviously have investors that are that are very interested in how we're going to respond to this. And, and right now, uh, in light of vaccines, our response is we're going to wait. We're going to continue doing exactly what we're doing, which is per CDC guideline. And until the CDC changes our guidelines that to incorporate vaccinations into those uh, recommended uh, policies, we won't make any changes. So we'll follow the CDC. I, I don't know that the... Uh, what the government will do in terms of a mandate, like, certainly possible. Um, but we imagine the CDC is going to have to start weighing in on once vaccines become more widespread. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to follow that closely. At least that gives us something to fall back on when we, when we have to justify either to a patient, to an associate or doctor, or to our investors why we do what we do. We can, you know, we, we can point to the CDC as, as, you know, pretty much who we are following uh, with respect to uh, 
uh, our policies. Right. Huh. And so I kind of wonder, in this environment, in this milieu, with everything that's been happening, in terms of new transactions, are, are doctors still approaching you? Is this something that they, they want to try to go ahead with? or? More so than ever. Um, we actually had, uh, we had one doctor who was about to sell right before COVID, and there was an issue with a landlord that delayed the deal. Uh, and so that deal got totally put off. Um, and now we're re-engaging with him. Um, and uh, we've had we've had more and more people reach out to us. Interesting enough, people that said they didn't want to sell are now coming back to us and reaching out and saying, you know, I might be interested. I mean, people are scared if there's a second wave. Uh, you know, if if there's a second wave and the government can't intervene in a way with PPP and and whatever other uh, small business help that they had, uh, it's it's dangerous. Most optometrists, you know, live month to month in their practices, and so it's very difficult for them to um, uh, to survive another shutdown, and especially uh, if the second wave is bigger than the first wave. Uh, so I, we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of interest now. I, I hate to, I hate so to ask the question. A, then there's... I hate to interrupt, Ben. Yeah. Um, but there's a limo waiting outside for him because his lecture has started. He can... I'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm watching it right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so watching right okay. now. Okay. He's, he's, he's I'm on, on then you're fine. You... Multitasking. You, you can multitask. Sure. Because I, I was going to ask you the multi-million dollar question. So knowing this imbalance of supply and demand, are prices going down? <laughs> they really, you know, they really aren't. Um, and, uh, you know, the practice is worth what the practice is worth. Uh, and it never has been um, uh, something where we, we look at it and said we're going to pay more because uh, there's less practices to purchase or now we'll pay less because there's more practices to purchase. There's still quite a bit of competition, though. That does drive prices up. Some of the bigger guys uh, will pay a little bit more in general. Um, but in, uh, we have not, we've had um, six transactions, I think, that, uh, since COVID, uh, since the shutdown was over. And uh, prices have been pretty in line uh, with, uh, with what they were pre-COVID. So right now, it's not playing that way. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, the doctor doesn't have to sell, even though they, they want to sell. So I, it, it's not quite your true supply and demand scenario. Um, it's still just the competition between the big four of us. Right. So I guess then the takeaway at the end of 2020, you know, we went into this incredibly scared, right, with everything falling apart uh, way back when. The takeaway, based on everything that I've heard from our guests, is that things are, are not as bad as one might have anticipated earlier in the year. I would have expected by now that there would be like blood in the streets and fire and everything else, but it seems like <laughs> things are relatively stable, all things considered. Uh, they really are. Um, you know, I, I think optometry in general has weathered the storm quite well. Um, I think there were some missteps uh, with the AOA not getting uh, us listed as essential right away, but that's been rectified now. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, in general, it seems to me at least from what I can look at, you know, for our practices, and I look at the other big private equity groups, they've all seemed to come out of this quite nicely. Now, there have been some, there certainly have been um, some casualties. I mean, you look at some of the bigger um, optical-based chains, especially the ones that are mall-based, mm. and they have not done very, very well. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, one in particular that's a very large one in malls is, is really struggling because mall traffic is down so much. And that's what they relied heavily on. So um, private independent practices, which, which you know, say what you want about private equity, but in general, we're buying private practices and for the most part, keeping them private. They're, they're in standalone buildings or in strip malls, not necessarily in, in actual malls, your traditional mall setting. And um, uh, they, we seem to be doing just fine. Patients are willing to come out. I think, you know, I think what we had was this weird curve where first you had uh, this backup of exams that we didn't do. So you had a lot of people coming in that, that were trying to get an exam before. And then as that started to go through, you had people that were, were tired of just sitting at home. And so they were going out and going and doing things where they could. And one of the things they could do was go to the eye doctor. So that sustained kind of a high level of, of engagement in the practices. Um, so we, we weathered pretty well. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm feeling better already about 2021. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you remember the last time we spoke, I was very bullish on optometry and you and Gretchen laughed at me. So uh, yeah, you were right. It's turning we, out so far so good. We were wrong. <laughs> I, I, ha I have to say, you know, you were right. And, and in fact, you were in the, the right place at the right time, right? So who knew the malls would become absolutely toxic and the strip mall would reign supreme? <laughs>
Who knew? Uh, yes. So getting out of my, <laughs> my last job uh, was probably, it probably, you know, probably did it right at the right time. So I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> awesome. Well, Ben, thank you for doing this. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up, uh, you know, we'll catch up with you in Hawaii and then at CUR 2021. Yeah. <laughs> I, we're we're going to need a sound engineer to do it for us. So why don't you come out with us and we'll you, you send me the we'll ticket. I'll, send me the ticket. I'll be there. <laughs> you can swim from there enough. to Portland. <laughs> all right. No, all yours right. is me. I have to come from upstate New York. It's going to take me all day to get there. <laughs> but it's worth it. All right. <laughs> totally worth it. Thanks, guys. All right. Good talk to you. Ben. Bye. Take care. Bye now. Oh, my goodness. Let's think about that. For upstate New York in beginning of March or Hawaii, let's think about what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, it's always fun. That, that is a long trip, though. I, I took I went on a New York to Hawaii trip, and boy, the, uh, the jet lag when you come home it takes a week. Yeah, to, but it's about nine hour, nine hour time difference. Yeah, so it's like going to Europe. Yeah, not, not fun. For a lot sure. of people will stop off in California and they'll do a little one two day vacation at Disneyland and then go to Hawaii. That, that's one way of yeah. uh, minimizing it. Yep. yep. Anyway, he's he's interesting. I, he was very at the beginning. He was really negative in March because he didn't know what was happening. What are practices that they were negotiating with just went down the tubes? But um, I have a feeling even that practitioner who was sixty, fifty eight years old and was on the fence was yep. saying, look. This COVID almost did me in. I don't want this hassle. I, I think I'm going to go that route. And I think he's going to a lot more going forward than uh, he even anticipates. Yep. And But it's interesting, though, right, how malls have become like the last place that you want to be. And so strip oh, sure. malls, which have, you know, fallen into disrepute among serious shoppers, right, have, you know, are, are resurgent in a lot of ways because people w will go there, right? They're not afraid of them, whereas the mall, I mean, I haven't been to a shopping mall now in close to a year which is kind of shocking now that I actually say it out loud. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'm not alone. I haven't, I don't know what our local malls are doing. They're probably not in great shape. You have to remember at the very beginning also when practices started to open up like the end of May or so, malls are still closed, at least locally in New York, New Jersey, and I'm sure all over the country. So they didn't even have any traffic until um, after July 4th. And yeah. like you said, the traffic is, is nil. Um, and Christmas, uh, this Christmas holiday, um, they're not going to. People aren't going to be shopping for eye care. They're going to be shopping for Christmas presents. So um, we we have one speaker that you know really well who owns a, a couple of more practices, and he's dying. And uh, there's, there's, it, you just cut staff and doctors so much. And the trouble is, it cascades up, as you know. The these, the more people want their rent, they have to pay mortgages, they have to pay real estate taxes, and so unless we get some more um, aid from the government. Uh, those type of practices yep. might go under. So the only the only exception, I, I guess, uh, would be cer certain kinds of businesses. So for instance, I saw at our local mall, the movie theater, uh, obviously they stopped paying rent on their space. And the mall, <laughs> I was reading the paper, the mall was threatening to sue and evict them. And the movie theater chain was like, fine, <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to replace us with? Um, and I'm sure the mall operators at that point were thinking, yeah, we probably should just forgive their rent for now, right? For when things finally normalize again, because what we're going to do is kill ourselves by kicking the movie theater out. We'll never replace that space. So, yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I, I wonder what the small real estate operator is doing. You know, people that make a living just from renting small houses and uh, they, they, they don't want to evict the people living there, but yep. many of these people have not paid rent now for nine months. Yep. So, and they have to still pay their taxes. What, what the heck do they do? And there's a mortgage and taxes to pay. And it's almost a year since they've had any income. And with the blessing of the government saying you don't have to pay rent, you'll just have to pay back rent when things are over. But I can't imagine a poor person, even living in a very humble $1,000 a month unit, can have $10,000 or $12,000 yeah. to... Uh, to pay their back rent. Well, so what that's, the heck is going to happen? That's going to go, I mean, that, that's a, that, you know, on a small scale, that's a tragedy. But I think even more globally, think about what downtown Portland looks like right now, right? Where all the high tech businesses and all the ad agencies and all the, you know, young people who were there every day are now not and probably will never be, oh. right? Many businesses, including well, Amazon, was, which has offices downtown, they're not going to reopen. In the, in the real estate section of the Times that the, uh, many of the, uh, commercial places where we used to be office buildings 
they're thinking of converting them into apartments. Makes sense. Because because they can't they can't fill it up with uh, offices anymore. Yep. So that's what's going to be happening. So it's, it's. I think I heard a statistic a few years ago that if um, somebody had an unusual or un, um, uh, a payment they had to make for five hundred dollars, seventy percent of the United States could not make that payment. Yep. They could put it on a credit card, so people just don't have the disposable cash, and that's why we need the government help right now. Yeah, and so hopefully help will, will be coming. But even when it does, like there are just the the downtown areas um, of a lot of cities where they were, you know, purely commercial. I just don't know how they're going to re rebound anytime soon, especially because so many businesses, especially modern businesses, right, high tech businesses, the kind that we have here in Portland. You know, development firms, people you know who do software for a living, people who do marketing for a living, right? They don't necessarily yeah. need to be in the office all the time, especially not with that expensive space. And I just, I don't know. It's it's going to be really interesting. Whereas what's what's happening, of course, here is that the suburbs are now, of course, the place to be, right? It's where everyone is staying, and you know the pr real estate prices here have actually gone up. You know, we're six miles outside of downtown Portland in a suburb. And it's actually gotten more expensive out here rather than less. So who knows? I mean, it's it's wow. hard to tell. <sighs> yeah. I heard a bug, a beep. I heard nothing. Is Wait, is there a beep? I, I think Richard is. I didn't, with I didn't us. hear anything. <laughs> he didn't. He was hearing things. Hey guys, I'm here. Oh. I don't think I... Yes. Hey Richard. I see my. You see, my hearing aids are much better than your your hearing. I got to go get an exam then because that's crazy that you heard that and I didn't. Now, now I'm now. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah. Well, but once you have hearing aids and it goes through your phone, super hearing, you become Superman. <laughs> Before we start, we have to let phone. Richard know. Richard, <laughs> yes. Richard, you um, are our one millionth interview for CWARA 2020. I don't, don't know if you know that. And there's a free Lamborghini waiting outside your apartment, your house. Man. I'll be back in a few minutes, guys. Let me go check on that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, Richard, are, are you still with the uh, you still with the veterans? Last time I, I think, am I imagining it? What, what did what did you work with the VA for a while? Uh, that's correct. I'm still with them now, uh, going on a little over 11 years. How is it there? What what is it like to be a, a VA optometrist? You know, it's definitely been very interesting the past year, to say the least. Um, obviously, with all the politicalization of COVID and so forth, and there's been a lot of issues from a bureaucratic side as well. Um, you know, one thing I can definitely say in the past year itself is I've been extremely fortunate to have the job that I have. Um, you know, we didn't have to worry about any kind of furloughs or any issues like that being a federal employee. Uh, you know, with without this year standing and you know, just even in a general purpose, it's been, it's been very nice working for the VA, working with the clientele and the patients that we have. Uh, it's been a great experience so far in my career. What happens when they close? Are some of the centers, uh, if it's not part of a hospital, closed during the epidemic? Were, were optometrists laid off or they kept working? How, how did it work uh, for optometry? Yeah, yeah. So VA optometrists uh, as a whole, uh, my understanding is that a lot of the clinics were shut down, uh, but nobody was actually laid off, to my understanding. Um, I, I'm not I'm not privy to a lot of inside information or anything, but from talking to a bunch of other colleagues and so forth, I can tell you that uh, the majority of us still got a paycheck every single day. Um, we did go into the hospital, and we were seeing emergency patients that came in still for obviously, you know emergency ocular events. Um, there were a lot of optometrists throughout the country in the VA that also filled secondary roles to help the uh, everybody else with COVID, where they would do screenings at the front uh, for employees and so forth as they came in. Um, so they really kind of found other ways to utilize the personnel that they had to, you know, kind of employ us in a different fashion, even when we couldn't see our normal day-to-day -day patient load. Right. 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 And I am curious because, you know, you have that hospital setting. How are vets dealing with COVID, you know, in that population, which might be different from the general population in terms of their demographics? Is it better or worse? It's, I can't really speak to the general population, but I can tell you that a lot of our veterans have been incredibly understanding about this. Um, the hard part that we've had at our facility 
And I'll take a step back by saying our facility did an amazing job with the way they kind of handled the entire process. Um, the one thing that we had a lot, a lot of trouble with was rescheduling patients. Um, so at our facility alone, there were a few patients that had to be rescheduled on multiple occasions, and that's where people kind of had some, some difficulties with that. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of the veterans were very understanding. We still have patients nowadays even that are canceling their appointments because uh, Columbia, Missouri, where I'm based, is still a, a relatively hot spot. Um, you know, we, we have a town of, I think it's around 120,000 people or city, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, we're still averaging between 100 to 250 new cases per day in our, in our county. Um, so we're still, we're still pretty hot in this area. And the veterans, I mean, they, they've been really good about it. You know, they wear their masks. They don't give us a lot of problems with it. Um, I, I, what I've been doing is I actually tape everyone's mask across their nose and their cheeks so that our lenses don't fog up when we're refracting and when I'm doing 90 and so forth. And they've been fine. I've never gotten any blowback on that. So as a whole, they've been, they've been wonderful about this whole thing. Excellent. Yeah, because I know demographically they're, you know, in the danger zone, right? Because as we've now discovered that being male is definitely not a great thing for COVID. Um, your risk is so much higher of having serious complications, right? Um, older, you know, overweight, whatever. I mean, so demographically, I'm, I'm just glad to see that you guys are hanging in there. Do you have an ICU at your facility or, or do they go elsewhere? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the last part at, of that? At your VA hospital, do you guys have an ICU, or do, do they go elsewhere in the city if, if someone has a really hard time? No, we do have an ICU at, at our place. Uh, the last numbers I checked, we have been kind of averaging low 20s for inpatients that have it. Mm. Uh, but once again, you know, we've done a really nice job with it, and uh, I think there's even some talk of us taking some patients from uh, other hospitals as well, community hospitals that are having a hard time staying on float with everything. Right. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear yeah, you're hanging in. So, <laughs> anyway, let, let's talk about your, your lecture. What, what got you interested in the retinal systemic vascular disease aspect? So it's kind of a funny story. Uh, well, I went to PCO, now known as Salus University and so forth. And the way it was set up back in the day was when you were a third year, um, in the spring of your third year, you went off to a first rotation. And I went down to Wake Forest, North Carolina with a, a doctor named Lee McPherson. He was amazing, really, really highly intelligent guy, did his residency at Baskin and Palmer and so forth. And this is just a regular old private practice. Um, and I, I learned so much from him in those three or four or four or five months that I guess we were there. Um, so I really kind of came out of that place feeling pretty good about myself. And then I went to the Wilmington, Delaware VA, which used to be run by, uh, Dr. Brian Mahoney. And I remember the first day I was there, it may have even been my first case. I went in to report to him and I thought I was some hot shot at that point as a brand, as a new fourth year. <laughs> I thought I knew everything in the world. And, uh, I went to report to Dr. Mahoney about a case, and I would start talking about how the vessels looked and what diagnosis I'm giving this guy. And he just looked me square in the face. He's like, Rich, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and that I, I love that part of my life just because that really kind of put things in perspective for me. And, you know, if you know anything about Dr. Mahoney, he's an amazing guy. He's just incredibly intelligent, very easy to talk to, very easy to work with. And he was a huge guiding force in my career because I really kind of realized, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And he really kind of helped direct me and kind of founded my uh, love and knowledge of disease, particularly retinal vasculature and carotid disease and so forth. Um, so I, I owe a lot to, to him in particular for really kind of putting me on the right track there. What device okay. do you have, Rich, at the VA Center to uh, look at retinal disease? Do you have an OCT angiographer and high-tech stuff? Because I know the VA sometimes is challenging compared to, let's say, other practices. Yes, yeah, so we, we've had a uh, Cirrus 6000 now for the past oh, really? uh, I probably a year and a half. Yeah, we, we just got it. Actually, we just got it right before COVID hit, actually. And... You know, we had been needing one for quite some time because we were still using an old Cirrus 4000 and it was falling apart on us. Uh, I think we had to duct tape half of it together, frankly. <laughs> but the, the, the 6000, I, I honestly can't say we've used it a lot because 
we, shortly after we got it, COVID hit. And even in its experience when we were trying to use it, our machine was a lemon. It just kept failing and bugging on us. So we haven't really used it a whole lot. Um, not nearly to the extent that I would love to use the OCA, OCTA perspective of it, at least. Right. Because right. that's really the, the wheelhouse or the sweet spot of uh, looking at the blood vessels on the retina on the very microscopic level that we just can't possibly see uh, regularly. Yeah, it, it's incredible. Hopefully. Um, you know, one of the lectures I used to still do was on, you know, retinal vascular occlusions and I don't have any of my own photos for it, unfortunately, but it's, I, I can't wait to really start diving into it more and uh, doing more of these scans on these patients that are, have suspect disease and so forth. Yeah. yeah you know, it's funny. Meanwhile, when, when uh, well, hang on a second. I, I had a question about this. So, you know, the last time, you know, when I <laughs> actually, so I actually worked with a vascular surgeon back at the VA. This was about a thousand years ago, maybe 30 years yeah. ago. I mean, it's a long time now. Um, but they would do carotid endarterectomies all the time um, to, you know, treat this disease of stenosis. And I'm, I'm wondering, without having to, you know, without seeing your lecture, sitting through it, what's the sort of the definitive procedure these days? I remember back then, it was always, every single time we did it, it was a little bit hairy, right? Uh, because you'd worry about the person stroking out, even if you tried to, to use a shunt and tried to bypass while you're doing it. Has the state of the art improved? <laughs> in the past 30 years, I would hope. <laughs> it, it has. Um, so a CEA or carotid endarterectomy still is done very often. Uh, I've got a lot of patients that I send to vascular surgery that are still having those done. I'd say there's probably more of a predilection to do carotid angioplasty and stenting nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the patients that aren't high risk for developing a stroke potentially. Because um, as you know, with the angioplasty, like squeezing all the, the plaque in the artery can cause a CVA to occur or, you know, stroke. Um, in, in the lecture, there's one part that I actually tried to hook up with a YouTube video, but it wouldn't work for me properly when I was setting it up. But there's another one called a T-car. And I think it's like transcarotid arterial revascularization, if I'm not mistaken. Some big words. I, I can't remember half of them half the time. Um, but the whole premise of this is it's kind of like a combination between a carotid endarterectomy and an angioplasty, where they kind of go locally into the carotid artery, and they help actually redirect the blood flow away from the brain hmm. in that area temporarily. That way, when they do an angioplasty, if something does break loose, then it's going downstream away from the brain instead of upstream towards it. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's really cool. I mean, you should definitely check out those on YouTube when you have a moment. Um, there was a big study about it called the Roadster study, and my understanding from what I remember uh, reading about it was that there wasn't a huge difference in the results between that and an endarterectomy or an angioplasty and stenting, but I think the uh, patient population in each of the portions of it, or in each of the arms, rather, weren't quite even. So mm -hmm. I feel like, I, if I remember correctly, the T-car or the transcarotid revascularization portion of it actually had sicker people that had more comorbidities. Right. So I don't think it was quite level field. Well, you know, I wonder now that now that you have OCTA, you know, if you can do a pre and post, I'd wonder if you'd see any sort of embolic events that may not have been noticed clinically when you actually look at the scan, you like see what kind of junk is actually floated downstream um, <laughs> and ended up in the retina. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I I'd be surprised, honestly, if there was a lot, only because of the microscopic portions of it. And... Mm the fact that the Holland horse plaques tend to be very malleable. So you still tend to have a lot of perfusion distal to where the blockage is. Right. Uh, what I would, I would really love to see would be the capillary changes in the retina pre and post. Mm. That way, you could, I mean, a lot of research has shown that whenever you do an endarterectomy or an angioplasty, you can actually improve the retinopathy of the eye mm. significantly within, I think it was like a day to or a few days to weeks. Oh. So I would love to see if there's any kind of revascularization going on in the capillary level on those. Cool. I sound like so now, nerd now, don't I? Talking about that. <laughs> Not at all. No. You mentioned you mentioned that you have another a growing passion in the field of medical websites and search engine search engine optimization. Okay, tell us about it. Well, well, how did you get interested in web design? Yeah, that's that's kind of different. <laughs> It's, it's a little different, yeah. 
so <laughs> I'll tell you the one thing that always always never never sat well with me working for the VA was that my salary could be capped. Um, as optometrists are on the general schedule pay scale, we can potentially get up to a grade 15, step 10, and that's really the most you're going to ever make in the VA. And so that, that never just sat well with me. And I always kind of thought about doing other kind of things to uh, increase my salary for my fa- for myself and for my family. And a lot of this actually started, gosh, I think it was probably about six or seven years ago now, where we had a student that would, came to our clinic to shadow us, and he was interested in optometry school. And he started looking into all these schools, and he got accepted to the University of Actually, I'll say a, a, a optometry school in the southern part of the country. I don't want to name names. <laughs> um, and being that he would be an out-of-state uh, attendee, we started looking at the information, and the amount of money that he was going to pay with tuition and room and board was astronomical. And I, I was talking to him at length, and I said, hey, you, know, you should really consider taking a year off and reapplying to your in-state school because you'll ultimately save over, I think it was like $150,000 in loans. Hmm. And, you know, when it comes to the ROI of your education, you really should, you know, take a look at this. So that kind of spawned something in, in me, and I started looking um, at other schools and so forth, and I figured, you know, this information has to get, get out there someplace so that future optometry students know what they're getting into. Uh, you know, certainly money's not everything by any means, but... You know, as an optometrist, you know, we don't make, generally speaking, we don't make the income of a surgeon or as a high-powered physician. So, you know, I want to make sure that the ROI that people are earning is realistic for them and that they know what they're getting in, themselves into in terms of their educational debt. Uh, so I kind of taught myself some some basic web stuff and I created a website and put this, I put a graph of all the different schools on there. Um you know, where, what their specialties were, if they were applicable, uh, their costs for in-state, out-of-state, you know, all these things. And it actually got picked up by, I think it was Optometry Times uh, years ago. And that just kind of became a really popular article. And I'm like, this is, this is cool. I can actually make something on my own, and it can be shared across the world. Um, so from there, I just kind of kept dabbling in website stuff. And a few years ago, I started my own company. And just obviously with my niche in you know, optometry, I've been working with a lot of optometrists across the country for creating websites for them. Um, and now we predominantly specialize in search engine optimization, which is more so of improving their rank on Google so that they're going to be on the higher list and more patients will ultimately click on their website and come to their practice. Right. Now, SEO, well, SEO is, is some, something of a dark art, I think, right? So I know a lot of people want to try to do it on their own, and I always just shake my head and dissuade them because it's it's complicated, right? And it's constantly evolving. So you just sort of, when someone comes to you, you kind of take over that function for them, right? Yeah, so whenever, if we have a new client, you know, the first thing we always do is audit what they have. Uh, there are generally two schools of thought to SEO, and that's white hat and black hat. That's an entire different conversation, but what I can tell you is that there are some people out there that they try to uh, get you to hire them, and they'll do uh, use a lot of techniques that are very shady, and Google will eventually flag and penalize your website for. So, you know, we always start with a site audit to see how things are looking and where they're ranking and so forth. Um, then we try to analyze their pages to make sure that they have proper keywords ins- inserted in them, things that patients would actually want to potentially click for. Um, and we kind of move from there as a stepwise process to really tries to kind of ensure that they're meeting a lot of the criteria for on-page search engine optimization, as well as different things for off-page, like Google My Business and citations and a lot of other things that are pretty crucial for both local and organic SEO. Right. And I try to to dissuade people also from handling a lot of the social stuff themselves or, like, for instance, the big thing now is, like, when you try to find your practice on a map, right, and you, you pull up your little cursor over it and Google has a star rating for you right there. (laughs) <laughs> and it's the most painful thing in the world, right? Because, you know, many doctors don't even realize it, that, you know, people are reviewing them there, and all of a sudden here they have two stars because all you get are disgruntled people coming to actually review you. Yeah, and, it's, and that's one of the things where that it's a huge part of local SEO is to ensuring that you're having a lot of good reviews. And, I mean, that's where patient review software is phenomenal because 
you can ask a patient to give you a five-star review, and even if they leave five words, that's still going to give you a lot of credit from your local SEO perspective. Um, but ha but having no online presence is very hurtful for you, especially when people are trying to find you. Yep. Uh, you know, or an optometrist or an eye doctor, or whoever in your in your area. Yep. And actually, on the screen right now, I've pulled up your website so everyone can see it. So I'm not I'm not above giving you a plug. So here it is. So it's ignitemedicalco.com. Well, thank you. And right up on the screen, so everyone can take a look. So pretty cool stuff. And I, I know. I mean, again, my big thrust with this is always to tell people: do not try to do this on your own. Um, unless you really want to dedicate the time to it, it would, you know, uh, it's like if you want to do your own drywall, that's great. <laughs> you can do it, <laughs> but, you know, you may not get the results that you want or it may take you so much time it's not worth doing on your own. You really want to let a professional handle it. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many idiosyncrasies to SEO and it's a constantly evolving practice where you know, we really stay on top of everything that's modern and the newer, not newer technology necessarily, but the new facets of SEO that are gonna help you rank better. Um, there are certainly some things you can do on your own, but ultimately you wanna have a professional organization or marketing department handle this for you yep. um, to really kind of get the results that you're looking for. And the, the one thing I'll tell anybody listening and everybody listening is that when you do hire a company, SEO, you have to give it time. Uh, the analogy I tell every single person that I talk to is that SEO is a marathon. You can't hire somebody and expect results within two or three months. It takes six months, nine months, bare minimum, to usually start seeing any kind of significant results. So just always keep that in mind, no matter who you're working with in the future as well. Yep, and I think one other thing that people sometimes they forget is that there's no you know one like quick secret that, there you go, you're on. I think a lot of it's content too, right? You have to come up with compelling content because the search engines do look. It's funny, if you search on your own name, uh, eventually, you know, CUR comes up actually, CUR 2020 comes up on you several, um, you know, slots down, but it's there because we posted a summary of your conference, right, of your material. And this is, an, you know, actual content that we put up there. So I think that's an important thing too that people need to realize, you know, you need to have some sort of a presence with compelling content and I think it definitely helps. That, that's exactly right. Uh, there's a phrase in the SEO world that content is king. And you you hit on the point exactly. You need to be producing content for your website, whether it be blogs or videos, something on a regular basis to tell the search engines and your patients that you're constantly updating your website. You know, websites that are stagnant and aren't changing at all generally lose their ranking in Google. So the more content you can produce that's high quality and manufactured in such a way that is both set up for your patients to read comfortably and as well as the search engines, because there are different things you have to kind of structure your website blogs for and the information on there to tell the search engines what your page is about and the important topics in it. Yep. So the more you can do that, the better off you're going to ultimately be. Yep. You know, I find something ironic too, especially with, with Google, you know, paid search, it seems to me is getting worse and worse versus people finding stuff organically. And I find that funny, right? Because Google makes so much of their money based on paid search, but the reality is the organic search is so much better. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, we do both paid search with Google Ads and SEO for, every, for clients that want it. And we, you know, we've got really good results with our, our PPC or Google Ads, but I, I tell everybody, the, we talked about SEO being a marathon. PPC is a sprint. That's where you're paying money short term so you can get uh, views to your website. You can get conversions into appointments and so forth. So it's one of those things where PPC or Google Ads is, is it's a great process, but it's not long lasting. If you want to start dropping your marketing dollars down or if you want to start changing things, you'll see the change and the lower conversions in your Google Ads right away. That's why I really love SEO so much because you put in the hard work in the beginning and it's going to give you dividends for years. It works so well because you're going to start increasing your organic rank and hit that number one, number two spot. And it's going to last for a long, long time for you. Absolutely. All right. Well, Rich, we're just about out of time here. But again, thank you for coming here today. And thank you for doing CEYR for all 15 million times. Um, I know it's been a lot this year. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for coming back over and over well, again. Thank you guys for having me. Really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Bye bye, Rich. Bye now. All right. Take care. See you later. Thanks, care. Bye bye. All right. Well, guys, 
I think we're just about at the end. That's great. Um, so uh, it's it's been it's been a, a year, huh? <laughs> so yes, and well, it's not over. People can take it on demand for another um, seventeen days. Another seventeen days. That's right. So I guess we're still but around for a little while longer. Although personally, I'll be you know sipping a mai tai or something. I don't know. Yes. Just taking a few days off. But I want to just. Uh, remind everyone, I guess I'll put it up one more time, and thank everyone for being here and, and you know, being part of this because, you know, officially this slide's out of date, so we have over 6,000 ODs have attended the conference, so far and away the biggest virtual event ever, so thank you everyone for showing up this year. We couldn't have done it without you. I wish it was under happier circumstances, but um, I'm just glad we were able to help out. And remember, we're still around until the 31st of December, so if you want to take courses, and you'll Yep. You want to see vendors, we're still around. We will still be here. And again, if you want to start planning for 2021, I put the dates up there so everyone can see it. Uh, let me put them up again. Um, you know, not, not that I, I really want to think about 2021 right now, but I guess we have to. So if you're thinking about 2021, the website is already up. Uh, it's just a, a placeholder site where you can put, type in your email address to get reminded when registration opens. If you're listening to this, you probably registered for CUR 2020 already, so you'll also be getting an email from me when registration opens along with a, uh, a supporting member coupon so you can actually pay a lower rate because we want to try to keep the rates absolutely rock bottom in 2021 as best we can uh, and give you those four live events. So, And we have a bunch of new speakers with um, some great new topics, so it's not going to be stale. Yeah, it's not going to be stale at all, 100%. I mean, I, you know, after a year of doing these same ones, I know people are like, oh, we need something different. These are going to be very different. Uh, the topics are cool. Um, the titles that they come up with are interesting for all of them, at least the ones that I've received so far. Uh, and it's going to be very different from, from this year, so it should be fun. So I guess, guys, do you have any parting thoughts for everyone? Oh, I, I say I thank think, you for uh, supporting us. And yeah, and you it's, talk well. been fun. Well, it's been fun. Fun doing it. We're always around on OD Wire. So yep. if, you, if you're missing our wisdom, just go on OD Wire, <laughs> start complaining, and we'll answer. Yep. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> yep. I second well, the important, author and everything. And, I, I, uh, actually, the really important thing from today's meeting is uh, speaking with Essilor. That, that Essilor has an optometrist that's there to be the interface to Essilor with optometry. So uh, if there's any question about what Essilor is doing and you're kind of suspicious, talk about it on OD Wire and we can pass it along. Yeah, this, pass it along. this so, goes for every company, okay. right? Everybody's got people in place and we're happy to <clears throat> shuttle the information you know, over to whoever you want us to get it to. So we're, that's what we're there for, right? We act as like a middleman and a go-between and we're happy to help. Uh, give you a voice. So again, thank you for for showing up on OD Wire and CE Wire, of course. So Steve, are you ready to take a little vacation in Florida now? <laughs> um, yes, I, I have my tea right outside the, on the thirteenth hall. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone for being here again, and I guess we will see you all in March. So bye now. <laughs>